Good morning. We are live from River Valley Room. All right, good morning, everyone. Would like to call this meeting to order. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of TD6 territory and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, and Koras, who as well as Metian Inuit, and now settlers from around the world. Uh, do a roll call of uh, committee members. I'm here, Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. And let me see if there are other council members joining us. Councillor Jans is here in person. Good morning. Councillor Wright is here in person. Good morning. Councilor Prince Bay, you there? I'm here. Good morning. Okay. And uh, Councilor Cartmel? Good morning. There we go. All right. Adoption of the agenda. Councilor Stevenson, you want to do that? Yeah. Yes, I'm happy to move uh, the adoption of the February 15th, 2023 Executive Committee meeting agenda with the following change uh, the addition of 7.7. .7. Uh, which the report was published on February 3rd. Okay. Any questions on the approval of the agenda? Seeing none, please vote. Oh, oh just hold on. My laptop's being... I know, I got We're going to fight, so I'm going to vote yes in the meantime. I got kicked out of the as Councilor well. Thank you, Councillor Knack. We're just getting it sent out now. Um, yes, as well. Just I uh, you know what happened here in, in East Drive. There we go. Got it. Okay. Can you just verbally say it? Yes. Okay. 
Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Approval of the minutes, Councillor Nag. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I will move the approval of the minutes from the January 18th, 2023 Executive Committee meeting. Okay, any errors or omissions? Seeing none, please vote. That's right, I'll say yes as well. Thank you, Councillor Nack. We have five votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Any protocol items? Any protocol items? Seeing none, select items for debate. Okay, let's see. We have speakers on uh, 7.2, so I'll select that. When 7.1 are cross-reference, so I'll select that, both. Uh, then Apologies. seven, sorry, 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 7.2 and 7.3 are cross-referenced, so uh, I'll select those. And uh, then we have speakers on 7.7 .7 as well, and I'll select that. Okay, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. I would like to select 7.4, 7.5, 7. 7.6. Okay. So that's pretty much everything. Uh, Did you select 7.1? Yeah, we, uh, no, 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 we select 7.1, 7.1, 7.1. Councillor Rutherford? Yeah, I'd like to select 7.1. 7 7.1, 1, yes, yep. Okay. Can someone move to vote on the balance, please? Councillor Nack, you want to do so that? So move. That's just 5.1, I believe. Yep, please. Please. Okay. please vote. I'm getting closer to being on, but in the meantime, yes. There we go. And Councillor Knack, did you? Uh, sorry, yes, I'm uh, still, Thank I'm almost there now. Thank you very much. We have five votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So, Clerk Norton, can you please read back to us what we have already approved? Yes, thank you, Mayor Sohi. This morning, Executive Committee has passed the recommendation for 5.1, Revenue Source for, tr for Transit, Potential Risk and Implementation in Intergovernmental Advocacy has a revised due date of third quarter 2023. Okay, thank you. We have a request to speak, so we have number of speakers and I'll move that on 7.3 we hear from Thomas Burr, Henry Edgar, Anand Pai and James uh, Kervinsky and on 7.7 .7, we hear from Mark Edwards and Anand Pai. Okay. So any concerns please vote. We have five votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And we also have a request for specific time on the agenda. Councillor Rutherford, do you want to move that? Sure. I move that the following item be dealt with at a specific time on the agenda. Item 7.7, .7, additional support for industrial development, Fulton Creek Business Park, as second item of business. Keep. Any questions? Seeing none, please vote. We have five votes. You got it? Yeah. There you go. So we everyone voted? Yep. Please display the votes. It is carried. Councillor inquiries. None. Re report to be dealt with a different term meeting. None. Request to reschedule the reports. And 
unfinished business, none public reports. Now we are on to our first item, 7.1, Edmonton Screen Industries Office, updates and realignment. Okay, we'll go to administration. I think the folks from the uh, screens industry are part of the delegation, administration delegation, right? Yeah. Good morning. My name is Alyssa LaLiberty. I'm the branch manager of Economic Investment Services. Along with my colleagues Tom Mansfield and Jackie Ferner, we are pleased to be here today to introduce members of the Edmonton Screen Industries Office, or ESIO, Tom Vinica, CEO, and Peggy Garrity, Board Chair. They're here today to speak to this report specifically to the recommended changes to the Edmonton Screen Fund. The ESIO is the city's key partner in leading the development, growth, and sustainability of entrepreneurs, businesses, creators, and talent in Edmonton screen industries. ESIO has developed a comprehensive business case that outlines a vision for the future state of Edmonton screen industry and a plan to realign the Edmonton Screen Media Fund to achieve the vision with a proposed new name of Strategic Initiatives Fund, or SIF. ESIO is seeking approval this approval change, uh, how the funds can be used, and how the performance of the fund is measured. After the ESIO verbal presentation, we'd be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Tom and Peggy will now provide an overview of their proposal. Thank you very much, and uh, Mayor Sohi and members of the Executive Committee, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to this item today. As, as you recall, um, when ESIO was first formed, there, were, there was a, a, a remaining fund for the film commissioner uh, in the amount of $4 million. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. That was transferred to ESIO when we were established. And through uh, our experience over the last few years, our uh, consultations that we've had, we've learned that the model that we had been using is not the most effective way of leveraging the $4 million fund to achieve the objectives and the mandate thank you, of ESIO. So in short, what we're really seeking is approval to adjust the requirements of how the fund it can be utilized so that the ESIO has more flexibility to allow us to invest in key strategic priorities which will meet the industry's needs and produce better results. It's really about untying our hands so we can make the best use of the funds available. And now I'll hand it over to Tom to provide more details. Uh, over the past several years, the Edmonton Screen Media Fund has sought to find investment opportunities in film and TV and IDM industries, or interactive digital media industries. And we've successfully made investments in both industries, uh, fully recouped on one, very close on another, and have, uh, others that are still in production right now. Uh, the fund was created to achieve the strate strategic priorities of, of funding projects in our city, advocacy uh, and, and promotion, um, as well as infrastructure. As part of the continued efforts uh, to ensure that we deploy this capital in the most uh, eff efficient and effective manner, uh, we conducted a review of the fund uh, through a third-party consultation of our community and also our own internal analysis. Uh, based on these efforts, uh, we would like to amplify our impact by moving um, from investing in individual projects to investing in things that will uh, create an inc increased opportunity for many projects and creatives at a time. The original fund was designed to be a venture capital style uh, model uh, with the aim of achieving capital returns on, on the, the, uh, the, the $4 million. Ultimately, what we really want though is not to, uh, to create these, these incremental returns on the capital, but rather to create an industry or you know, in, uh, economic growth. Um, by focusing more on creating an environment where business will succeed, we can have more of a significant impact on uh, the local industry as a whole. There are three ways that we propose the, to accomplish this. The first is foundational infrastructure partnerships. We need the necessary infrastructure and the assets uh, to support local creatives as well as to attract others to the region. 
Um, the second is strategic funding partnerships. We need to focus in on particular types of funding that will spark and leverage outside more sustainable funding. Rather than making these investments ourselves, we uh, need to create an environment or teach or help um, the industry itself invest in this, in our uh, city. And third, the edu uh, education. We need to elevate our local creatives and arm them with the tools to commercialize their ideas. Um, and we also need to develop the talent that will support the creation of, of those ideas here in Edmonton. These three objectives are all in alignment with the original goals of the fund. Uh, the changes that we're proposing will just make them much more achievable. Um, an important uh, benefit of the new type of funding is an increased ability to create impact in areas of equity, diversity, and inclusion. As an example, the old, old fund uh, could really support uh, marginalized producers who are already in the system or who are already part of the community. Um, and what we'd like to be able to do, or I think, or what the benefit of this new style of uh, fund is that we can impact people all the way through the industry and not just that one slice of people who are already there. We can um, open the doors to more people coming into the industry and create equity, not, again, not just in, of those who are in, but those who are entering into the, uh, into the industry. Um, we, uh, we have already done work to identify issues um, uh, of uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion in our, uh, in our industry, and, uh, and we will use the labor market survey, which was done as a, an Alberta um, initiative, and the labor market action plan to consider and address these issues uh, through the investments that we make. We propose uh, the following performance measures to the new fund, third party, funds leveraged, uh, or measuring the third party funds that are leveraged by fund investments and applied to projects, Edmonton projects or initiatives. Uh, second, the number of Edmonton creators that are assisted either financially or in kind by the fund investments. And third, the number of uh, individuals with qualifications, credits or credentials, which is so key in our industry, um, that, are, will be pro that are provided or, or uh, achieved through programs or initiatives funded by uh, fund investments. I think it's important also to emphasize that this fund is not intended to be a fund that will come seeking to be replenished. This fund is meant to be the spark that starts the engine, not the, f the fuel that, f that feeds it or, or runs it. This will support the creation of infrastructure that will create opportunity on an ongoing basis. It will initiate a flow of capital from other organizations and governments, and it will stimulate uh, private investment. It is not meant to carry the burden, it's meant to resolve the chicken and the egg challenge that we face right now in our industry. Um, we are in an exciting time in our industry. Our city is getting worldwide exposure uh, for the part that we played in HBO's The Last of Us. Our local creatives are getting worldwide exposure for their own creation, uh, the film Skinamarink, which was uh, a, a small $15,000 budget film that now has done two and a half million in uh, box office in over seven or 800, uh, seven or 800 theaters across America. I got to see it in, in, uh, in, uh, in Los Angeles. It's a, it was a really, um, uh, really cool story that's happening uh, by a filmmaker named uh, Kyle Edward Ball. Our interactive digital media industry is getting worldwide buzz around the soon to be released Nightingale by Inflection Studios. This is an amazing moment for the screen industries in our city. Um, and uh, we ask council to help us seize this moment and allow us to deploy this capital in the most effective manner possible. Thank you and we'd be happy to take questions. Well, thank you so much and thank you for your work and also congratulations on uh, you know, getting sustainable funding for your ongoing operations. Uh, uh, in the last budget, uh, council made the decision to uh, give you the certainty and predictability, and I hope that'll give you uh, uh, more certainty around the work that you want to do and uh, how integral that work is uh, to economic growth and sporting art and culture. So thank you, and congratulations on that. Uh, Councillor Rutherford, you exempt this. Two questions, please. Yeah. And questions are together to administration and to yeah. the, uh, the folks on the yep. screen. Yeah, they're yeah. part of the delegation. Yeah. 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 Um, thank you. Uh, very interesting report. Um, I always like when we're iterative and, and stuff. The one thing that I really am concerned about, and I know you touched on it in your presentation, is that that fund will be depleted by 2026. And I 
am a bit skeptical that there wouldn't be an ask in the next four-year budget cycle, you know, especially if you're doing that level of evaluation, uh, those kind of things. Can you speak to that to me? Yeah, I, I think that um, just in, in our evaluation right now of, of uh, other funds that we can um, leverage, we think that this is going to be sufficient to do what we need to do to get that this spark um, uh, that we need to st again to start that engine. Um, we, um, yeah, I, I, that's it's just not our intention to to uh, to come back to to replenish that. We do think that there's uh, um, particular types of investments that we can make that that will have an ongoing and enduring effect, um, and further. Um, types of investments that that uh, again not all of them not all of them will be these mm -hmm. assets but we think that there are assets that uh, can be we can invest in that will actually be things that we can we can, uh, can still have can you conceptualize that for me a bit so because I'm again I'm thinking okay if we're investing in that you know your, your point one right about like some of the infrastructure needed to entice people to come here but I also am thinking about how like often you know, technology in the screen industry is is changing at a rapid pace. So, mm -hmm. are we going to invest in a bunch of items that you know will be outdated in five years' time, for example? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's. I think um, we are not necessarily. Uh, I guess on the technology side, um, uh, we're not. I, I understand that concern for sure, and I, I think that there's things that we can do that will have a, a, a more enduring effect, specifically with technology. But it's not just about technology; it is also about, uh, you know, a, another example of something that we need is a soundstage in our city, um, and that's an asset that is will last for decades. Um, and uh, there's things there's things like that that. Um, so, like, break that down for me, like as somebody that's not entrenched in your world, and for the public listening. Let's talk about, can you break down how a soundstage, we invest in that, what that looks like, what it does, and what it, what it, why it makes Edmonton more enticing for me? Can you, can you help me understand that and like break that down for me? You bet. Um, I think that something like that can be, uh, would be valuable on a couple different fronts. Um, one would be, uh, in, in terms of attracting uh, productions right now, they would have a place to be able to do some of those things. When you come to a region, uh, in, in some cases, you're going to be doing uh, on location, like Rice Howard Way, we saw those sets, uh, and some of that would be stage work. Uh, if you go to a region that doesn't have a stage, then that limits the types of things that you could do there. And that's for commercial, you know, attraction of, of business, that's one element. I think another important element, and this is not, you know, just for sound stages, would be for all of our investments, is that we want to create an environment where our community has access to these assets and can and can have opportunity to create um, and and develop themselves and experience. For me, in my own uh, private businesses uh, in the past, especially in interactive digital media, it was my access to uh, either technology or or um, equipment that allowed me to get experience and experience what is what pushed me ahead in, in our industry. And so uh, for me, any of these investments are really a real priority is that is not just that this is accessible to attract production, you know, service production or um, other types of, of foreign production, but to, uh, uh, to create opportunity for our own local creatives to uh, experience technology yeah. and experience the asset itself. Can okay. I just? Can, no, no, I just wanna ahead. ask one more quick question. On the equity piece, I know that said the GBA plus analysis was you know wasn't done, but there's intention. That left me a little bit unsatisfied because if we approve this fund and the usage of this fund now, what's the guarantee that there will be that equity lens placed on that disparity that was highlighted in the industry around diverse groups being represented in in the work of that industry? Can I just add real quickly on that one? The, the constraint that we have right now is the only, lens, the only time that we can apply that lens is to an individual project. Um, and okay. so with, with the expansion of, of, that we're considering, we're able to apply that lens to every kind of initiative that we undertake. Sure. I'm out of time. Sorry. I will come back for another round because I, I don't think you answered the other question. Yeah. So sorry about that. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Nack. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sophie. Thanks for, for coming here today. Um, 
we got an email just yesterday from uh, Interactive, uh, what's the, uh, the, uh, the, the Arts, Arts, Arts Alberta, thank you. And um, they highlighted just a couple of different things. They had a few concerns and I just wanted to sort of go through some of them with you. Um, and, and so maybe leaping off that question around those investments, they gave an example in their uh, message of Film Alberta Studios. And they talked about how that's been operating for over a decade, but with a concern that they flagged as an example. And I just, I don't know enough about this. So I'd love to get your thoughts as they flagged that that place is extremely expensive and it's often inaccessible for local filmmakers. Uh, it's an aging facility, it's not up to modern standards, and I guess it's actually been up for sale for close to five years. And so I think the question is, is the, how do we make sure that the investments you're looking at aren't going to be, I don't know if this is a, a true concern or if this is some limited experience. Can you speak to that, uh, both maybe that example and, and how what you're looking to do wouldn't continue down a path like that? Yeah, I think actually that studio as it stands right now is a, is a good chicken and the egg kind of issue. And that is that, that uh, I think a big part of the challenge with the stu that, that uh, building today is that um, in the hands of private industry, the, the, uh, they are doing what's best for them as a business person and, and need to uh, you know, house a different, an out, out of industry business in that place in order to make the money right now. We have different outcomes that potentially in a, in a, in a facility like that would allow us um, to, uh, to be successful with that studio and to open it up. I mean, it, right now, in order to get to that studio, a, another business has to move out. And, and so technically it's available, but it's difficult to, functionally, it's, very difficult to use, um, and if it was if it was something that we could bring back into the industry, we would have for one, uh, uh, we would be able to uh, to, to uh, open that up to for commercial commercial use in a way in a, in a you know a ready to go way uh, turnkey option. But then also we would be able to uh, you know uh, we'd have other outcomes such as education or community uh, maker space or uh, you know the ability for the community to come in and and do things there that otherwise you know to be honest would be enviable in, around the world. There's lots of places. I mean, uh, there's stages around the world, but they they are very expensive and difficult to use. Um, and that stage was something that we conceivably could could use in a, uh, or make much more available to our uh, our local production. Something like Skinnamarink again, fifteen thousand dollars. There is not a ton of money in that budget, and they can't go use some of these bigger assets. And we can provide space for projects like that to have much more um, uh, opportunity and chance. Um, and so I, th I think that's actually a really good example of a place right now that is compromised because of the fact that in the hands, this is a moment in the hands of private industry where it's difficult for them um, to free up the asset for us. Um, but we are, we have, for one, we have more patience. For two, we have um, uh, other outcomes that we, that we seek um, that are not specifically a financial return as a landlord. Um, and, and anyways, those, that's an example that's sure. of, of how that, you know, could Appreciate be. that. Um, the other question I'll ask in, in my remaining time, and there were some other things they flagged that I'm sure my colleagues will, will get to as well. Um, I guess broadly, one of the questions is how, how this will help the IDM space. There was, uh, and I know in the email does talk about how there was engagement with them, so it's not like they didn't feel like they were part of it, um, but maybe a feeling that um, that's still not as big of a priority and how does, how do we invest in something like that to help build that space? And how do we make sure, you know, through the board, through the work you're doing, that is a supported uh, part of, of your entire body of work. And I mean, I know you have a background in IDM, but um, that's, it's maybe not seen as, as strong as a support right now. And I mean, you know, that's one of my loves. Uh, mm -hmm. So do you want to talk about how you see this working in terms of that investment and how you would support that side of things? through that specific? Um, if or if any anything, or, or so maybe is there anything in this investment that would help on that front? And then I won't have enough time to go broadly, but let's yeah. start with just that, this fund that we're talking about today. Uh, yeah, you bet. So I think, um, I mean, first of all, the fund is, there was actually an article with a, with a, a bit of a, mis, uh, a misunderstanding in it uh, that I think uh, the, 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 tr the big studios in town for interactive digital media this is a, such a small amount of money that this is not necessarily going to uh, affect them. 
but this will affect our small uh, creatives in the interactive space, and we absolutely intend on investing in, in uh, those creatives. Um, I think an investment like this, uh, something I think that maybe is a little bit under, under miss, uh, or not, uh, is not as well known is, is how these two industries, film and TV and interactive, are converging. Um, and there's a ton of overlap in talent. And so there's things that, you know, as an example, in a place that we are developing uh, uh, for film and TV that is uh, um, where we are giving access to technology, that will help to develop the talent base on both sides of this, these industries and create opportunities for them to experiment and use some of these, these things. So it, it'll be valuable for both. I do think also that it's... Uh, um, it's important to understand that there are, like, whether it's through accelerators or other types of options like that, these are the types of investments that we, we would consider for interactive. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Nag. Councillor Stevenson. I guess thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, the presentation today. And I think, you know, a lot, a lot that makes a lot of sense to me and what you're, what you're proposing. Uh, I wanted to follow up on, uh, and apologies, I've just been locked out of my notes. Um, but want to follow up on the on the EDI uh, perspectives, and you know, I really appreciate the acknowledgement about sort of a gap in in racial and ethnic diversity on the staff team. I really appreciate that that was acknowledged, and just wondering if you you are planning to collect um, you know extended demographic information or um, uh, like race based data for some of the people accessing uh, your facilities or your services moving forward. Yes, absolutely. And so I th uh, our, one of our metrics in, in the ESIO side, so not specifically to the fund, uh, I think, you know, as we were talking uh, through this with management, um, we had the, uh, that's one of our metrics on ESIO, and, and we didn't want to be overlapping or repeating uh, metrics in the fund, um, and that's why the, the metrics don't specifically address um, GBA Plus, because it is on our ESIO side. And so, anyways, our, our pro we do want to uh, measure um, uh, the, you know, the, the, I guess the metrics around those, those topics and ensure that, um, that both the way that we deploy it as well as the participation in our programs and in our industry is uh, um, both measured and then, uh, uh, you know, making moves to, a, to address the, you know, discrepancies. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear. Um, yeah, you know, I, I honestly didn't have two more, uh, too many more questions. I thought the report was very clear. I just wanted to, to connect with uh, administration, maybe uh, our administration, because I think I think there's a, an interesting tension between economic impact and financial return, and then what we as a city see because we we recoup property taxes, right? And so, has there been I'm just trying to think, I mean, maybe just legislatively, my understanding is that we don't have any tools to recoup some of the other value generated. So for example, I know one of the metrics for The Last of Us, you looked at hotel stays, for example, but the city doesn't necessarily directly recoup that, that type of funding. And, and where I was going with this is, is there a way to evergreen the fund, recognizing that you feel that this, this one-time uh, lump sum will be adequate, that you won't need additional in, in 2026? I think my only my only hesitation with this shift is that it isn't a, a an, an evergreening fund, and I, I appreciate the investments you want to make. I think those make a lot of sense. But just trying to think of if there are other tools and mechanisms uh, to to amplify and and catalyze that investment that we're seeing. And I see Ms. McCabe is coming to the the front as well. Hi, Councillor Stevenson. Um, our tools are quite limited in the toolbox, as some of the other reports have uh, indicated, and grants really are the main tools that we have for organizations that we work with, like the Edmonton Screen Organization. Yeah, and in terms of, uh, this is really a value proposition, I guess, in terms of the overall economy of Edmonton, not necessarily the city as an organization, but we're making that investment in the community as a whole. Absolutely agree, and so I think part of the work of the economic action plan needs to be to get that story out and continue to amplify um, the job creation, the overall economic impact, and tell that story not just uh, through the Edmonton Screen organization's work, but through other work that we're doing in the organization as well. Great. Great, yeah, thank you. I didn't have any other questions. Again, uh, very supportive of the recommendation going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi, and thank you for the reports and your presentation today. Uh, my first question to administration directly. 
is this is this fund uh, to use this fund? Do we have a specific due date? I'm not sure I understand your question, Councillor. And so the the funding is already approved, and right now this amendment, this amendment, and is uh, about to change the usage of the fund. Mm -hmm. But do we have the due date? To due date, and then when we have to use this fund? To deploy it, the, the time frame we need to deploy yeah. it in. We would write those details into the amending agreement that would allow the change of use. Um, so I think this is not answering my question. My question is this, and when we set up agreement for this fund specifically, and then do we have the due date? You have to <clears throat> use this fund to achieve certain outcomes by certain days. We don't have that timeline, right? That's correct, Councillor Rice. <coughs> what, uh, what we would do is if Council agrees to change the fund to, a, um, to, to be more of a granting program, then those details would be included in terms of the specifics, what needs to be accomplished by when with those specific outcomes. So we would have that accountability built into the follow-on agreement. Okay, so if we don't have the due date, that means there is no re no rush for us to spend this $4 million and by just changing the model how we use this funding. So I just want to clarify that first one. Uh, so the second question and to ESIO, uh, based on my research and for your financial statement, and then can you confirm with me what specific financial return in 2021? The financial return on the uh, Edmonton Screen Media Fund? In 2021. Uh, I don't have that as, um, on me, but I can provide that uh, for and, you. And then, based on my research, and is only three thousand and two hundred oh five dollars. So I, I'm, I want to make sure that amount is correct, and that is why I want to verify with you. That would be, uh, I, I, that would be conceivable that that is the the number. I would say that's uh, that, so that makes sense. It says three thousand. So. <laughs> yeah. Is that a part of the reason why and we change the model and how we use this funding and from seeking return and the, to the growth? So is that part of the reason? Part of the reason, the fact that it's only $3,000. Uh, $3, yeah. Yes, that is part of the reason that it's, uh, yeah. Uh, so if that is the case, because your change is to the growth, and do you have a specific how we measure the growth? And for uh, this change, industry? yeah, for this for this change, because right now, uh, in front of me, the change is the usage of the fund, and then to the second return and to the growth, and how do you measure that success for the growth? Growth of the industry. Yes. Uh, the, the the key metrics for that would be uh, production uh, volume in our city, um, and then on the film and TV side, and then um, I think the. Probably the best measure on the in interactive digital media side is is uh, full time employees or um, games shipped. So uh, then those I have are metrics that exist on our ESI. Sorry, side. now I have follow up question regarding this. This is a little bit of concern to me, and because government of Alberta does have the film and the television tax grant, this has brought a lot of film production to Alberta and specifically Edmonton. Has the ESIO had any influence on the decision of those companies to choose Edmonton? Do you have a specific data and the number like to separate is the government's policy and attract people here or is actually is our ESIO's work and influence track them to here? And you mentioned that certain companies come here. I want to do the comparison between what actually the results as our work attract their production volume and compared to the GOAs and tax grade, uh, grant. Yeah, um, I think that the, the clearest evidence of that is that Calgary went from a small industry to $550 million and we didn't. And that's the, that is the evidence that, we're, our, that you know, if we don't, uh, if we're not actively managing those relationships and, and attracting those people, that the, the tax credit on its own can't so, uh, do yeah. that. 
this, this data is not clear to me, it, and I will come a second yep, no round worries. for more uh, questions. Thank you, Councillor Ace. Uh, on the, uh, I just want to have a couple of questions on, uh, there are uh, facilities and amenities within, the, uh, within other organizations such as uh, uh, McEwen University. They have a beautiful recording, recording studio. Uh, uh, Milner Library, they have a you know, very nice studio space uh, for artists to use for free. So I just want to know how are we going to be leveraging some of those community assets that are already in place as you shift uh, the focus of this fund to kind of building more in, uh, infrastructure uh, for, to support the industry. 100%. Uh, we do have some really great facilities, both in private industry as well as in, uh, in our post-secondaries. Um, and uh, we want to collaborate with them. We don't okay. want to replicate or duplicate things that are either that are privately already being um, uh, delivered or that are that our schools are, or post-secondaries are, are providing. What so we you're want. having conversations with them? There's we are a having, relationship there? Absolutely. Okay, and that, that's, yeah. that's, that's good to know. On the affordability, I think this is very important for to, to flag uh, uh, that the f facilities and amenities that you will support are, uh, that are there, that they are accessible, right? That yeah. the uh, uh, financial, somebody's ability to uh, have that financial upfront should not be a barrier. So I just wanna, want you to elaborate a little bit more, more on that, like how would this help you, if you if you shift the focus, you bet. So, I think that uh, you know, as a, uh, you know, having had a studio myself, a, a virtual reality studio before, um, there were things that were available to us that still cost two or three thousand dollars, and even if that was you know down from thirty thousand dollars, three thousand dollars was still un, un, unachievable for us or a risk that we couldn't take, especially in the early stages mm -hmm. of our company. Um, and so for me, I think it's uh, the, the accessibility part is not just like 90% discounts. It's, a, it's about like meaningfully uh, getting people into these uh, opportunities and assets. And so um, we want to create uh, an environment wherever that is with, with these uh, investments that, um, that like tr me again, meaningfully gets people opportunity to come yeah. in and and use those those assets uh, like and that that kind of goes back to the point of like are we trying to make money on this or are we trying to get people opportunity and if yeah. we're trying to make money then yeah I need to charge you five thousand dollars it's it was fifty thousand I think that high. I think that is very very important because supporting projects is one thing but if you're expecting a return on that that could be a barrier for the production as well but yeah. more importantly is that capacity in the community for someone to you know, put the creative ideas into a, into a tangible thing. Yeah. And that's where we are lacking. I think that's what I hear, that yeah. Calgary is far ahead of us because they were able to provide that kind of a support. And they started far ahead of us too, right? Because uh, they started before we did, right? Yeah, that's an element, that's an element of it, yes. And uh, I think too that we want to also differentiate ourselves from the world as well and provide opportunity that um, uh, to creatives, not only for our own creatives, but to, to, for people to think this is a great place to come to, to be creative and to and start their careers and to build. And so I think we have some unique opportunities to create facilities and assets yeah. that would be attractive uh, to creatives around the yeah. world that would come and, and, uh, and make us a, a, a place that's known for this. Yeah. So. I also understand that in Calgary, there's a broader understanding of upfront investments or investment in, into the industry and the rate of return uh, in a broader way from economic growth, business startups and all that, right? Which I know Stephanie was referring to that earlier on that work that we need to undertake. I think what I'm trying to get at, that like, when, I, when I think about industrial development, right? People understand that upfront infrastructure will unlock industrial development, you'll have warehouses yeah. and that will generate revenue. And uh, you see that in the case of, you know, putting $19 million to, uh, into the downtown to unlock 900 additional units that will generate revenue. There's things that people understand, the value for money, value for investment. I don't think that kind of understanding doesn't exist in the, in the screen industry yet. I think that's where I want to get it. Like if, if there's work can be done 
in order to convince the community that these are very important investments we are making yes. in order to uh, not only for quality of life, arts and culture, but also for economic growth. Yeah. I absolutely agree. And I think, I think this is the piece that we're missing. Uh, you know, if you, if you think of the examples that you used, if you don't have the basic core of the infrastructure and the things that people yeah. need, it's hard to build things on a piece-by-piece -piece basis. Yeah. And so what we're really looking at is where can we make the right investments yeah. so that we can leverage the capacity that we've got, build on the capacity, make a place where the, our own creatives and creative talents producers from around the world yeah. will want to come here. No, I could. Looking yeah. forward to that, actually. Uh, if I can uh, okay, I'm out of time. So. Uh, I'll uh, call, go next to Councillor Tang. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, report. Um, I guess just a, a quick, so four million, four, four million dollars as of since 2018, right now it's just under, it's just under four. So in the last four years, how many investment does that equate to? Is that one, one project? Uh, no, there's five projects that went through, uh, um, yeah, went through our, our uh, or either are like currently in it or have, have gone right. through the entire process. Um, and it's not for a lack of effort that you've been trying to kind of get this fund, you know, out the door, uh, but there's, kind of a, you know, a lot of challenge yes. embedded. So right. I, I, one of the, I guess the, 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 the conflict that we've faced over the last couple of years is that um, when we're in examining uh, the deal flow that comes in, uh, we have this hurdle of this needs to make money, this needs to recoup, yep. we need to see that, but then also we want to, uh, there needs to, there's an Edmonton impact that we're looking for. Right. Um, and the problem is in this industry that there are, um, you know, it, it's a risky industry. All of these content creation in, uh, investments are risky and therefore when we're evaluating them, um, based on this must return, especially because it's not a huge amount of money and we, and we, we have a high need of, of, of being evergreen uh, in the current agreement. Um, then there's projects that we have, to, uh, we have to say no to because even though this is going to be a great economic impact or a great, uh, uh, sorry, not economic impact, but a, uh, impact on the Edmonton Creative or unlock their career, it doesn't necessarily meet the hurdle and therefore right. I can't invest on it. And so right. that, um, but I do feel, you know, this is fairly significant shift from your kind of original goal of maybe investing in smaller bets, right? Whereas now we're looking at infrastructure and much larger assets where maybe one misstep, you will, you know, lose the fund significantly. Um, I guess any, any response to that? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, there are, there are larger bets that we're considering um, and within those, uh, you know, I guess just from a personal risk management standpoint, um, the, uh, the the ones that we've been looking at have very very low downside, um, and there's lots of opportunity uh, for us to to recoup or to remove ourselves from it. It's not an all-in bet. I mean, um, I don't I don't do all-in bets. That's not my uh, motivation. Okay. Certainly not that of the board. And uh, um, I think that, you know that uh, we still. We still want to manage the, uh, uh, I guess the the size of those bets and the in, yeah, in okay. And then and then when you say those become assets, do they eventually become city part of the city inventory, or uh, it'll just be be owned by the ESIO? Okay. Yeah, I think that that would be uh, owned by the ESIO, ESIO, or there would depending on the structure of of what it is that we're you know, right. the deal that we're doing. I mean, it, it, okay. it, it could be either a plan to get it into the industry. I mean, the, uh, as an example, the Calgary, maybe to the point of the mayor as well, is that the Calgary Film Center was created um, and it's, I think, 75,000 square feet or so of, of stage space. Um, and then that can be sold back out to the industry once it's removed there. Um, but more importantly, to the point of the mayor too, is that there's another half million square feet of, of sure. uh, space that was stimulated as a result of that. Yeah. And, so. and I guess what kind of data have you been collecting the past four years to validate that demand for, for, for infrastructure? Like, do you have numbers of, say, potential uh, business that were lost? Um, how much? How many? Of, you know, like that kind of stuff. I mean, uh, so at that at this point, that's anecdotal, but we're not. Um, there is demand for uh, from a uh, 
commercial standpoint, but the things that we're trying to invest in would be uh, uh, to open opportunity for our local creatives, and, and that's, a, I think, a different right. measurement. But. Um, just back to the IDM point, uh, what is your, do you have anybody with IDM experience on your board? Uh, on the board currently, no. We, uh, we used to have a board member that was uh, actually okay. is with the, the CEO of the Flashman right. Games now. I mean, I guess you have uh, IDM experience, right? I do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I actually do have quite a bit of questions on this. Uh, I have a lot of mixed feelings. Um, this, I wasn't expecting a report about the, sh which to me is actually a fairly significant organizational mandate, uh, strategic change in direction. Um, and I, I will come back for one more round, uh, but I just wanted to indicate that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dan, Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. I'm just wondering, um, Mayor Sohi referenced, you know, that Calgary is far ahead of us. Are there any learnings or, um, I guess, how can we leverage what Calgary's already done um, maybe to avoid some of those missteps and reduce our risk? Yeah, so I think the Calgary Film Centre is, is uh, a great example both of learning of, of uh, you know, the, some of the things that we need to n not repeat and then some of the things that we can uh, repeat. The, the, that, I think the Film Centre is a, a really great success story in that it sparked a ton of investment, further investment into the industry. Um, which is what we want. That's that's where the property taxes come from in terms of like financial return to the city. Um, it's a you know there's a half million dollar half billion dollar industry uh, there now, um, and uh, and there's we have the opportunity to be able to unlock that early kind of investment and get through that that patient phase that is sometimes that sometimes might be difficult for private industry to do. So. Um, whereas there's also things that I, I think that there, there are learnings that we can take from the way that that was done um, and can improve on that. So there's, we're fortunate to have a really uh, great close case study that uh, there's a ton to learn from and relationships with the people that can help us avoid uh, uh, some of those pitfalls or missteps uh, in order to be as successful as possible. And, and also working collaboratively with folks in Calgary on a, on a provincial yeah. Yeah. wide basis okay. yeah and I mean that's the great thing too is that there is there's we have the tides are rising and so we have um, you know more opportunity or it's a unique opportunity to to take advantage of the like things that are right around us right now as opposed to having to do this and then really like you know grind hard to find or attract everything it's the opportunity is there we just need we need to allow the the, uh, the flow to to come here Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I'm going to scrap my last line of questions because the, the conversation has brought up other questions for me. Um, I guess, you know, going to the, the, the very extreme shift in mandate, why, if, if the barrier is the cost recovery, why are we not considering project-based grants without that cost recovery component? Like a simple, like moderate change to the fund as opposed to the overall change in strategic direction. I think because we're not confident that it would, it, that it would help us achieve our mandate. What it means is that we would be limited to funding, perhaps as we funded five projects, we could maybe fund a few more but we're not, we're not then addressing the major gaps that need to be filled in the industry in order to really build it. We're not convinced anymore, because we've been at this for, for five years, that building the industry by investing in project by project will get us to where we think we need to be. That's why we, we did the evaluation and, are, and have uh, developed a new strategic approach. And if I may add, um, Councillor Rutherford, what we really see this as is not a mandate shift, it's a change in the tool. Uh, the Edmonton Screen Organization will still have the same mandate uh, to deliver uh, as, as indicated in our funding agreement with them. What's before you today is a shift in the tool that they're using in order to yeah. make sure that we change, that we're able to support the industry. Yeah, but my challenge and where I'm, the tension I'm feeling is, is that fund is finite. So if that is needed to spur the mandate now, what happens in 2026 when that fund is not there? Because like I said, 
investment in infrastructure needs continual investment in infrastructure. You know that as well as I do. In terms of we can build a road, we need to continue to maintain that road. So I, that's where I'm struggling. Can, can you speak to that? Yes. So I, I, I guess um, the, uh, in all of these uh, priorities that we have, it's about partnerships. And so we want to find people that will, and other funding that will be able to manage the, the ongoing cost of, if there are, whether it's operational costs of those assets, um, or if it's partnering with private industry so that they um, were transitioning this into their hands. The, the idea here, what we don't want, is to create a, a huge load inside of our um, organization that then ha we have to come to, to pitch for uh, the help to support. Um, that's not our goal. We are aware of that and, and, and want to stay away from that. Uh, I think another uh, important part, too, is that the, uh, on the grant, like, the, the shift that you kind of uh, are talking about, with, uh, keeping it with, with, uh, as a grant, but um, um, uh, or investing in projects but keeping it as a grant, um, that is definitely a place or a, a route where it would we would go through the money and then need to be replenished. That uh, because of the fact that it would uh, it's, it's yeah. it creates a dependency rather than I, I guess the idea is that we want to we want to move from. Um, fishing for people to buying fishing rods and, and, and teaching okay. them or giving them the tools to be able to carry on. But. And, I've, and I've heard a bit of like, and maybe it's just me and, and how I'm interpreting what's being said, but I'm, I need something squared for me uh, around some conflicting messaging I'm hearing in the responses. So I'm hearing, you know, it's a catalyst for investment, but then I'm hearing on the flip side that it's for support locals and public good and accessibility. To me, those two don't necessarily square because often, like you said, locals don't have the funding. So if this is really about leveraging funding, then like I see the big players are the ones that are gonna get the space. They're the ones, like they have the money, they're gonna come to play, they're gonna get the studio space. So can you square that for me then? Because I'm, I'm, I'm hearing very conflicting messages around those two, those two I, concepts. It's clearly both. It's, it's well, how can that play out for me? Because again, like if we build a sound sound studio, and you know major players, let's say Universal, wants it, and then Sally from Edmonton also wants it, who gets it? Universal, right? Right? I mean, that's, Is that correct? That's not necessarily true. No. Okay. So and so explain that to me. Break that down for me. Uh, so I I mean it, these. Uh, I mean, it, it, for, it, as an example for the soundstage, the soundstage um, is, a, you know, if we were to do, uh, again, these are, these are things that we have lightly um, explored. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't completely, you know, these are ideas that we're thinking about the future of what we could be, where we could be investing in. So um, I think we need to, you know, uh, understand okay, that. Okay, that, that helps, that helps in my... Can I just add that big productions come and go? And everybody that's here is here all the time. Good point. Great point. Thank you. Appreciate thank, that. Thank you so much. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. I would like to echo uh, Councillor Rutherford's some points. And then I'm going to ask from different angles. And hopefully I can get the information to support my decision. Um, the, the shifting right now is to the, uh, support the creation of infrastructure. And then, do we done? Uh, do we uh, did we do the leads assessment actually to really get clear sense what the resources do company and productions expect when they come into our city and the town to film? And then, what that needs looks like right now at this moment, and to support and this change. Yes, we do, because uh, this, is the, this is the work that Tom does and the work that our film commissioner does to work with production companies that are, that are coming here and, and assessing what they need in order to attract them. The Last of Us didn't just come here because they thought Alberta was a great place. They came here because of our partnership with Calgary and our ability to be able to show that this is a good place for them to film where they have the tools and the equipment that they, that they need. And however, I heard, and in the past four years, we only have five projects come here. 
And then specifically and recently, and then from news I read, and when the film production come to our town, but they're not request some new infrastructure. They're actually and use our city existing infrastructure to do their production. So how this to support that needs? Because I don't believe that we can grow it further with the, with the existing tools and infrastructure that we have. Yes, we've been able to attract a couple of, well, especially the last of us. But in terms of the smaller companies that are here and other smaller productions, they don't have the tools or the crew and the people that are here year round to be able to really attract and leverage what we have already. Uh, so in that case, can you provide me the more details for the upfront plan and specific for the further capital expenditures? And then for earning, uh, earning infrastructure and we're going to, to build and then from development cost and to the mod, to the operating cost and to the maintain, maintenance cost, all those costs, I'm not seeing this detail plan and including the report and how to support uh, the statements in the report say you're not going to request any more money. So first of all, we need the city's approval to be able to open at the flexibility that we need. If we have that, then we will do a risk analysis and a detailed business plan on every in investment that we made. That's part of the responsibility yes. of the board and administration. But without the, the city council's approval, there is no, uh, we, we would, it's, it's step one and then step two. I, I understand that, but this is, I'm struggling. And because if you look, look at all the data, look historically, and for any investment in infrastructure or city put on, and then it's become ongoing investment and for our city. It's not just one time. And then I cannot see that risk at this moment and how we can mitigate that risk at this moment. And also my follow-up question, I would like more detail is, if we are not going to make this change, what's the plan to ESIO to make the effort to leverage this $4 million actually to change the situation and from less, very little investment return and to the outcome, to the mandate, and then ESIO to do it? All that we will be able to do is what we've done over the past five years, which would be to choose projects that we think might be successful and recoup. We would also look at some potential for strategic uh, uh, partnerships, but frankly, without us making some uh, investments, I'm not sure that we would be able to be as successful in attracting those. Uh However, I, I did not see the connection between the needs of the new infrastructure uh, and the financial return. And though this report does not provide that strong connection, and then for that, um, I, that's his, I think the, uh, I have more questions. Okay. Thank you, my Thank time you, is Councilor, out. Thank you, Councillor uh, Rice, Councillor uh, Nack, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mayor Sorry, I was just, uh, on the board, I was to move the recommendation. Okay. So can you can you please? Yeah, I'll move that uh, executive committee recommend to council that the Edmonton Screen Media Fund uh, subsidy agreement between the City of Edmonton and the Edmonton Screen Industries Office Society be amended to update the reporting requirements and uses for the Edmonton Screen Media Fund as outlined in Attachment One of the February fifteenth, twenty twenty three Urban Planning and Economy Report, and that the agreement be in form and content acceptable to the City Manager. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tang, go ahead, please. Questions? Yeah. yeah, great. Thank you very much. Um, so I can appreciate the direction of creating the condition or the environment needed for Edmonton creators to succeed, attract further investment. But when I hear that, um, I'm like, Edmonton Global, Edmonton Unlimited, Explore Edmonton, everyone is working on creating that environment. And for me, what always made ESIO very different is the is the fact that you have this self-sustaining arm, or you know, at least the intent of that. Um, yeah, I mean, Ms. McCabe, if you wanna speak to that, I see your mic on, uh, just in terms of the role overlapping potentially with these other organizations. 
Tom might want to add, but we did do a thorough review and everybody's role is very clear um, in terms of what they do. We work together though, because we want to make sure that we put Edmonton on the map for all investment in Edmonton, but I am quite confident that the ESIO's role is clear to, from Edmonton Global, from Edmonton Unlimited. That's reassuring. Um, and you know, earlier you had mentioned that this is really, today's really about discussing how a tool is going to be changed. Um, but you know, you recently, yes, I also brought on a new film commissioner with, you know, new tools. We have yet to see the result of that. And so here we're talking about like yet another fairly big tool change. Do you have any thoughts on that, Tom? Uh, yes, we, we are as we're, as we're learning and responding to the industry's needs and, and the identified lacks and gaps that we have, we have brought on a film commissioner to do that, to help us with that. And also, again, what we're, what we're looking for is how we can make the right investments to address the gaps and needs that we that we've, have been identified for us through our, our review. Thank you for that. Um, and I guess lastly for me, I mean, obviously this report's been in the works for quite some time prior to the budget. Um, I guess I'm just curious, you know, how, you know, has it been a while or would you say, you know, during the budget deliberation, there was a risk that ESIO wouldn't even exist today <laughs> at this meeting. Um, and then so I think getting this report with, you know, to talk about this formula and fund, uh, it was a surprise to me for sure. So can you just like maybe clarify a bit of, you know, how has the board or even the conversation with administration been going on? Count Councillor Tang, if this was a surprise to you, we apologize for that from administrative perspective. Um, it's a separate process from the budget process. It's okay. a change in a tool, and so it has to come to exec committee first and then proceed to council, and it's outside of the budget process. So okay. um, I apologize for that confusion. Well, I have wonder if the budget deliberation kind of highlighted the urgency for this perhaps or something. No, okay, great. Um, I guess just in my remaining, if I can just very quickly, you know, uh, this is this is a bit of a I, I mean to me it's a bit of tactic too. Um, however, you know on that mandate piece, I you know I take note of some of the voices from the IDM community about that if you change this, this will focus in on particular sector in the industry. And but if you, if you don't feel that way, you know I certainly hope that there's more connections made with with that community in particular to maybe alleviate some of those concerns. I do know that you guys have a strong board, strong staff, and you know, uh, some of the new, you know, with the new film commissioner, like I think there's a lot of promise and a lot of potential. Also raise the expectation, right? And uh, uh, ultimately, you know, I think this is, if this is what the community is telling you and that there's a demand and you have strong evidence to show that demand, um, I think we should consider it and see, see what happens. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. That is, so we're getting into speaking now, which is I good. I still have questions. Okay. Still have one more yeah, okay, please go ahead, Councillor Rice. I'm um, just mindful of the agenda as well. We have a lot of other items that we need to conclude. Go ahead, Councillor Rice. Yeah. Uh, one more question regarding the funding for million dollars. And so, where is that funding sourced from? The fund was. Uh, to add administration, oh, sorry. sorry. Are you asking about the fund or are you asking about ESIO's ongoing funding? Uh, no, not uh, ongoing funding is already sorted out and in the budget. I am asking this uh, ESM uh, like for fund. The, the $4 million was uh, part of the original film commission way back when, when it was with Economic Development Edmonton. And when ESIO, there was a lot of concern about how that $4 million was not being used at that time, so that when ESIO was created as a separate society, that $4 million was provided to ESIO, transferred to us. So that's still from our city's previous budget, is not from 2023 and 2026 no. budget. That's so correct. That funding already set up there it's and already approved. Previous 2019 to 2022 budget. Okay, so is not part. Is that part of budget? So it's not part there. of this budget cycle. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, so that is my last question. Thank you.
Thank you, Councillor Rice. Now to speak, we have a motion on the floor to speak, Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, so, you know, when I, when I come in to, to meetings, I read the agenda packages, I write my questions down, and this one was one that I, I usually have a good sense of where I'm gonna fall coming in, and I can be swayed either way, but I usually have a good sense of, yeah, that makes sense, or I have concerns, or this one I was really, was a conundrum to me. I actually did not know how I was gonna situate myself in the final decision on this one. Um, I agree with my colleague, Councillor Tang. I, I'm going to defer to the expertise in the industry in a space that I don't have that necessarily expertise. And so if this is, you know, that feedback is what this is what it, it can use, then, then I will support it today. Um, with a few kind of, I guess, notes to administration, I think that there needs to be some kind of report pack on both the equity piece as well as interim um, outcomes, sort of at the two-year mark. Uh, something like that would be ideal for me to, uh, to get a sense of if, if it is achieving what we want it to achieve and just have that, have that conversation and that pulse check. And... Uh, and, and second of all, I would just like to say to the Edmonton Screen Industries, if I have the privilege to continue to serve in the next four-year budget cycle, that I will be mindful of the commitment made not to ask for future funding for this, for this fund. Um, so do keep that in mind as we go forward. But with those things in mind, I will, I am, I'm inclined to, it was a really rich discussion, and I respect your expertise, and I, I will support it today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Rice. Um, I would like to s start to say an economic, economic growth for our city at this moment and also for the long-term goal is extremely important. And because and many of Edmontonians and expect our city can generate more economic revenue to offset our tax, proper tax increase. Uh, I do see the importance and the contribution of ESIO and then through this work could make. So my struggling and today is, and I cannot say the specific detail plan and how we measure the growth and how we leverage this $4 million and with accountability piece in place to ensure our investment have real return and to achieve our outcomes. I think that piece is really missing and in the report. And however, I'm not going to stop you to try something new and to contribute to our economic growth. And as the main question I asked, I looking forward for the question I asked, I will get proper answer. And if our council uh, decided to go this direction to support this change in the tool, how we leverage the existing funding, not the future funding, and to provide that outcome as we expected. So I'm going to support the uh, recommendation to the council, but I'm still looking forward and how we measure growth, how we work collaboratively and with different uh, organizations to really also leverage and then provincial government's tax grant and then work together and then without any further additional investment requested for the capture piece. As you mentioned, that will not be asset of our city and for the long-term goal. Okay, thank you for your great work. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, before I go to Councillor Nack, I just wanna thank uh, the, uh, the leadership uh, uh, at the uh, ESIO uh, and uh, as well as the board. Uh, for your leadership and uh, the work you have been, you have been doing, it's uh, it's so important uh, that we uh, uh, that we listen to the ideas from the experts and the people who are in the industry. And uh, uh, it's really refreshing that you came to us saying, you know, certain tools not working. Right? We need to have other tools that you can try and uh, and build that capacity. I think that that really speaks to the. Uh, 
uh, uh, to your strong commitment to uh, uh, making sure that we are doing what we can to uh, put Edmonton in a position that we're able to grow uh, this this industry. So really, really appreciate appreciate that. I am actually really uh, I am very excited about the future uh, uh, and uh, and very pleased that Council uh, gave you uh, sustainable, predictable funding uh, to. Uh, to this, to, to do this work, and uh, now you're coming back with the remaining funds that you had to better use them in, uh, in the in the in the growth, and also uh, to council colleagues, uh, I was in uh, in uh, Los Angeles for the screening of the uh, the Last of Us uh, along with Tom, and uh, there were folks from Calgary, and I actually first hand witnessed the collaboration between uh, our office here and the Calgary's office. I think that, that that's very refreshing and very good to see and uh, and getting a shout out uh, in, in front of the international audience for our city for Calgary and how easy was it for uh, the industry to actually work in Alberta uh, and how cooperative everyone from traffic enforcement to bylaws to uh, uh, whatever approval they needed they were granted those approvals in a very quick way a uh, very fast way I think that leads speaks to the nimbleness that, uh, that we need to create to help support uh, this industry. So I'm looking forward to the ongoing work. Uh, yes, there has to be some reporting and there's very valid, good questions from council colleagues around equity, around affordability and, and metrics, right? So, uh, and I have full confidence you'll report on those, right? And so uh, wish you all the best and, and good luck with the, with everything, and uh, with that, I'll go to Council Mac to close. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sophie. Not much more to add to your points. Um, uh, you know, it just for me, it's recognizing the tool wasn't working the way we wanted it to. We got to try something else. I, I, I admit, I don't know if this is the perfect way to realign it. I'm going to have some trust in the work that you've done and and the engagement that's happened and the work through administration. You all feel this is the right way to go. So. Uh, I'm on board. Um, just to some of the flags we heard earlier, I, uh, that that email from um, Interactive Arts Alberta, as you just flagged, because I think there's still a little bit of work um, to do there. I think it is a, one of the other things they flagged is even just uh, to Councillor Tang's question. You know, we don't, other than yourself, Tom, but we don't have anyone on the board who actually has that uh, IDM experience. And we've got a lot of great folks in the city. So thinking about that, how do we make a conscious decision going forward as we're looking for new board members? How do we make sure we're addressing that? I know you want that area to grow. I'm desperate about that area growing. Um, and and so I think this is the right tool and then you've got other work and now that you have the ability to permanently exist, uh, I also think that will make it a little bit easier to do some of that work because frankly, when you don't know whether or not you're gonna exist, it's hard to, well, it, it's it's probably hard to be as effective as you'd want to be. Um, no, no matter how much I'm sure you've tried to set that aside, it's it's hard not to, to keep that in the back of your mind and affect that. So as we go forward, I'm expecting all the great things we heard based off the questions and the information and the reporting. So uh, happy to support this in the meantime and see see what's next. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Nack. Please vote. We have five votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, now we are on to our uh, next item, which is 7.7, uh, uh, additional support for industrial development, Fulton Creek Business Park, which was uh, time specific, a second item on the agenda. Morning. In August, City Council directed administration to create a report outlining the opportunities and trade-offs of providing 100% of the tax uplift to the industrial infrastructure over expenditures for the Fulton Creek project to outline any adjustments and to outline any adjustments to policy C-592 industrial infrastructure cost sharing program in support of industrial development. I'm here to present administration's report that recommends amending policy C-592 
to allow for 100% of the tax uplift to go towards repayment of over expenditures going forward, including the development in the Fulton Creek Business Park. I'm joined by my colleagues from the Economic Investment Services Branch, Financial and Corporate Services and Development Services to help answer any of your, your technical questions. Economic growth is vital to the city's ongoing fiscal sustainability and increasing industrial investment and development is an important aspect of how the city maintains and grows its economic base. This is in alignment with the city plan's big city move of catalyze and converge as well as connect Edmonton's strategic goal of regional prosperity. It is also strongly in alignment to the economic action plan and the policy change we are advancing today is intended by administration to be an important action in this year's refresh of the industrial action plan to enable industrial development. Nearly all industrial development in Edmonton is facilitated through a system of development levies, arterial roadway assessments and permanent area contributions, which spread the cost of major infrastructure among benefiting landowners. Typically, early developers in an area must construct oversized infrastructure to accommodate the future development of the entire area. These front-end developers can recover their additional costs, also called over-expenditures, through development levies paid by subsequent developers as other benefiting lands are developed. However, due to the characteristics of industrial land development, recovery of over-expenditure costs can be unpredictable and uncertain, which can drastically reduce the feasibility of many projects. It could take years or even decades before the front-end developer receives full reimbursement. In addition, subsequent developers can be significantly burdened by the requirement to pay development levies and over-expenditures that they have not budgeted for. In 2017, the City launched the Industrial Infrastructure Cost-Sharing Program, a hybrid between development levy and increment financing, which helps to address these issues. Cost-shareable infrastructure includes municipal drainage and arterial roadway infrastructure that is designed to provide service to a benefiting area. Under the current policy, when a front-end developer is required to construct oversized infrastructure, they will be entitled to recover their over-expenditure costs from up to 50% of the city's new annual yearly tax revenue, which is the difference between the pre-development and post-development tax revenue that directly results from the developer's construction. Any funds that the city contributes to a developer's over-expenditure above 25% of the construction cost, which occurs when there is not subsequent development, will be recovered by the city through future development levies, which is intended to mitigate the city's risk. Where the city contributes a portion of, this, of its new tax revenue towards oversized infrastructure, the development levies for the area can be reduced by 25% due to the city's contribution. In recent years, industrial absorption rates in the city have been declining. From 2012 to 2021, which is the most up-to-date data available, the city's average absorption rate for industrial land is 99.5 hectares annually, but looking at the most recent five years from 2016 to 2021, the average absorption rate has been only 42.2 hectares annually. This is due to a number of factors such as changing economic conditions and increased competition. The Industrial Infrastructure Cost Sharing Program allows the city to support the cost of infrastructure for industrial development in Edmonton without incurring additional debt. Using tax uplift to support the cost of infrastructure comes with trade-offs. It means that in the short term, the city defers the additional revenue that would otherwise fund other city priorities. This trade-off assumes that the faster recovery of over-expenditures by developers will generate more high-value development and therefore more tax return in the longer term. So what will this, what will this change with the pro, what, sorry, what will change with the proposed recommendation? The city will contribute 100% of the additional tax revenue from a project towards the developer's recoverable oversizing costs. This will mean paying the developer faster, thereby reducing their financial risk and enabling more development. By providing 100% tax uplift, the city will defer 50% of tax revenues that could be used for other projects in the short term, which means payment to the developer occurs faster and reduces the time frame for the city to collect the full tax uplift into revenues. What's not changing out of this proposal is the city's 25% contribution towards the total cost shareable infrastructure will not change. The contribution will just occur faster using 100% of uplift instead of 
When there is not additional developers, the city covers the remaining over expenditures until other development occurs and levies can be applied. Interest is still able to be earned on any over expenditure the city of Edmonton holds for future development. To illustrate how this policy works in both the current and recommended policies, we've modeled a few very simplified scenarios. In both scenarios, we've made the following assumptions. A front-end developer has constructed a $100 million project which has $12 million in total cost-shareable public infrastructure. This is the arterial roads and municipal drainage uh, that will benefit the particular area. $2 million of, of cost-shareable infrastructure is for the first deve developer, leaving $10 million in over-expenditure to the, t the first developer. The city is assuming a $3 million in cost for the shareable infrastructure at 25%, and we're assuming $2 million in tax uplift generated per year with no additional development for the time period. No additional development is the worst case scenario, which developers often plan for as additional development cannot be guaranteed. This first scenario shows that the project under the current policy at 50%. The bar graph on the slide shows the first developer's over-expenditure costs, shown in blue, declining over time. At the same time, the city's 25%, or that $3 million of cost-shareable infrastructure, remains the same over the 10-year time period. If there aren't additional developers, the city uses tax uplift to cover the cost of shareable infrastructure for future developers, as shown in yellow. After a 10-year time period, the first developer fully recovers their over-expenditures. The city collects $10 million in tax uplift over 10 years and 100% of tax uplift after year 11. The second scenario uses the same assumptions, but instead applies the new policy at 100%. In this scenario, the first developer recovers their over-expenditure faster in year 5 rather than year 10. The city would still collect $10 million in tax uplift over 10 years. The city defers tax revenue for the first five years in this scenario, but collects 100% of the tax uplift faster by year six rather than year 11. When looking at the same scenario, but adding an additional development, the results are similar with the first developer recovering their over expenditures faster in four years instead of five and the city collecting 100% tax uplift in year seven. The reason for the delayed timing and full tax recovery is because the subsequent developer's levy is applied first to the front end developer's over expenditure. The city's overall tax uplift will increase as a result of the subsequent development. While precise modeling is difficult because of the unknown size and timing of future developments, our simplified model does demonstrate that under the 100% rebate model, the developer receives their recovery sooner with or without subsequent development. Thank you, and uh, we'll be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for the presentation. If you don't mind, please stepping back, because we do have uh, uh, two speakers on this. And I'll call them up. Uh, Mark Edwards, uh, uh, you'll be speaker number one. And Anand Pai, you'll be speaker number two. Yeah, anywhere you want to sit uh, among those three chairs. Yeah. Nice to see you both. Yeah. Nice to see you, Anand. Yeah, looking good. Oh, really? You're looking good. <laughs> Always looking good. Always looking good. Okay. All right. So, uh, who wants to go first? Uh, Mark, you want to go first, or Nandi, you want to go first? Sure. I'll, I'll jump in first. Okay. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks for thanks for having us here, and thanks for considering this. Um, uh, just to give a little bit of background, um, uh, Panatoni with Manulife Investment is working on the Fulton Creek project specifically. Um, and that was really the sort of the catalyst that opened this conversation up. Um, but as, as it opened, we also took a step back. Um, we do a lot of development in the city and, and in the region. And we wanted to take a step back and look at this at the 30,000 square, that 30,000 foot level and think, how, how do we benefit the city, not just one project? And um, so r really the intent of what we've, what we've suggested comes forward today and what administration has brought forward is to enable development to move faster, industrial development to move faster in the city. 
from, from the perspective that I have, um, I would say that uh, if there's five good greenfield development sites in the, in the city right now that are, are large in scale, uh, four of them are quite constrained by the infrastructure costs. Um, there's a number of arterial roads to build, there's some significant infrastructure for the developer to build front end and, and carry until that they can make that back. So um, a program like this really should open up the opportunity for those developers to move a little faster and to reduce their risk going in. Also believe that this, the program that we have in front of you um, uh, doesn't have a lot of risk for the city. The other model is that the city comes in and says, okay, we're gonna somehow finance capital and we're gonna put the infrastructure in ourselves. Um, that model's been used in, in some of the surrounding municipalities and the city has done it in the past as well where uh, you, you can borrow or you can find a different funding model to front end the infrastructure and wait for it to come back through development. That doesn't have a, a finite timeline on it, doesn't give you any certainty, it just means you've definitely built a road. Um, whereas the, the, what, what's proposed here is that, the, that the, the program doesn't work unless the developer goes vertical and creates some extra taxes. So it's a, it, to me it's a very, it's a very win-win scenario. Um, so the second thing I would say, or third or fourth thing I would say, is um, uh, if you look at the greenfield sites within the city of Mountie, and I'm making this very high level generalization, you can certainly get a lot more granular, but if you look at the greenfield sites in the city today, there isn't any tax lift up on them today. Um, the ones that are being held up because of, the, because of the infrastructure costs are not generating any extra taxes today. So, so the advantage to, to, to what's being proposed is that if, if somebody goes and builds a building, you now have some guaranteed taxes coming at you at some point. Whereas today, that's not a point that's fixed and it's getting harder and harder every day. The infrastructure costs have gone up substantially over the last few years, as you know. Um, so that model gets harder and harder for the developer to, to prove out. So, so we, we think as a development community that, that this opportunity provides, an, uh, provides another opportunity to remove or lower the barriers for developers to move those projects ahead. <clears throat> and I think, I think the, the last thing I would just share I know I've shared this before, I think it's important to reiterate. Um, we've just finished a development, Panatoni just finished development in, north, uh, in the northwest uh, called Apex Business Park. Um, it's a million square feet on 60 acres. I have the tax bill from when we started and I have the tax bill from when we finished. The uplift is $25,666 per acre of tax uplift from building those buildings on this. That, that's, that's very factual. Um, so you don't have to guess how much taxes that's going to generate, but that's what you're going to get. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anand. Over to you. Thank you, and uh, and thanks for having us here today. Uh, yeah, I would echo what Mark says. I think uh, from the NAO perspective, we were involved in the first uh, uh, industrial action plan uh, five or six years ago, and at that time, we had uh, a lot of developers who were telling us that the over expenditures to get into uh, into new industrial areas and open them up uh, were you know was expensive and that the payback is a little bit uncertain because uh, industrial development isn't as contiguous as residential development so you're maybe not certain when uh, when you'll be paid back on on a levy and so we thought of kind of two ways to fix this broadly you can upfront the infrastructure uh, entirely as the city and in certain circumstances that makes the most sense <clears throat> uh, but the the drawback there is that uh, is the level of certainty that uh, that the development will happen right after that point as well as there's a capacity issue with how many uh, how, how much area how many areas you can open up at any given time the other system is the levy system which which we've talked about uh, where the developer upfronts the whole infrastructure, but in certain circumstances they can't because it's it's too expensive, and you can't go uh, to a bank as a developer and say that you're kind of banking on uh, your over expenditure being paid back by another developer when we don't know when exactly that that'll happen. Uh, so what I you know what I want to uh, convey here though is that this system really is the best of both worlds, because you'll be able to get the infrastructure right when. Uh, right when you need it, the developer will pay the uh, will pay for it at, at the point when when it's needed. You know you have certainty on the on the tax uplift on the other end because the developer would, is is going to have skin in the game to know that they're they're coming with a tenant, 
uh, and then uh, it opens up these areas so that the city will be paid back faster. Uh, so I think it's a really great economic development opportunity to be able to say that we have this system, which I uh, think is it's quite unique, uh, which, which merges all of the benefits of, of both the levy system and the, and the upfronting system that other municipalities have. Uh, and so I think it'll lead to, to more development, uh, which is why uh, NAP has, uh, has come in in support of this. All right, thank you so much to both of you, but don't go away yet. There are questions to you. Uh, Constance Stevenson. Uh, yes, just very briefly, I think you both spoke very well to, to the value proposition that this, this offers to us. Just wanting to, to um, get your thoughts on any other actions the city can be taking to accelerate industrial development. Uh, just while we have you here, uh, we just welcome, welcome your thoughts on that. that. That's a hard question to answer on the spot. Um, first of all, I'm going to say that um, I'm really pleased that council, in council's direction and the, and the openness to listen and to hear the industry, I think that's really important. Um, administrations reached out to us on the industrial action plan. I think we're going to be heavily engaged in that, and I think that's probably where that, you know, those big picture ideas will come from. Perfect. Well, that that sounds great. I'm so pleased you're part of that conversation, and look forward to some of those ideas coming through. Thank you. Uh, Thank oh, you. Oh. oh, yeah. No, sorry. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Wright. Oh, sorry, Councillor Rice. Councillor Rice, please. And thank you for coming here and. Thank you for, for your presentation. Uh, I just have a very quick question regarding the recovery of over expenditures uh, cost and could be unpredictable. And can you explain a little bit more and from developer perspective? Yeah, so the, the over expenditure recovery model works great when you have large parcels of greenfield development side by side. Um, so I go in and I develop my 50 acres and then the person next to me develops their 50 acres and I get my share back and then the next person does theirs and they get their share back and everybody contributes. Um, we also contribute to what was there when we got there. So, and, and, and I think every developer will smile and say we're happy to do that because we have certainty. Um, we're, we're, we're starting to become challenging within the city. So when you go outside of the city, you will see those those contiguous parcels of land where there is 50 acres beside 50 acres beside 50 acres. Where it gets challenging inside the city is that those 50 acres are now surrounded by developed sites. So, so in the case of Fulton Creek, for example, there's a car wrecker, there's a steel mill, there's a number of sites already there. So for them to pay back the adjacent developer is, is very difficult to foresee. And, and in fact, our finance model really deals with the over expenditures as bad debt. So it's really hard to get to sell that to an investor, that <laughs> you're just gonna write that off. Um, so because of the fact that the, the, the neighbors are, are built up, it's very difficult to see the future of when you're ever gonna see those recoveries come back. Does this situation apply to the industrial development? Because industrial development is more outside, or outside the city, it's not in... No. So no, we're okay. in, inside the city. You, you have, there's, there's some good industrial development opportunities in the city. Um, there's, there's hundreds of acres of, of good in, uh, zoned industrial land within the city. Fulton Creek is within the city. In the city, yes. okay. Um, there is also development happening outside of the city. And, and um, to administration <coughs> comment on the absorption, there's actually been a lot of absorption in industrial land in the region in the last four or five years. A lot of it has gone outside of the city, and, and I would suggest that a lot of that is to do with the economics. Um, it is, it's difficult to make the numbers work when you've got those constraints working around you. Okay, so thanks for that clarification, because my understanding, and based on the south side, I mean, is outside of the no, city. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so what we're trying, what we're trying to do is put, help the city get into a more competitive situation with those outside groups. There are a lot of users who want to be in the city, um, and and it's y you want to make that path as clear as possible and as certain as possible, and that's the key thing is certainty. Uh, so if that is the case, can you explain a little bit uh, in the report we talk about the, the industrial development recently in the past few years is declining, and then is there, what is the key specific reason besides that uncertainty piece, financial risk? Is there any other reasons, and is declining our city? And for the industrial development. Yeah, so a couple of things. What I would say one, there was some uh, uh, quite a, a lot of activity a number of years ago. Um, so you had a high threshold to start with. 
Um, but there has been some very large projects happen around the city. Um, you know, Amazon, Champion Pet Foods, Ford, there's lots of them. You, you see them when you drive the highways. Um, and the land within the city hasn't moved fast enough to keep up with the demand. There is a lot of demand out there for industrial. You, you read any real estate newspaper, it'll tell you that it's the sweetheart of Bay Street right now. And the city has missed some of that, I think. Um, so, and, and partially it's because of timing. Um, being able to move, the industrial market is very different from residential. With residential, you, you have a very prescribed plan. You know exactly where your house is gonna be and how many you're gonna build. It's just a question of when you're gonna build them. With, the, with an industrial site, you have to build all the infrastructure now and then build. And what you're building could be 100,000 square feet, it could be a million square feet. You don't know until the person shows up. So you, the, the key is getting the site ready. And so, so this program here helps reduce the risk of getting the site ready. Well, thank you for sharing your professional and insights on this. Thank you, Councillor. I have a couple of questions. Thank you so much for actually for both of you being here today and sharing your uh, thoughts and also engaging with uh, in the development of this new new uh, 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 this, this this idea, right? And uh, and also thank you for engaging with the administration for the in, into the future to uh, see how we can unlock more industrial development. Uh, one question just can come into my mind is. The, with this, if this is approved by committee and then council, you will recover your upfront cost uh, based on what city would have charged you. But we also pay a portion of the taxes to the province, right? Uh, you would still be responsible paying your share of the provincial property taxes. And I'm getting not, uh, nods at the back from uh, folks in the taxation area. So maybe some advocacy needs to be done around around that aspect as well, right? That uh, uh, that's about 30% of the cost that you still have to pay, right? So I think uh, it just occurred to me now as, as I was listening to, uh, listening to something to think about because then uh, that's additional burden that you will carry, right? So yeah, okay, good. Uh, the, you know, here, uh, if, we are, if we are able to remove some of these barriers and create this incentive, um, like if you were to say there are six or seven barriers to industrial development, uh, maybe it's not fair to ask this question, but ask this question if you think it's fair to answer, answer it. Like where would taxes be on those out of 10 barriers, like where, where, where yeah, so in the, in the context of just taxes, yeah. um, if you're talking about the differential between Edmonton and the region, I think um, one of my competitors who has a site directly across the street from the, the county would say it's huge. Um, that, that's, a, that's tough. Um, in our experience, there are, there are people who, who a dollar a square foot is important to them and they want to, they want to be in the counties for that reason. There are, there are people who, um, who rooftops are important, staff is important, bus routes are important, um, who want to be in the city for those reasons. So I would say that there's a, there's a value proposition that, that the city has. Uh, when we did the McKesson project here recently, McKesson put a circle around the ring road and said we don't want to be outside there. We need to be in the city, so we need buses, we need places to go for lunch, the services. So, so there are users, and I would suggest that they're the kind of users that the city and that certainly that we want to attract who want to be in the city. Um, the ones that are going outside of the city, you know, they tend to, they tend to um, you know, they're more value conscious, and there's a market for both. Okay. Yeah. Creating amenities, having access to a restaurant, right, or a coffee shop, or yes. access to public transit, yeah. Yeah. or even, you know, if you during lunchtime, if you work in the industrial area, you want to go for a walk, right? Having a, a, a pathway, like what, what I really like about the, the, uh, the southeast part is that there's a, around Fulton Creek, there's mm -hmm. a very beautiful pathway that people yeah. go for a walk during lunchtime, right? I think those kind of things do give us a competitive advantage. And, and maybe on the, on the front end, uh, as, as you speak with developers, I think the way that uh, 
some of the some of the high level things would be the infrastructure to see that the area is available at all. That'll get you in the game. Mm. Then uh, then I think uh, the the size of the of the development site uh, is another piece just to get you in the game. Then I think for some folks, like Mark says, uh, taxes will or, or won't be uh, an issue. But we also see in, in RFPs a lot of times uh, just the speed. Uh, yes. And yeah. so I think that the infrastructure and the site availability is one piece, the amenities is one piece, speed is, uh, speed is another. And I think that those things all come together and, and uh, you, you get, get a result. So on the speed, we won a couple of uh, awards. Uh, uh, are they applicable? Kind of are, are you seeing the speed on, on the industrial side as well? Well, could we see speed on the residential side, right? Uh, are you seeing uh, responsive administration on the industrial side? And industrial side, too, there's good examples of uh, air products uh, right. application or the uh, or polycar application that were uh, fast tracked and got done pretty fast. When my experience has been when, when, when we come to, to administration with an application to put a building up for, for a tenant or not for a tenant, um, it's very smooth, mm. um, it's efficient. We, have, we haven't been held back because of speed on when we get to a piece of land that's ready to go. Um, our, our goal always is to try and get the land ready to go, and that's what this conversation is about, is, is how, do we, how do we remove those barriers to put us in a position of certainty so that when that user comes along, we're ready to fly. Okay. And again, that's one of the positions that the, that the counties have, is they have ready land. Okay. Um, I think I've mentioned a few times, that I, I think yeah. realistically, if Fulton Creek was, if we were two years from now, realistically, I think Amazon would be really looking hard mm. at, because you have rooftops. And in today's world, employment is becoming harder and harder and it's becoming higher and higher on the list for people. Yeah, good. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your uh, 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 thoughts and also uh, your engagement with, with our administration, which is very pleased to uh, hear your comments. Thank you. Uh, uh, next, we will go to Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. I see the, the progress on the development every day as I travel back and forth. And yes, Councillor Wright said it is in the city. Um, so, um, but I'm just wondering, the economic, or sorry, this committee last heard um, in regards to the, the Maple Ridge um, development land just to the east, um, and they had talked about the economic challenges that they've been facing over the past eight, eight years or so, and I'm just wondering, do you see the same economic challenges that would keep you from further development? Um, on our site, we're, we're in. Um, so we're, we're, in, we're approved, we're invested, we have two buildings going up now, so I hope not. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> one of the reasons that we're here um, is because when we took this discussion up 30,000 feet, that 17th Avenue Maple Ridge Corridor uh, is one where I see opportunity for this program to really benefit them. The infrastructure, one of the challenges that site has always had, both of the sites, because there's another one called White Mud 17, right on the corner of White Mud and 17, um, those sites have been challenged by infrastructure costs and there's no neighbors to pay them back. So they have that, the same situation that we faced, only we were able to get investment approval to move ahead. Um, so we've been talking with those owners and saying, hey, th this is important for you, you should be watching this, this is really important. Um, so I'm hopeful that even though they're competitors, I'm hopeful that this, this opens up some more opportunity for those to move ahead as well. Okay. And so is that sort of the urgency then to have this done on an exception basis to the policy now without having the policy fully reviewed? Um, sorry. Well, it, it, was, it was important for us uh, as, as NAOP to, uh, to, to change the policy. So, so that's, what we're, that's what we're asking for today. Like there's the overall industrial action plan and that, and that planning is gonna, is gonna take some time, but this, but this policy, we wanna change it uh, citywide so that places like Maple Ridge and, and others can take advantage of the same program. Okay, because I'm just wondering, there, in the report from administration, I mean, it talks about, I think if, if it went to option three, then there, a more thorough um, GB, GBA an, an analysis, would, I can't speak, a more thorough GBA analysis would be done. Um, and I'm just wondering, can we not wait for that? Like, what is the urgency now, as opposed to maybe six months from now? We can speak to tenants, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the catalyst for bringing this forward 
was that the Fulton Creek project highlighted the fact that there's a significant overexpenditure. So in the case of Fulton Creek, the, the developer is front-ending significant arterial infrastructure and underground infrastructure. And so there's a significant overexpenditure in that case. It's plus or minus $15 million of overexpenditure. So a, as that conversation started to evolve, a um, uh, motion was made to bring it in front of council. Um, so, so the, the urgency from certainly from our perspective is to is to, to is on the Fulton Creek side um, because we're there already and we're investing and we're at, we are we have those tax dollars on your radar they're visible you can go down there and see the steel going up as you mentioned um, as far as the you know once that program gets adjusted then it then it benefits all of the other groups that are in the region how fast they move is is not something we can control and you um, you'd mentioned the steel mill you're talking Alta Steel up on further north on 34th Street? Yes, there's, there's there okay. and there's also Russell Metals that's over on the other side of us. There's a number of developments in that area. But aren't those in Strathcona County then? So they, what what we do as far as the development there and, and, and taxes and that, that wouldn't impact them because they're Strathcona County. Right, yeah, okay. that's correct, yeah. yeah. Okay. So they don't owe anybody anything because they're in Strathcona County. So it's the, if you look at the basin that would owe Maple Ridge, it's over expenditures, White Mud 17, Fulton Creek, that would owe it. And not just those, also Discovery Business Park in the south is another example too where they have a similar issue because they're the ones who are doing the greenfield development neighbor to neighbor to neighbor. Um, so in, in the case of those developments in the, in the Maple Ridge area, uh, th they're very built up. So it's almost like infill development except there's, no, there's nobody there to pay them back. Okay. And in the case of Amazon, I is it really um, the tax structure or is it because it's close to the airport? I mean, I track my packages on Amazon and it yeah. goes straight, you know, from arriving, you know, at the, at the uh, Amazon location in, in NISCU. So I'm yeah. just wondering. I won't speak to a Amazon's business model. It's really complicated to understand. But what I can say is uh, we're building two, two large Amazon facilities for a total of 6 million square feet in Alberta right now. One of them's in Atchison. One of them's inside the city of Calgary. The tax differential on those two is astronomical on a building that size. The reason that they're there is because there was 75 acres of land that you could put a shovel in tomorrow and go. And from a developer's perspective, we had certainty that we could put a shovel in the ground tomorrow and go. Okay. And, and, and that's, that's the key. Okay. Thank, thank you, my you. time's up. Thank you, Constance Wright. Constance Salvador. Yeah, thank you, um, and thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, most of my questions were, are for admin, but one that I do have, uh, I'm just really trying to contextualize Edmonton's competitiveness in, in the region, and um, you mentioned you know, infrastructure availability, site accessibility, speed, those are all, all important factors. Um, I, I'm just wondering, when it comes to the actual cost-sharing policies, uh, what, what does that look like from a regional perspective? Like, is that Edmonton-specific? How, how do we compare and compete? Yeah, so all of the regional, so we, so we have land in Atchison. We've done five developments in Atchison, and we're on our third in the site, the city of Edmonton, and we have Calgary, and we have Fort McMurray. So we kinda, we've kind of seen quite a bit in Alberta. Um, all of the municipalities have a version of a levy program. Um, in some of in the rurals it's a little bit different because you do have greenfield 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 so it, it's quite sequential and you can't hop across so you, you the, the the one development brings the services to the border next development carries on builds them through oversizes them for the next one and and, and off they go so it works it functions quite well um, edmonton's model is is very similar it's just way bigger bigger basin bigger cost bigger infrastructure Right, okay, and then um, what is being proposed in front of committee today? I guess, how big of a, a step forward would that be? How much of an advantage would that give Edmonton going to, from, from a 50% to? I, I don't know that it gives Edmonton an advantage. It removes what I would consider to be a disadvantage. Okay. Is okay. That, if that's fair to say. That's very fair, yeah. yeah. And, and I think it's, it's <coughs> using something that's specific to Edmonton, like Edmonton's ability to, uh, to do this kind of a program, both in the sophistication of it, but also in the, uh, in the ability to hold that over expenditure for a period of time is going to be pretty unique to Edmonton, uh, where, where a smaller municipality can't do that right. uh, and maybe can't upfront infrastructure in the same way that Edmonton can. And so, uh, so we should be unique there. Great, that's very helpful, thank you. Just, and just one more comment, sorry. On, on, on the competitiveness side, I think that really is a, is a really wholesome discussion we should have as part of the action plan. 
um, as the development of that industrial action plan because uh, that's a, probably a two-hour conversation. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> <laughs> agreed. Thank you. Thank you, Council Salvador. So that concludes the questions. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. Cool. And we'll go back to administration for uh, questions from committee, if there are any. Councillor Stevenson, questions, please. Uh, yes. Well, I'll start. I'll start by putting the recommendation on the floor. Uh, yeah that uh, revised council policy C592A, industrial infrastructure cost sharing program as outlined in attachment four of the February 15th, 2023, urban planning and economy report UPE 01431473, be approved to follow, to allow future eligible industrial developers to recover 100% of the tax uplift, uplift for over expenditure costs. Okay, all right, we have motion on the floor. So uh, questions to administration? Councillor Stevenson, go ahead, please. Um, yeah, I just want to thank administration for the work that you've done to bring this forward. I think it's a great recommendation and, and really appreciate uh, um, you, you bringing it to us. Um, I, think, I think, you know, for me, it just speaks to, um, you know, I think it, it creates further incentive uh, for us to, to incent more industrial developments. I'm really looking forward to the industrial action plan work that you're doing. Just, just wondering if there is an opportunity through this, and I don't know how the agreements are structured necessarily, but is there a way to get some other uh, strategic benefit out of this program as well? So looking at um, improved climate change um, standards, shared use pathways, anything like that that you feel is maybe a gap right now in our industrial development, um, that this maybe allows us to, to request um, some of those, those investments in. Or is it just, it's not structured that way in the same way, it's not quite a grant or anything like that? I would say under this exercise, we were looking specifically on the cost shareable infrastructure. So are there opportunities to do more? Potentially, yes. And that's gonna be part of our work that we'll do over the, up until Q3, looking at the industrial action plan and, and terms, not only policy-wise, but uh, what other levers are there. And, and part of that, we'll be talking to stakeholders to find out what that looks like and then looking for evidence in terms of what's going on with those around the region and those in other parts of the country and what the demands are and what is that opportunity that Edmonton has to offer. Great. Yeah, that's very exciting. And I think you're right. That's a more holistic question than this, this specific ask. Um, so yeah, certainly very, very happy with the recommendation and, and look forward to, again, seeing what comes back through the industrial land use policy. I think that's it. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. So the first question, um, so historically, and then have any other developers asked for the change in the policy C-592? Not specifically, no. And then also since the policy creation, only four private companies have applied, have used this policy but there's a rebate and it's actually less than $1 million across four projects. Is that correct? That's correct. So this, is that fair to say this indicates the policy is not needed often and for the industrial development? Because since the creation and for so many years, so I saw, uh, oh. Stephen. I'll jump up here because yeah. I created this policy. <laughs> eight, however many years ago. Um, and when we were creating it, it really was to uh, unlock barriers in industrial development that doesn't happen at the same pace as other development within our city. And that's why this policy was really seen as very critical uh, at, that, at that time when we were developing the first industrial action plan. As we revise the next uh, industrial action plan, we'll continue to look to this policy, but we'll look at other tools as well, um, Councillor Rice, because you're right, there hasn't been um, a ton of industrial development, but the industrial development that we do have is so critically important in our city. Uh, yes, I, I believe that too. Um, so is there a practice of paying for 100% share costs over expenditures is a common across the municipalities? So when we took a look at this type of policy across other municipalities, yeah. it's somewhat unique. The way that other municipalities um, tend to support um, 
uh, over expenditure and in infrastructure is they upfront the costs themselves through debt financing. That's something that the City of Edmonton used to do prior to this policy in 2017. And so this is a, a little bit of a unique to Edmonton approach. Some of our surrounding municipalities don't have the type of infrastructure that we require here in the city just by the nature of them being somewhat smaller. And so places, uh, so how, how they um, do this in other cities is through that um, levy, through different levies. Uh, so they pay up front and they collect the levy from the developer on the back end. So that means the model, recovery model is a little bit different. It is different and it's somewhat unique to Edmonton. It's different and it's more advantageous because you don't have to, the city doesn't pay for the, for all of the infrastructure up front. The developer still pays for the infrastructure up front. Um, so then, and who reports the over expenditures amount? Um, sorry, did you say a month? A, a month. A amount. Yeah. Who reports that? So when we're looking at the front end of a project, the developer is the one who tells us what the overexpenditure is. So they report on those numbers so, based on the project itself. So it is itself, it's, self, it's developer self-reported. Correct. And then, but uh, does the city staff verify it? Councilor Rice, it's based on city standards. So what are the standards that the city requires for arterial roads as an example? Uh, and then we work with the developer on what that cost is associated with that. But it's absolutely based on city standards, so there's lots of oversight um, from development services as well as from the economic investment services branch on what the cost is and how uh, and the mechanisms for being paid back. Uh, yes, I believe we have standards in place, but how we verify it, if it's self-reported. Uh, will we look... <laughs> We, we work with the developer in terms of the verification process, but we don't go out and do a third party verification on that because that would just hold up uh, the process uh, and the speed to market is really important. We have many engineers who work with lots of developers on this type of infrastructure and I have confidence in them and understanding the costs associated and with them. And for me to ask this question, is, I ask this question on behalf of the, uh, some of my con constituents and then for that verification, and then I didn't see the verification process in the place and how we verify that self-reported amount. Specifically, this is not a small amount. And specific for this 7.7, .7, and then it's almost $15 million. Ms. Petrin's online. She can provide more details in terms of how we verify that, uh, those dollar amounts. Councillor Rice, uh, when we have a servicing agreement, the developer will submit the actual costs to us. We verify that, um, and then that cost comes to us. We, it's also all signed off by an engineer. Okay, so, so I have we, more questions. I will come back. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Salvador, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, and yeah, thank you so much to administration for putting this together. Um, I think it's a solid recommendation and uh, clearly a means of attracting jobs and businesses to, to set up shop within the city. Um, I guess just, just a few outstanding questions. I mean, um, in terms of the, obviously there's a really clear direct economic benefit. In terms of the, the indirect benefits from construction materials um, used for the sites, do we know the scale of those types of outcomes that, that would be facilitated or that has been facilitated through this policy? We haven't measured them specifically, um, but in theory it would make sense that those, that it would be a positive impact, but no, we don't have specific numbers on what that would look like. Right, okay. Yeah, no, I, I just can imagine it would be pretty substantial. Um, and then maybe, you might, you might not have this one either, uh, but the report provides information on the tax uplift and, and some of those figures. Do we know the size of some of the capital investments? Um, and particularly like these four developments that have gone through this process, um, just the scale of infrastructure and the facilities that were developed. I imagine, again, it's pretty substantial. Councillor, are you asking um, future what it could be, or are you asking for information on what is? What is, because that'll just give me a bit of an understanding of what could be. So I've got the, the number of 
over expenditure for the uh, for all of the projects of being sixteen million dollars. I'm looking to the team if we've got to the overall um, industrial development numbers for these projects. We don't have the total cost of the capital for those. We do have the over expenditure amounts related right. to the project, but the actual cost. If you want uh, to think a little bit about um, potential uplift, um, as, uh, and that's also, I guess, further to your earlier question about broader impact, some of the uplift could be in the neighborhood of um, 75 to $85,000 per, uh, per hectare uh, as, as uplift for a major, you know, a significant uh, high value industrial development. Right. Or yeah, no, that's, that's helpful. Um, and yeah, it just makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I don't have too many more questions, so I'll, I'll actually just end it there. Uh, and thanks to Councillor Stevenson for putting the um, recommendation on the floor. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Wright. Thank you. So, again, I guess I'm, I'm concerned about the, the, the urgency in looking at this on just a, a one-off exception basis um, without looking at that, you know, the, the fuller, um, I think as Mr. Edwards talked about it, at a, a 30,000 foot level. Um, if, if this exception was not to be granted and, and wait for, uh, I guess, a more fulsome report with some of the other information that, that you've got available to you, like the jurisdictional scan and that information, um, would that restrict being able to to, to increase this, like for this tax year, for I, I just don't understand the urgency of, of, of the the exception right now. So the the urgency is um, a couple of things. So Fulton Creek hasn't um, entered into the uh, this cost sharing program yet. Um, but we're getting close. And so it is the biggest over expenditure that we're going to have of all the projects that have gone through the, the policy so far. So there is, so the importance of catching or including that in this policy now before servicing agreements are in place are, is important. It's easier to do that on the front end administratively than it is to try and make changes on the back end. Um, that being said, um, with the policy that we are recommending as well, because of the com complexity in the servicing agreement, we're also not recommending retroactive to the existing. We're, we're thinking future forward as being one of the mechanisms that can enable industrial development, further industrial development in the city of Edmonton. Understanding that our climate has changed in terms of inflation and risk, financial risk in particular, and the cost of borrowing. And so if we're looking in the city to have large projects that require this large infrastructure development, this is one of the tools that's going to help enable that more quickly as it puts that um, the risk to the de developer, um, um, it's not an incentive, but it's removing uh, a barrier or a risk to okay. this type of development. Councillor Wright, the, the urgency really is that there's a window of opportunity yeah. here right now. And if we wait for this policy to be refined, then we might not get additional industrial development. The market is very hot right now in terms of um, industrial development, and there's a window of opportunity, and that's why we're here right now, is because we believe that this is Council's opportunity to seize that opportunity and to be able to work on uh, protecting our long-term tax base by encouraging more industrial development in our city at a faster pace. Okay, okay and it's interesting you talked about not being retroactive. Because in the report, it talks about um, there could be an impact on um, past industrial developers. So has that been assessed what that tax implication could be? Are, like, are there other developers in the area or, or other property owners that could come back and say, no, we want our fair share too? Uh, yeah, to, to be clear, the report uh, isn't intending to be retroactive. Uh, in an attachment to that report, there's a reference to the fact that um, in, in approving it as a forward-focused uh, policy, that uh, there might there could be questions that previous developers have about their past agreement, but their past agreement is, is a signed servicing agreement already in place. So it was just flagging the, 
the reality that that there could be questions about that. So that I think that's what you're re referring to, Councillor. Yeah, yeah. So there's no legal implications or that uh, that they could come back. I I won't answer a question on behalf yes. of legal services, but Councillor uh, Wright, it's uh, Jamie Johnson here, and yeah, I, we've looked at this. There is a um, they're binding contracts with them. There's no direct legal implications of this going forward. Okay. Okay. That puts my fears Council, to rest right, about I would that. Just also add that this was intended as an incentive program and those property owners who decided to join the incentive program at that time did so voluntarily. So now it's a change of the incentive program. Others gain additional benefit, but what's already there is there and they've, they've signed up for it, right? So okay, they had their chance, is that what you're saying? Well, they've, <laughs> they've already started the development. The incentive did its job for those who are enrolled in the program and they've enrolled. So now the question is going forward, do you want to change that incentive? Okay, all right, thank you very much, my time is Thank you. Running out. Uh, Anton, I want to follow up on my question that I asked to uh, uh, to the members of the public. This may not be material if the budget that's coming from the province lives on the commitment to transfer all the property taxes to the cities, right? So, but in the meantime, if that doesn't happen, are there opportunities to further engage with province that the provincial portion of the property taxes is also treated the same way the municipal proportion is treated uh, on, uh, on a moving forward basis that they are not collecting. They start collecting at the same time that we start collecting. Yeah. Yeah, so, Mayor, so you're absolutely correct. This is a municipal program. And so yeah. the benefits are coming out of the municipal tax base. We're yeah. using the municipal tax base to support it. Property, education property tax is still going 100% towards the province. To have that conversation, to enroll and involve the province in this, in this in this program would be something we'd have to go forward and have, yeah. uh, and actually try to engage them to to be involved in. in oh, are you are you having those conversations, or? I do not believe those conversations have taken place at this time. It's been a municipal program up until now. Okay. But it would be then an, an addition. I think this is something to uh, maybe think about after the budget. Maybe we'll follow up offline uh, about some of the advocacy that might be necessary because this makes sense. I think I'm pretty sure they'll be open to that too because it, it benefits everyone after the initial cost is paid off. Yeah, okay. Uh, on the, uh, uh, I, I, I think we need to be, maybe I'll ask this question. Uh, uh, around like what percentage of our total taxes that we collect from residential, retail, industrial, uh, what percentage is industrial? I'm gonna give you a very high, high rough level. number, 20, probably between the range of 16 to 18% of our base is gonna come from the industrial base. And that's including uh, industrial land, industrial condos, industrial warehouses, all sorts of different industrial inventories. So that really speaks to the fact that we need to be more aggressive in growing that tax base, right? So I think uh, it will be good information, not now, but maybe in the maybe you can provide that information through a memo comparing us. Maybe that, actually I'll wait that because yeah. that will be part of the- In, in previous reports the, that we've discussed yeah. this concept to council before, you know, we typically look at industrial development because it is non-place based. Right, it's not, it doesn't have to be fixed. So retail, as residential uh, develops, you need a certain amount of uh, retail opportunities, yeah. and that automatically comes along with that market demand. Industrial has that potential to be in different locations, yeah. and there's always a bit of a conversation about competitiveness uh, between us and the region. And certainly Edmonton, as you, you know, the questions were asked previously, do have its advantages, right? So we do have market access, proximity to the major populations. It's also a question of, uh, proximity to employment base, right? That people can get to those jobs more yeah. effectively. Yeah. We have the infrastructure, we have the transit, but we also have the services, police, fire, all those kinds of things. So how so do we often, leverage? Yeah. yeah, the conversation becomes mm -hmm. one of just across the border. Those are the ones that we're competing with. But if you're talking about uh, in the far ends of Leduc County and South Side, that's not what the conversation's about. It's about trying to attract uh, investment in Edmonton. Yeah, I think what I'm trying to conveys that we need to be very aggressive and use all the leverages that we have, all the advantages that we have, but also removing the barriers that exist. So, you know, thank you. Thank you for your work. And I was really enforced by the, uh, uh, by the comments from uh, the industry folks about collaboration and, uh, and how, how closely you're working to uh, unlock this potential. So really, really appreciate that. Good, okay. Uh, Go to Councillor Rice for further questions. Councillor Rice. 
so the question to um, Ms. McCap. And in, so you mentioned this is a great opportunity and the time window for this industrial development needs. Uh, as stating right now, did you, re, did you receive the many requests and then for our city's industrial development at this moment? Um, Councilor Race, I'm not sure I understand. Did we receive a meeting request about industrial uh, it's development? It's not a meeting request. I said development request. I'm sorry, a development request. Yes. Yeah. Um, we work really closely with NAOP, the industry organization, as well as individual industrial developers. And this industrial developer is one who uh, approached us, um, let us know about the opportunity, and that's why we're here today advancing this report. So from that perspective, this 100% give back will provide the bigger in incentives and to encourage more development and for our city. Is that, 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 is is that the, understanding That, that right? is the idea, yes. By providing 100% of the over-expenditure, what it will allow is for the land in the area to be unlocked more quickly uh, than if we didn't provide this. Um, so another question is, do we have specific uh, plan or any ideals at this moment and how we ensure this really 100% give back is just to be the intensive and to ensure uh, the developers and builders uh, also at the same time to be economic and the last, not as waste and in terms of self-reported over expenditures. So I think, are you asking me what the risk is associated with this 100%? Uh, I'm not. I'm, a I'm asking is there any plan and in or ideals at this moment and to ensure this is really achieve the outcome for the intensive and then from economic perspective is not just we give this 100% back and then to encourage that some waste for the over expenditures. The risk for the overexpenditure yeah. is managed and actually, by yeah, encourage and then I don't want this become some like uh, encouragement and for the developers to be wasteful and for oh, certain for them sense. to be wasteful. Yes. Yeah, I, I, and how to be more economic. Yeah, I, I don't see that risk there, and that the developers will often challenge us on our own design standards. Um, and there's some work that we're doing right now uh, from some motions that have passed at Urban Planning Committee to make sure that we're we've got some economic that we have economical design standards, uh, and we make sure to get the full cost uh, submitted, Councillor Rice. So I, I believe that risk is actually managed quite well in the in the department. I also think that there is um, natural incentives built into how the developer pays up front because they have to carry that expense until they get the tax uplift back. And so there's a natural incentive to make sure that, that the over expenditure is not larger because they still have to pay a proportion of it. So that natural incentive is built in there uh, into this model, but as Stephanie had said, there's checks and balances in the city and we've got people who work in this field that have a, a keen eye to making sure that there isn't that waste and that things are built to standard. Uh, that's great and I really appreciate that clarification. And then also last question, uh, right now uh, the, this site at Fontan is pre-list, right? Is pre-list, the building is pre-leased. Is a pre-leased and then is is that fair to say they gave the owners immediate access to return already? And from that recovery perspective. Uh, we don't have that. Uh, the, that's a, probably a better question posed to the applicant, Councillor Rice. Our understanding okay, I, is it's not, not the case, but yep. I, I can't confirm or deny that. Okay, so I, I will ask. Yeah, we can follow up offline now, right? Because you can't go back to public <laughs> public presenters now. So we oh, okay. cannot go back to the Oh, we cannot the go back yeah. them. But you can follow offline, they're here, right? They'll be able to give you that. For answer. them to, yeah. oh, okay, I said I we have an opportunity to ask <laughs> no. us newer information. No, not, not. Oh, that's, that's for public, public hearing now, okay. Public okay, yeah. thanks. Good. Okay, All I right. will follow up. Good, thank you, Councillor yeah. Rice. Councillor Wright? Hi, just a, a couple quick questions. Um, 
So going back to your, um, your, your presentation there on, on the slides, you're showing the city um, tax uplift or, or costs, sorry, are sort of consistent throughout the, the 10 or 10 years or so. But really, aren't we, but by providing 100% of the tax revenue um, back to the, to the developer, that's tax revenue that other property owners are having to pick up, right? It, they're not getting it. I think it's a question of timing. So I would say in, in the short run, uh, the city of Edmonton is participating and, and putting in uh, property tax revenue to, to cover that. And does mean that other property owners have to cover the budget for that time being. The intention is that the program results in additional development that would otherwise not occur, occurred. And that's really where the program turns. If you can incentivize additional development, then really this is uh, revenue we would not have otherwise received and it's a net positive. If it's development that would have occurred otherwise, well then we're just giving some additional money to those developers. So it's always a conversation that but for this investment would it have occurred. But then regardless, we will be re getting our, our property tax revenue back in the, once the development has paid back its over expenditure. Uh, and at that time, you know, we're 100% uh, that development paying towards the tax levy. But so in the short run, we are, uh, having a, a financial cost. We're just slicing up the pie into maybe smaller slices in the short run in order to get a bigger pie in the end? That's the hope. Okay. Uh, just, I, I could add to that. Um, when, the de when the city uses the tax uplift to pay back the developers over expenditures, the city is then assuming those over expenditures. And so it's like they're making an investment that they will still get a recover, they will still get the money back mm -hmm. with interest, and so so it's like you're making an investment. It's just we don't have the benefit of using that money in the meantime, but we've basically invested it, and we'll ultimately get it recovered. So there's no there's no net loss to the city here, and that's why we see this as as kind of a win-win situation where we're facilitating the industrial development with really incurring no additional risk to the city. We're just you know, making an investment with some of the money that we could have used, but we'll be able to benefit from that later on with interest. Okay. Okay. I will just clarify. Yeah. There is still a 25% investment in the overexpenditure for the city of Edmonton, so we do participate. But the change of the program for 50% to 100% of uplift doesn't affect our net contributions over the long term. Okay. And then I have one other. Um, so again, in, in the, the the presentation, you've um, shown the, the future develop, developers and their contribution. What about existing property owners in the surrounding area? Is there any sort of short-term impact on the, on the taxes that they pay? So uh, that can be a bit of a complicated question, I suppose. If there is development in the area, making the area more desirable, and you're actually seeing sales in the area increasing, then property values generally could be increasing in those areas, resulting in existing developments, potentially just seeing their property values increase at a faster rate than the overall market, which could increase their pie slice, as, as was discussed. Uh, the question about over-expenditures or development levies, until they uh, take out a development permit, look to do additional development, they wouldn't be charged their share of that over-expenditure until they were to try to redevelop their site. So on that, on that front, they're not paying any component of this until they look to redevelop it. On the property tax side, assuming this results in stimulation of the area and, and market uplift, then there could also be a bit of a increasing share of their, their pie slice, if you will. Okay, so how, how wide is that reach, I guess, on this specific development? So this goes up to, I think, 56th Ave, is it? And, and like from 34th Street to halfway to 17th Street, so, yeah, I mean, Councillor, in some ways you're asking us for what will be the future market uplift as a result of this development. We're really good at looking at historical information and telling you what's happened with the sales in the past. We're not so good at looking and forecasting into the, into the future in terms of market change. One would assume, however, that as you are developing in an area and there's, uh, it's, it's available land, uh, that will make it more, uh, more valuable and more, and more of interest to developers to, to move into those areas. My time is up. Okay, thank you. It's probably good for property value to go up, right? So, I think it's benefits to them too, right? So, yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that concludes the questions. Uh, we have uh, a motion on the floor. Anyone to speak? Councillor Rice, you're signing up to speak? If you uh, go ahead, please, Councillor Rice. So, appreciates city uh, administration provide the detailed reports and regarding this uh, increased intensive tourist industrial development. Um, like I mentioned earlier, industrial development is really important for our city's economic recovery and from long-term goal. Um, so I'm a little bit struggling and for this move so quick and from 50% payback to 100% for the, for the future, for the ending uh, development, not only for this one development. Uh, I heard some concern and from my colleague, uh, concern right regarding certain urgencies or other type of factors here. Um, and also um, from the presentation I saw, um, the deferred tax revenue collection is the same years, seven years. And for the seven years and then due to the economic downtime, um, the burden and even in the short term and then shared with other property tax payers, I think is a little bit concerning and for me. And however, and the future and from that big picture perspective, I really uh, want to hear more from my other colleagues not in today here for the discussion in the council, for the further discussion on this specific policy change. Um, so to me, this is too quicker and with a full policy review and with lots of uh, like recovery model change and also financial model and risk medication. Um, so I'm going to support recommendation to the council for further discussion, but I'm, I'm looking forward to touch base with the developer of nine for get certain clarification for the self report and for how the over expenditures uh, be reported and happened and how we do that uh, um, recovery. Um, so we'll make the final decision and at city council. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Wright. Thank you. While I'm not on the committee, and I do appreciate the opportunity to make a decision um, with all of council on this uh, when it comes forward, um, maybe that'll give me some more time to follow up uh, with administration on some of the concerns that I do have on it. Um, I, I do I do support um, our industrial development. There's there's a lot of it in uh, um, development area in Ward Spomatapi, so I, I would like to to see that occur, but um, not at, at the expense of um, having having that tax burden spread out against other um, industrial and residential property owners. So I look forward to having some conversations with administration um, to maybe get some more information that I didn't see uh, in the report. And uh, I will just leave it at that. Looking forward to having it come to council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Uh, I will, before I go to Councillor Stevenson to close, uh, I, there's no risk to, uh, to the city here, right? Uh, uh, the risk is that pro uh, developer, it, or if they're willing to upfront that cost of millions of dollars. Uh, all they're looking for is that it is kind of paid back or recovered in a reasonable amount of time for them to uh, make that investment worthwhile. And the uptake for the city is that we will get revenue that we otherwise would not get, right? So uh, uh, I remember the discussion that we had almost my, my decade ago about the downtown for the CRL, right? You know, um, same ideas that you uh, uh, create a system that allows people to uh, 
make those investments and then recoup those investments. In this case, since you are going into a big, big pot of money, right? But in this case, uh, the uh, the developer would get to keep some of that uplift in the property taxes, right? So I don't see any risk to the to the current property owners. Don't no risk to the city, uh, and it's actually beneficial to. Uh, surrounding property owners as well. Like if their developers putting millions of dollars in infrastructure up front that unlocks potential for other landowners in the same area to, uh, uh, to develop their properties, right? I think uh, otherwise we will be making those investments. And instead of us making those investments, private sector is making those investments, right? So uh, I think this is a win-win for, uh, uh, for everyone and I, uh, I hope uh, that committee will support this, and I hope that council will uh, support this when it comes to, uh, comes to that table. And with that, I'll go to Councillor Stevenson to close. Uh, thank you, thanks so much. Um, you know, I really appreciate the conversation today, really appreciate what uh, administration has brought forward, and I think it's one of those cases where, you know, it almost seems too good to be true, but I think it is actually just as good as it sounds. Um, we get partners in the development industry to pay for that upfront capital cost, so that takes uh, a burden off of our uh, capital budget, which we know is, is already stretched. Uh, we create new revenue. We create new revenue uh, and we just, you know, we grow the pie and we just have to patiently wait before we start eating that pie. But when we start eating that pie, it's even bigger than, than when we started. So. Um, again, I, I, I'm very excited for this. I really appreciate administration bringing it forward and uh, uh, hope for the support of committee and also council when it makes its way up there. Good. Thank you. All right, thank you. So please vote. <laughs>
Good afternoon, we are live from River Valley Room. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Uh, we are back at our executive committee meeting for today, February 15th. Um, uh, Mayor Sohi is just detained at a community event, but will be joining us shortly, but I'll get us uh, started off. I'll start with a roll call of committee members. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. Uh, Councillor Rutherford is also at the same event and will be joining us shortly. Um, we don't have any of our other colleagues in the room um, online. We have... Oh, Councillor Wright. Um, Councillor Principe. Hello. Hi. And that's everyone for now. Um, we are on item 7.2 and 7.3, which are cross-referenced. So we'll turn it over to administration uh, for your presentation. And then we will move on to speakers after that. Oh, but I do want to take a moment before we get into our formal proceedings. Uh, to acknowledge our guests here today. So uh, we have uh, visitors from the grade six class of Michael Stravitsky School. Hello, welcome. Uh, they're here with their teacher, uh, Tanya Boyko, this morning, or this afternoon. Hi, welcome. Um, you, your school is in Ward Garahiro, which is uh, Councillor Tang, who's not with us right now, but I'm sure she sends her greetings and her best. And maybe the mayor would like no, to no, say no, hello no, too. Okay, he'll grab a few things. Anyway, thank you for being with us here today. We hope you have a great time at City Hall School. And now over to administration, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Councillors. Thank you for allowing assessment and taxation to present to committee today. The presentation uh, I'm going to give addresses two motions passed by executive committee last year. The first motion asked us to develop options to phase out the other residential subclass and explore how residential tax subclassing could be used in support of the city plan. The second motion asks us to discuss how the property tax system could be made more progressive. We have cross-referenced the reports responding to these two motions because they are both focused on residential property tax subclassing. First, I would like to provide a bit of background and context to how property assessment relates to property taxation. As with all municipalities in Alberta, uh, Edmonton is required to use market value mass appraisal as the foundation of its property tax system. Under Alberta's legislative framework, property is assessed annually in accordance with its market value as of July the 1st of the previous year. Assessment values are therefore a reflection of the market at a point in time in the recent past rather than a forecast of future property value. The annual market value assessment process is the framework that Alberta uses to ensure the fair and equitable distribution of the property tax levy within each legislated tax class. Subclassing those tax classes layers tax policy considerations onto that framework. Councils may choose to use subclassing to adjust the basis of distribution of the tax burden or to attempt to influence property owners' behavior in some way. The annual market value assessment process, however, remains at the foundation of the tax framework. Next slide, please. Both the reports before you focus on a review and consideration of residential subclasses. Municipal councils may subclass residential, uh, residential property on any basis it considers appropriate, so long as the subclasses are based on the characteristics of the property. However, despite this broad authority, there are a few in Alberta that have taken advantage of it. And this means that there is little precedent to indicate how the subclassing authority may be interpreted by the courts and the legal system. A legal memo has been provided on the limits of tax subclassing and we can discuss those details in future if committee so wishes. At, um, as this would represent legal advice, uh, the conversation should be held in camera. At the present time, Edmonton has one residential subclass with another scheduled to come into effect in 2024. The existing other residential subclass comprises properties with four or more dwellings on a single title, commonly termed 
multi-residential properties. The tax rate for these properties is 15% higher than it is for the general residential properties, such as detached homes, duplexes, and condominiums. A derelict residential subclass comprising properties in an advanced state of disrepair will be taxed in 2024 at the non-residential tax rate pending formal council adoption later this year. Of the two reports, sorry, next slide please. Of the two reports before you, we would like to begin with the property tax system report, which explores introducing greater progressivity into the property tax system. Our analysis first considered whether it would be possible to incorporate some measure of a property owner's income into the property tax system. The legislation makes it clear that municipal councils do not have the authority to impose a tax on income, so we would need to infer income from another source, one that is tied to property's characteristics. The options we considered were, would incur significant legal risks and come with some practical implement, uh, implementation challenges. For example, the subclassing bylaw itself could be subject to legal challenge based on a municipal council's authority to tax according to something other than a property's characteristics. There are a few precedents for this, and those that exist are from outside Alberta and are under different legislation. There is also little case law to indicate how the courts might interpret the city's authorities for subclassing. Practically, we don't have the authority to collect income information for property owners without voluntary disclosure. We also not administratively set up to audit, verify, or evaluate income information. This means that we would have to rely on proxies which are less reliable. Tying the subclass instead to a characteristic of the property, such as its size or its assessed value, and thereby inferring an owner's ability to pay, creates some issues with fence line comparisons or in other words, simil similar properties that are taxed differently depending on whether they fall below or above a line. Next slide, please. For example, consider a subclass for properties worth more than a million dollars according to their assessed value. If council were, for example, to impose a tax rate that was 10% higher for homes with assessed values of more than a million dollars compared to properties assessed at less than a million dollars, the group within the subclass would experience a tax increase of about 5.3 million, and the rest of the residential subclass would, uh, residential class, I beg your pardon, would see a 0.3% decrease, assuming revenue neutrality. We believe that such a subclass raises some issues of equity and predictability for taxpayers. Equity in the sense that two property owners, one with a $999,500 property and the other with a million dollar property, would pay quite different tax amounts depending on their home values being similar, despite their home values being similar. The first property would pay, in today's budget, about $7,000, while the second would pay about $7,704. With only a $500 difference in assessed value, the second property pays more than $700 more than the first, where under our current system, they would pay only about $4 more. Predictability is also a concern in that properties that are valued close to that million dollar mark may be above the threshold in one year and below the threshold in, an in another, and that would result in quite significantly changing tax bills year to year. One thing to note is that subclasses currently cannot be applied incrementally. For example, at the moment we are not able to tax the first million dollars of a home's assessed value at one rate and the remaining value at another. So based on our analysis, administration does advise against proceeding with a subclass option based on income or its proxy. However, should the committee wish a deeper understanding of legal implications, we would be happy to continue the conversation in camera. Next slide, please. The next report before you today is broken into two sections. The first discusses the potential elimination of the other residential subclass, and the second considers possible approaches to residential subclassing that would support the city plan. We are seeking your direction on each of these. In terms of the potential phase out of other residential, we are asking whether council would like us to proceed with phasing out the other res residential rate, and if so, what timelines are preferable. With respect to tax subclassing in support of the city plan, we are seeking council's direction as to whether we should continue to examine density-based subclassing as a potential approach to residential taxation. 
A change such as this would represent a significant structural shift in the city's tax regime, and we do recommend further analysis and public engagement if council is interested in further exploration. As an additional note, administration would not recommend pursuing a density-based subclass if the other residential tax subclass is not first eliminated. So direction on the density-based approach does uh, somewhat rely on the uh, direction for the other residential phase out. Next slide, please. To help support council's uh, decision-making, administration undertook some initial engagement uh, efforts on both questions. We engage with industry and community stakeholders through several channels, including an Edmonton Insight Community Survey, an engaged Edmonton webpage, one virtual engagement session with industry stakeholders, and two with community members. The engagement focused on the existing other residential subclass, but also addressed using tax subclassing as a policy tool more broadly in support of the city plan. Some of that feedback is included within the report, and I'll reference it in the following slides. One conclusion made clear from our consultation was that property tax is generally perceived as complex, and especially so when we engage in deeper topics like subclassing. We heard from several community members that they did not feel they had sufficient understanding of the system to give informed responses to all our questions, and this is something we would look to address in future engagement. That said, we do believe the engagement results are helpful in understanding public perspectives on tax subclasses, and I will refer to those in the presentation. Next slide, please. Phasing out of the other residential subclass would be administratively straightforward. The rates for the subclass would be aligned with the general residential rate, either immediately or over several years. Once rates are aligned, the subclass would be eliminated by amending the subclassing bylaw. During our engagement, we found that most community stakeholders did not support eliminating other residential, but did note that if it was to be eliminated, they would prefer it phased out over time. Industry stakeholders preferred an immediate phase out of other residential subclasses and indicated that so doing would support further investment in these types of properties, which would increase supply of rental housing in the city. If other residential were to be phased out immediately, it res would result in an 11.7% tax decrease for the properties within the other residential subclass, such as apartment buildings, and a 1.6% tax increase for general residential properties, such as detached homes, condominiums, duplexes. Total tax levied would remain unchanged. Eliminating the subclass over several years would simply spread out this impact. Should council wish to eliminate other residential, administration would recommend a three-year phase-out, which would reduce the 15% differential in 5% intervals, while also spreading out the impact to residential property owners. Next slide, please. The final part of the report considers the use of tax subclassing to support the city plan. The city plan sets out a variety of objectives in the form of goals, values, outcomes, intentions, and directions. Administration would not recommend using subclassing as a tool to pursue a narrowly defined or short-term policy objective because changes to the tax system have a broad impact and need a long period of time to become evident. But in considering how tax subclassing could support the city plan, we focused on one of the underlying themes in the plan, which is to increase residential density so that the city's population can grow within its existing boundaries. While we don't believe that density-based subclassing necessarily or or is necess necessary or sufficient to increase density, it could provide an incentive to support densification. 39% of respondents to the Insight survey agreed that it was somewhat or very appropriate to use subclassing to pursue policy objectives. 27% thought it was somewhat or very inappropriate, and the rest were neutral or had other opinions. Another aspect to density-based subclassing is that research has shown, both in Edmonton and elsewhere, that denser development is more efficient to service. Thus, council might consider it reasonable to levy a lower tax rate on people who choose to live more densely, since denser properties cost less to service. 51% of survey respondents agreed it was appropriate to use policies to change tax distribution, which suggests that this rationale may more, be more readily supported by Edmontonians than the policy objective rationale. Next slide, please. In this report, we have described two potential high-level approaches 
to developing a subclassing structure based around density. I should note that either of these approaches would require further work and further decisions to be made, such as number of subclasses and the thresholds that would define them. The first approach is based around the number of dwellings on a single unit of land. For most properties, the unit of land would simply be the titled lot. For condominiums, the unit of land would be the area occupied by the condominium plan, and for bare land condos, it would be the area of land assigned to each condominium unit. Subclasses would be defined by the number of dwellings on the property. For example, a high density subclass could be defined as four or more dwellings, dwelling units per unit of land. This approach does not directly reference the area of land, so it's not a per perfect reflection of density, but it would provide a reasonable proxy. Subclassing would occur in a similar way to the existing other residential subclass, but would be taxed almost in the inverse. In other words, the dense subclass would be taxed lower than the rest of the residential properties. This approach would also treat medium and high-rise condominium buildings the same way as it treats apartment buildings, as these would also be defined as dense properties. The second approach is based around the dwelling density ratio, or in other words, the number of dwellings on a property divided by the area that property occupies. This ratio would be calculated for every residential property in the city and subclasses would be defined as ranges of values. For example, a high residential subclass could be defined as properties with a dwelling density ratio of more than 50 dwellings, dwelling units per hectare. This approach would be more directly reflective of residential density, but it may be more difficult to explain and administer. Next slide, please. In conclusion, we really do appreciate your interest in assessment and taxation and look forward to the continuing the conversation. To help support that conversation, this slide presents the direction we are looking for from committee. Should committee give direction to continue research into a density-based subclass, we would look to bring forward a service, pa service package in the fall SOBA with an outline of costs associated with more fulsome public engagement as well as the city's technology investment needed to build out a flexible subclassing module. And with that, I'll close and uh, invite any questions you may have. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that uh, very thorough uh, presentation. Really, really appreciate that and uh, all the work that has gone into it. Um, so if you don't mind uh, stepping back, uh, we'll have, uh, uh, we have a number of uh, public speakers uh, on uh, both of these uh, items. And I will call their names and ask them to uh, come to the front, please. Uh, Thomas Burr joining us present uh, in, uh, in the room, so it will be number one. Henry Edgar, I see Henry. Uh, number two, Anand, Anand is here, Anand Pai. Uh, then we also have uh, uh, Jamie Chirwin, Chir Chirwinski. Jamie, are you here? I'm online. Oh, you're online, okay, got yeah. it, okay. And each of you will have five minutes to uh, make your presentations. And after you're done, uh, committee members and council members may have questions. So uh, we'll start with uh, uh, Thomas Burr. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Sohi and executive committee members. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. I wear two hats today. I'm chair of the UDI Nodes and uh, Corridors Committee. I'm also vice president of mixed-use development for One Properties. UDI, at UDI, we strive to be uh, city partners, uh, city building partners with the city, and we're committed to working towards the goals of the city plan. And indeed, that's why we restructured our committee structures uh, to actually have a nodes and corridors committee to focus on that very thing. Our committee, we have most of the major urban developers and several uh, professionals working in the urban uh, space in, in um, the city. At One Properties, our head office is in Edmonton. Although we've expanded out uh, and have major operations in both East and West Canada, we're an investor, asset manager, property manager, and developer of top class um, real estate. In Alberta, we have a por portfolio or pipeline, pipeline of about 5,100 multifamily units, including around 1,500 high density homes we've built in Edmonton since 2018. Our most recent is Citizen Island Jasper. Uh, which as of 9 a.m. this morning, we opened the doors and we started our first uh, tours of 
for prospective new uh, residents. That uh, one, we create real estate opportunities and attract institutional investors such as Canadian pension funds, mutual funds, and more. My perspective is informed by having a view on the national investment market and what it takes to attract capital here into Edmonton. I spoke to a committee 12 months ago. I was very pleased to see the um, direction to explore other residential and perhaps further subclassing. Um, it's encouraging because without a change, uh, current policy is throwing grit into the gears of the city plan. UDI engaged with city tax and finance teams and I think it was an uh, honest um, attempt to fact find on the issues. The report provides information and leaves it to council to provide direction on policy. A lot of the language um, in the report seems to focus on um, what would be the impacts of on an existing building. The question I think we all really need to ask is what is the impact on those buildings not yet built, those in the nodes and corridors. The, ex the economics are exceptionally tight um, right now and property tax policies are making it significantly worse. One Properties has a number of uh, major sites in, in the city here and currently they're not feasible to move forward into development. I have three specific points to make. Um, first rate of change, admin's report seems to um, acknowledge it's fair and reasonable to provide some predictability and rate of change in taxes so people can plan, businesses can plan. The rate of change we've seen since 2018 has been nothing short of astonishing. Uh, easily 70 to 80 percent increases from a combination of um, uh, mill rate changes but, but in large degree assessments. Um, secondly, um, very high property taxes on high density and multifamily housing here in Edmonton is it's making the city uncompetitive. Uh, the most direct comparable is Calgary and uh, data, we, the, the difference between the two is stark. We've seen uh, analysis from Altus which was provided to administration that suggests apples to apples it could be as high as 80% higher. And that's impacting decision making. Capital is, flow, is interested in Calgary, it's, very, it's a very tough sell here at the moment. My final main point is really just to think about what are the goals of the city plan High density uh, residential and mixed use is trickier than low rise. There's lots of variables, lots of headwinds right now. Construction costs, supply chain, interest rates. Um, there are lots of variables that, that affect the feasibility. But when I look at the development dashboard, property taxes is flashing red. A previous council 49 years ago decided to tip the scales in favor of uh, single family homes, condominiums against multi-family housing. That, that was a policy decision taken at the time. Ending, sub, ending uh, other residential, all that does is equalize it. And the, thing to, the other thing to remember, condominiums, the, the market here has been exceptionally thin in the last few years. If we, get a, if we see 100 units of sales, I'll be amazed. Um, it's multi-family rental that is gonna drive, uh, drive the city plan. And um, I think, um, I think City Council has a, a, a decision to make on what, it, what's, what its priority is. Do we want to build out seed plan or do we want to have it as a paper plan and not build much? Thank you. So uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. We'll go to Henry Edgar next. Uh, hello, Mr. Mayor and members of Council. My name is Henry Edgar. Uh, I'm an owner of Edgar, a real estate development firm with deep roots in the city of Edmonton. Uh, we're committed to doing business here and in the last decade have built uh, 500 homes. Uh, we have 163 homes under construction now and nearly 1,000 homes approved or in process for approval by administration. I also sit on the board of the Edmonton Downtown Business Association. I'm the vice chair of the Urban Development Institute in addition to being a member of the Downtown Recovery Coalition. I'm a passionate city builder and share in our collective goal of creating vibrant and healthy communities throughout Edmonton. I'm gonna be a bit repetitive from when I spoke to this group nearly a year ago on this issue. Uh, however, I'm here today because I still believe that our property tax structure uh, is the single greatest impediment to further infill growth um, 
uh, in our core neighborhoods and a significant roadblock if we're to achieve the goals set out in our city plan. The drastic changes made to assessments and mill rates over the last five years has created uncertainty and reduced investor confidence in our city. It also creates a competitive disadvantages, uh, disadvantage um, when compared with other markets, specifically Calgary, as you heard from uh, uh, Tom Burr. Um, and I actually took a, took a moment to look up some stats. And in Q3 of 2022, um, Calgary had 10,000 rental apartments under construction, which was a 20-year high, uh, and Edmonton had 2,500. So when it comes to Calgary and Edmonton, we're losing three times out of four. Um, by way of an example, uh, an average apartment in 2018 had a tax assessment of roughly 2,200 per year. The market at the time had a low vacancy and rents for apartments were roughly 285 per foot. It was a strong market which encouraged development and this was evidenced by the significant amount of construction in the years prior. The same unit in 2022 had a tax assessment of 3,500 per year and this is roughly a 60% increase over a four year period. All this while the market was experiencing rapid vacancy growth and decline in rental rate revenue due to the effects of the pandemic. And that increase in cost um, resulted in a reduction in value of 32,500 per unit. So if you multiply that over hundreds of units, you can imagine the effect uh, to our bottom line. And as developers, we take significant risk and invent, invest significant capital in these buildings. And when we begin construction, uh, we have to use the inputs that we have in front of us at that point. We can't halfway through the job return the material and, uh, and, and, and say, uh, say we'll move on to something else. Um, so, you know, that, that, that really, um, that decimated investor confidence and decisions to proceed on major projects were halted. If we carry on under the current tax regime, we'll see continued stagnation of our approved development sites throughout the city. And those developments that choose to proceed will likely have to sacrifice a certain level of quality architecture um, and design in order to make their margins work. The industry needs your help if we're to develop the density required to meet the goals of the city plan and aid in the recovery of our downtown core specifically. And eliminating the other residential subclass isn't enough. I, I truly think we need more. Um, and I would, I would urge um, this committee to pass a motion for administration to eliminate the other residential subclass immediately and work with stakeholders such as UDI, Nodes and Corridor Committee, um, uh, to explore uh, and define a density-based subclass structure that will align with the strategic vision of the city plan. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any Thank questions. You. Thank you, Henry. Next, we will go to Anand. Hi. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council for uh, listening to me twice today. Uh, I, uh, I don't have so much to add uh, uh, based on, on what these folks are saying. Uh, we had our uh, NAV broker panel uh, just last week, and, uh, and in the multifamily investment segment, you know, we heard from, from experts saying the same things, which is that, uh, which is that any institutional investor uh, looking at uh, the Alberta market or looking at the national market is going to necessarily look at Calgary and Edmonton both. And <clears throat> what, they, what they will see, and the reason why institutional investment is, is going to Calgary, uh, is that the rents are higher in Calgary, uh, and so, so the revenue side is, is, is uh, better, but the, uh, but the taxes are uh, significantly higher in Edmonton. So on the expense side, uh, taxes are about 50% of the, of, of the overall operating expenses, and that's passed on uh, to the tenant, but it's also capitalized. So what we see is on, a, uh, uh, on, an, on an average 750 square foot unit uh, that, you might have, uh, that, that you might have rents that are, or, or sorry, you might have property taxes that are $3,500 in Edmonton uh, and $2,200 in Calgary. Uh, but then you might have a rent differential uh, where, where on the revenue side you're making uh, $1,900 uh, in Edmonton and $2,100 or $2,200 in Calgary. Uh, when you take a look at this, at this spread, the higher expenses and the lower revenues in Edmonton, uh, it, when you capitalize that, it, uh, 
it actually looks like uh, units in Calgary are, are therefore worth to institutional investors uh, up to $50,000 more. Uh, and so that's why we're seeing this institutional capital going to Calgary, why you see more rental towers uh, being pushed in Calgary, because you can take those kinds of risks uh, there. So we, we wanted to we wanted to just to, to kind of uh, plainly put those those numbers uh, out there because I think there's a real opportunity to uh, incent and and uh, and to the skills in, in favor of multifamily development uh, and higher density uh, through this uh, a change in this policy. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Next, we'll go to Jamie Cherwinski. Thank you, Mr. Sohi, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you guys today. Um, so I'm here kind of like to be clear to advocate for a land value tax as a potential solution for um, like the, the problems and sort of opportunities you guys are trying to address. I'm surprised that um, it has not been sort of brought to your attention a little bit more as an option. And I think it's you know a disservice kind of not to make that information available to you. Um, next slide, please. And, and ultimately, like that's kind of why we're here. There's a history of this. I actually cut a slide from this presentation um, with, you know, back and forth between council and administration since 2018 about how can we manage tax policy to kind of meet the city's goals. Um, and that's kind of what this is all about. So next slide. Oh, this is and this is the one. Yeah. So this this question has gone back and forth. And I'm surprised that land value tax as a policy option has only come up like in one page, a small page in a large report about um, tax policy opportunities for the city. And I, I think that's a huge oversight. I think I, I couldn't, you know, state that strongly enough. And I think it's like important that you guys are aware of land value taxes as an option and you do some research and, and ask administration for more information on it as an option. I think it's um, going to be a very useful tool for you to investigate. Uh, next slide. And, and ultimately, like, it's super important, right? Half of your revenue, over half of your revenue is tax revenue. Um, you know, so if you, you spend half your time on your revenues, half your time on expenses, um, you know, you should be maybe spending half your time on tax policy, right? And you're probably not, I don't think. So I think this deserves a lot of attention and, and you have to get it right. Next slide. And, and to summarize that again, like this means three billion in revenue to the to the city every year, three billion in, uh, per, or 3,000 per capita. That's a lot of incentives for citizens. Um, and all the, you know, every house that somebody buys, it's, those decisions are influenced by tax policy. It's, it's really important to get right. If it's poorly designed, there's all sorts of incentives that you're going to be creating that um, you don't want to create, and you can avoid that with good tax policy. Um, and, that's, and that's what we want to do, I think. Next slide. So yeah, status quo, land use differentials, a million ways to slice this. I don't want to get too, too much into the details, but I, I, I do want to mention that, like, the cons side of this equation are important in that you're going to always have people lobbying to get under the threshold of whatever the lower tax rate is in any kind of land use differential system. Um, you know, th there's going to be people who, once you implement that system, are going to be relatively unhappy, and that's going to happen with any tax policy, but they're going to be relatively unhappy with whatever those thresholds are, right? If you fall under or over a threshold, you're going to complain and you're going to say, I want to be in another threshold. And, and that reduces perceptions of fairness in the tax system overall, you know, is delegitimizing. I think that's a problem, reduces trust. And then you have to rely on administration who, you know, I'm sure they're, they're competent and, and you're know, well resourced to do these things, but they're not a market. They're not individuals making decisions on their own behalf all the time. They're, they're vulnerable to making mistakes. Um, and so I think that's a weakness of, of being really arbitrary about land use differentials. Um, next slide, please. So, and then more generally, like what a land value tax is, is taxing land kind of specifically separate from improvements. Um, and so what's wrong with taxing improvements? Well, it's kind of burdensome to assess, right? What's behind walls you can't see, right? Um, that can be invasive. Um, it disincentivizes Im improvement of properties and inv additional investment, right? So why sink $100,000 into, into my house if the city's gonna come after me for more money as soon as I do that? That's, that's a disincentive to investment. And it's good to avoid that if we can. Um, and that disincentive is gonna increase property prices and decrease affordability, right? Because less investment le leads to fewer units, lower quality units, higher rents, higher prices for the units that are there. Um, so yeah, those are all, you know, those are incentives I think you should work to avoid. Next slide, please. 
so you know idea and it's not my idea this is a really popular old thing goes back a long time um assess land separately and tax it separately and at a higher differential rate than improvements next slide so what would the incidents impact be like kind of overall as a whole it's going to accomplish a lot of the goals you want to accomplish right um you're going to see increased per capita tax incidents on low density land uses like marginally so on most single family homes marginally so on large lots um, and on relatively undeveloped lots um, you're going to see it increase per capita per capita tax incidents a little bit on high value land like right downtown super developed areas there's going to be a little bit more kind of in tax incidents incidents especially on lower density development on those areas. Higher density development won't see that as much because it's spread out over more unit holders. You're gonna see decreased per capita tax in incidence on high density uses in general, like across the city, right? So apartments, small lots, um, that's what you're looking for, right? Uh, so it indirectly supports densification goals. And then you're gonna see decreased per capita tax incidence on low value land. So suburban neighborhoods, underdeveloped neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods where you know the price of land um, maybe a, a barrier to developing property where otherwise you know cheap cheap developments might spring up if the land itself were less expensive um so yeah next slide sorry time yeah is time up. cool thank you for the time yeah. i appreciate it yeah thank you so much all right now questions questions to the panel councillor stevenson Yes, thank you so much. Thanks to all of our speakers uh, in person and online today. I uh, really appreciated the, the input that you've provided. And I just want to dig into uh, some of the points a bit further. So, I, you know, I really appreciate the comment, uh, Mr. Burr, that this is not just the impact on buildings that exist, but the, the buildings that are not yet built. Uh, and recognizing that we want to be bringing more Edmontonians here. They need places to live. Um, we want higher density development, which includes condo properties and purpose-built rental. So could you just talk us through in a bit more detail in terms of the impact that this 15% differential creates in, in a pro forma uh, and in securing financing for a project when you're, you're looking at a multi-unit building? Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, there's, I would say the, uh, the, the valuation impact on our property taxes, particularly in the, in the growth we've seen, um, I would say values are probably all factors are, are, have come down around about I would say 30 percent, um, and then of that, the the growth in property tax probably represents about 20 percent, uh, uh, about two thirds of that um, hit to the valuation. I think um, I think there's the numbers, and then there's the perception, and I I think. Um, on the one hand, you have um, city policy that's clearly pointing in the direction of densification nodes and corridors. And on the other, you're saying, well, there's a, a tax uh, system that disincentivizes that. So I think that creates um, confusion and um, I think that affects sentiment. And um, like I say right now, we're not seeing, uh, I, I'm advocating um, for developments in both cities, Calgary and uh, Edmonton, and the interest is all in, in Calgary. Well, and on that point, uh, you know, maybe Mr. Pye, if you want to speak to it, or Mr. Edgar, as you wish. Uh, but you're mentioning some of the, the uh, comparisons to Calgary. And, you know, something that I know is top of mind for, for me and for this council is that, you know, we want to keep Edmonton's affordability advantage. I actually think it's great that our rents are lower in, in Edmonton um, from, a, from a livability perspective and an inclusive um, city perspective. But I just want to make sure that, that that's not correlated, right? That if we reduce, um, if we were to equalize the taxes, that removes a barrier to uh, purpose-built rental in the city. It doesn't necessarily lead automatically to higher rents by any stretch. That's not why Calgary has higher rents because they have lower taxes. Yeah, those those two things aren't aren't linked. And in fact, I, I would argue that the other side of it, if you have more multifamily buildings, the taxes or the the rent should be lower. Right, which uh, is, a, is a great point. So the, what, what is the effect of supply on, on rent levels? I'm assuming that the, the more supply of rental properties there are, the, the, the more stable and, and lower the rent stay. A absolutely, Sim simple supply and demand, right? Perfect. More supply, cost goes down, less supply, cost goes up. Um, I, I, would, I would say to you, you know, we also agree. I mean, look, we agree. 
if we can be more competitive on rents, people, many people will move here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more affordable. So that, that is Edmonton's advantage. Um, but right now we can't build. Or if we do, you know, sorry, I shouldn't say we can't build. It is our business to build. And so many of us are building at risk mm -hmm. right now. We're hoping that this council will make changes like this. We're hoping that the market will improve and our projects will make money. Um, but the decision to embark on large scale projects is extremely risky right now. The, the margins just simply aren't there. And I'll, I'll just give you a very quick example. Our shift development on the corner of 102 Avenue and 106th Street, the city is building an LRT station. They're redoing the road, they're redoing the sidewalks. 106th Street, new sidewalks, new road, $100 million park. If not there, then where, right? Like right now, that project is just not feasible in our current environment. Great, yeah, no, thank you. I think that really, really hits home in terms of uh, the, you know, the alignment with our stated goals and, and what we want to achieve for our city. So just, just for my understanding as well, uh, because I believe some of you work in, in multiple jurisdictions, so Calgary certainly doesn't have the other residential. Is that, do other municipalities have it? Like is it, is it common or is Edmonton one of the, the few major cities that do? I'm not aware of any others. I think it's the only one I'm, I know of. Okay. I think that uh, we, have, we have a report on it uh, that we can send around to. Okay, that's great, thank you. I'm out of time. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Just to follow up on um, some of these questions, I, uh, the, it, you know, if I understand correctly, is that difference between Calgary and Edmonton is for 80%? Um, yeah, we've seen uh, numbers. Is that related to mill rate or is it related no, to assessed value? It's, uh, it's property tax cost per door. So, um, the numbers we saw from Altus, um, they prepared, their, their property tax expert with knowledge who operates in both cities was asked to prepare a, sort of a, a representative um, sample uh, comparing um, similar product, similar vintage in, in the different markets. And the average for um, Calgary, my eyes are small, uh, struggling, Just, it's a little less than 20,000 sorry, $2,050 per, per unit per month, per year, sorry. And then uh, in Edmonton, that same figure, 3,600 and 665. And, and that is based on per door or based on the? Effective tech tax paid per door. Based on the assessed value of that particular unit or like? Or is it's it the tax bill divided by the number of number of units, so it's mill rate and assessed value, both. Okay, and you feel tax differential is the reason for that? Well, Having a subclass is the reason for that, or what did the? Sub, the subclass is probably, like we heard, The subclass is only like in Edmonton 15, and? 15% of so the 15, problem. 15%, so, so what is the rest of the diff? I reason? think if you took away the, uh, I think, it's in, I think uh, if you t took away the other residential, that 80% differential probably drops down to about 50%, still 50% higher. Okay. We'll ask that question to administration. I, uh, well, another question I have, and this is related to, uh, uh, as property owners, as rental property owners, uh, you're able to, um, the property taxes portion of uh, your cost can be claimed as an expense and used to lower the income. Yeah, I would I would say technically speaking, yes. But if we're not making any income, oh um, yeah, that, if then, you're not making right, income, that's fine. You know what I mean? If 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 the market was absolutely robust, yeah. Uh, and we've had this conversation with admin, right? If if between. 2018 and 2022, yeah. the market rates increased by 60%. Yeah. We gotta pay our fair share. I mean, oh, that, that makes sense, right? So, that's so I, if I, we're I, not making the income, then we can't. I know, I understand. Like, I, I, I get that. Like, if you need to make income to pay taxes, right? But what I wanna understand that a single family home, 
or owner of a single family home. They pay their taxes. They cannot claim that against any income, right? It's not expense to be uh, claimed against personal income taxes, but as a property owner, as a, multi uh, as a rental property owner, you have the ability, if you make profit, to claim that on your ta against your income, right? So for your income taxes, for your repairs, whatever you need to do, right? So I'm just well, trying to understand that. Uh, what, what gets taxed out of a, a, if a property is held by a business, there's a net operating income, that, that's your income, and it's taxed um, at the corporate rate. And yeah. But um, I think, honestly, there's probably tax folks in the room who yeah, have Yeah, we will ask that question to, uh, to answer that. I just, I just wanted to understand that aspect as well, right? So, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm, I, 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 we're going to ask that question. I'm, I'm shocked at the, the difference you have highlighted between uh, per door property taxes in Calgary to, uh, to Edmonton. Uh, that is absolutely a cause for concern, but we would, we would have to dig deeper with the administration. What are the drivers of that, right? Is it tax policy or other factors that are driving? Oh, that change, oh, that, that, that difference. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Uh, Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so th if you're looking at, at getting rid of the other residential, that isn't, and I, I think it's in the report that um, admin provided, that necessarily, that savings isn't going to necessarily be passed on to the renter. No, I, in this case, I don't think it is going to get passed on to the renter because, it, again, it's, it's an issue of feasibility of projects to begin with, right? So, so right now, we, we as an industry are struggling to make sense of the risk to build because the returns aren't there. So, um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. Today, if, if, it, if you removed it, I don't believe you're going to see an immediate reduction in rent, but back to Councillor Stevenson's question about supply and demand, if more units get built, inevitably that will bring down rent. Okay, um, and if more units get built, well, won't you be able to rent more and make more money that way? <laughs> well, supply and demand. The more the, the, we've got a housing crisis, there's not enough homes being built, and um, the more that get built, the laws of supply and demand, the market finds equilibrium. And um, not providing, not, not building, I can tell you what will happen if there's demand and homes aren't getting built, rents will go up. I'm just wondering if there's some other way that that council with the tax system can provide grants or something like that to ensure more affordable housing. Um, yeah, and, and I, I, just wanna, I just want to jump in. That, yeah, okay. I, I think that you don't have it here, uh, folks who own older rental product, right? Like, so that's why we're talking about whether or not whether or not we would build, not um, not what what the existing taxes for somebody who's renting like a 1980s uh, condo or, or 1980s uh, building is. And, and, and just to kind of link it to the previous question, I think that uh, part, of what, part of what we're seeing why, we, why there's not a lot of condo product is because, and why uh, this is different in, in rental is because this isn't a very good, it's, it's, there's not a very good business model for this right now. Like there's not a, um, a on, on a per unit basis, it's, it, it's the difference between it making sense or not making sense, not, not so much uh, how, how it affects like the, the, the rent rate or, uh, or whether it's, a, it's just whether it's a good investment or not. Okay. And, and do, you, do you take into account like the, um, the tax deductions as far as property taxes and that? I mean, if you're not making enough rent, right, you're going into a, into a loss, which then you're not paying any taxes at all on it because you're in a, a negative situation. I wish that was the case, but we, the city still demands our taxes. Right, right? but because so. you can write those off, whereas just a, a regular residential property owner can't write them off. But you can't write, you can't write off your way from, from making a loss as a business into making a profit. It it's, it's not possible. We, you, you would accept the losses, either go bankrupt or, or try to make it up in a future year, take a loan out, and then... Uh, but but the city's going to collect their property taxes no matter what. Like there's no there's no default on property taxes. It flows with the property. But but I mean you've got like I mean you know amortization and stuff like that you can write off, which isn't really a a cost. Well, I mean, built up losses over time just erode profit, right? So 
I mean, if, you, if, if every year you're losing $10 for 10 years and the building's only worth $100, then where do you end up? Okay. At zero. Okay. So I, I would just, one more comment on your question is that right now, vacancy is tightening up, right? There's been lots of articles in, in the paper that you may or may not have seen. So right now, rents will start increasing inevitably. And so, you know, and if supply isn't coming in in the background to counter that, then in fact, by not doing this, we will see less affordability and higher rents in the city. Okay, thank you. Mr. Pye, can I just get those Edmonton Calgary figures again, the rental and the property tax? I think it was 3,500 for Edmonton, 22 for Calgary. Yeah, so we, and we used it, yeah, and, and I think that tracks with what, uh, with the Alta study from okay. a few years ago, but. It, uh, and then what was the average rent for each city? Uh, it's uh, exactly, I kind of brushed over it, but it was, it's exactly 1950 for Edmonton and 2175 for oh, Calgary. Okay. And, and they're just kind of, uh, so what we did was just asked, uh, uh, just asked uh, a lending company uh, on, on averages. So, uh, but yeah, anyways, tracks with what Altus did in a more detailed way a few years ago. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. My time's up. Thank you, Councillor Rice. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, I heard the industry is struggling right now, and then uh, I know there are many variables and impacts our industry growth. Uh, can you uh, provide me a little bit of information about the industry growth data and in the past four years and how many more developers increase and in our city? and in this industry area? I'm not in a position to, uh, to speak to that. Yeah, I, again, it'd be, a, it'd be a tough question. I think you need some Statistic Canada type data uh, that I'm, I'm sure Honest, we could dig up or administration I, might be able to dig yeah, up for you. I'm, I understand. I ask him very simple question. How many more developers increased and from ins institutional development perspective and to join, for example, join our UDI. Do we have that? And then from your annual operating budget, operating reports should have that. How many more developers? Yeah, well, I guess I'll speak to UDI for a moment. UDI has altered their strategic plan to focus on the core and focus on more infill. Um, you know, as a strategy to improve our downtown core and therefore we have had some more members join, our company being one of them over the last couple of years. Um, I wouldn't say that was a reflection okay, of I industry can, growth. I can, I can follow up with that specific data if you don't have that right now. And then my next question is about the percentage of total housing type and for under other residential and then um, actually in our city and um, developed by our developers. Do we have that percentage? I would, I'm, I'm gonna suggest that your administration will be in a okay, position. Okay, I will follow that. up with administration for that question. And another one and then is about the marketing demands. Um, because in f removing, remove other um, residential, that means we will create more rental unions for the market. Does do we have that marked demands assessment already done to indicate this demand is already there and that will be consistent increase? Um, what I can say is that you know la the latest um, StatsCan data I saw had 32,000 um, migrants moving to Alberta as a whole, and so people are moving here, and there's demand for housing, um, but. Uh, I can't comment any further than that. We also see, an, and, and we can send around the, the reports on, I think you'll see more multifamily building over time. It's just whether or not Edmonton's keeping pace with other municipalities because there's, there's that movement in every city for more multifamily uh, building. But the other, the other side of it is we see a lot of, uh, we've seen a lot of international uh, uh, migration. And, and so what we want to do is create a, um, and, and I think Andrew can speak to this better than me, but what we want to do is create a better experience uh, for, uh, for folks by having kind of contiguous development in downtown, 124th Street, White Avenue, uh, yes. instead of having those holes. And, and I think yep. that's a, 
that that's a piece of the puzzle. So I, I understand that, that puzzle, and specifically my question is related. Yes, uh, removing this will have increased incentives to uh, institutional development for the developers, but the benefits will not carry on to the renter specifically, what does not impact affordability. Um, then my question related is, do we have the research results already done for the occupancy rate right now in the market for this type of development? Yeah, I mean, I think occupancy, it depends on sort of the greater Edmonton CMA versus, you know, Oliver or downtown or new construction versus old construction. Um, we're seeing market vacancy today um, for new construction within the core at uh, about 7%. Um, that's down from 10% last year. Okay. Okay, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Constor. Right, Constor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you. Just delving deep into into corporate tax and how that works. So, am I correct in assuming? So, you sort of have net revenue, net operating expenses. You have your profits left over, and then those are taxed at the corporate tax rate. And if you don't know, that's okay. I believe that's correct. Okay, so. If your taxes go down, your profits may go up, but you would be taxed on those additional profits that came from reduced operating expenses. I think we're getting lost a bit in where <laughs> the tax is. I, and I, I yeah, don't yeah. mean to discount your question, but, but I, I think the underlying um, issue here is feasibility, right? Rather than where sort of the, we the developer are being hit. And, and I think I think maybe my the purpose of my question is to I think that there is a sense that so if I if my income is a hundred thousand dollars and I put ten thousand dollars into RRSPs I only get taxed on ninety thousand right is that parallel or not parallel to how property taxes can be written off by businesses or impossible to answer it's certainly not impossible to answer but <laughs> I can't answer it for you no I don't believe that's that's the way it works I okay mean, it, perfect we'd have to get our accountants in the room to kind of walk you through how yeah how it all moves around yeah then and that's my assumption as well and we can ask we can ask our our administration for that clarification but I think it's 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 just it's a nuance that I think is part of the conversation, so important for us to, to understand very clearly, but I, I don't disagree with your overall point that, that it's not, um, that there's many other important aspects to this conversation beyond, beyond that aspect of it. And maybe just quickly on that, um, just want to confirm as well, just in terms of uh, Mr. Edgar, if you could speak to some of the greater expenses that, that rental buildings um, face compared to, so if we think of a 15-story condo building, a 15-story apartment building, how do the operating expenses of those buildings differ? Yeah, you bet. Um, I'll use the McLaren as an example. It's a 240-unit apartment building on 124th Street, 102nd Avenue. Uh, we have seven staff that work in that building, uh, made up of leasing agents, cleaners, uh, security, maintenance managers, maintenance technicians. Uh, we pay for um, the air conditioning costs for our, our renters. Um, we pay for their heat. Uh, we provide amenities in the building and we hold events, which we pay for. Um, uh, we, uh, we, we clean the parkade and we pay for that. These are all things that would typically come out of uh, condo fees. Um, or condominium buildings. So, you know, as an example, our, our uh, percentage of gross revenue that goes to expenses in that building is, is, uh, is nearly 50%. Sorry, can you say that again, the gross revenue? So if you take our gross revenue um, and then take our total expense, uh, the ratio is about 50% of our, uh, our um, Revenue is made up of 
uh, uh, like our expenses would make up 50% of our revenues. So. Gotcha. And right. the other things would make up would be property tax, mortgage payments, or financing. Property costs. taxes are, are part of that. A oh, part of number the 50%. As well. Yeah, correct. Gotcha. Yeah. So, uh, but maybe just um, to kind of, if you just took a look at the, at the uh, operating expense, we, uh, I, I'd asked some folks from different companies to do that, uh, to do that side of the calculation. So utilities, including garbage, property management, uh, and insurance uh, would be the, the next three big expenses after property taxes. Those things together, property management, insurance, utilities, make up uh, just under 50% and property taxes make up about 50% of the operating costs of, of a building. And, and that tracks with, with the experience of a, of a condo owner as well, right? Uh, you might have condo fees of $400 a month and $3,600 uh, and on where I, where I live downtown, that's, that's rough, those are rough numbers. Uh, $3,600 a year, $400 a month of, uh, for everything else, including, you know, a full-time security guard and property manager, insurance, uh, utilities. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Councilor Salvador. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, really appreciate our speakers being with us today and uh, have been listening online. Uh, really, really excellent questions from colleagues, and maybe I'll um, I'll zoom out. There's been some, some very detailed questions that have been helpful, um, but just taking a step back, you know, there's sort of the two, two conversations, but closely related, um, uh, off ramping the the non or the other residential, uh, which which makes sense over time in my mind. Um, but I, I would be interested in hearing from our speakers. You know, when we are talking about the ultimate goal of implementing city plan um, and the various tools that we have at our disposal um, to facilitate that, you know, I think about policy levers, um, things like zoning bylaw renewal, growth management strategy, um, strategic infrastructure investments into, into nodes and corridors where, and I, I believe uh, I heard one of our speakers reference that um, the, the density-based subclassing falls pretty high on that list. So I'm, I'm just looking for some further reflections on that. You know, where, where does this tool fall in our toolbox? Um, for implementing city plan? I would say it's um, a huge factor. Um, I think um, I think ending other residential is, an, uh, is a very um, immediate uh, positive step in the right direction and will help encourage investment. Um, I would say for, for me this is, I, I said there are lots of um, variables in the feasibility of development and this is flashing red and it's um, a huge impediment to um, to developing in this city at the moment. And just for clarity, you're referencing, yeah, the off-ramping of the other residential, but um, sort of the, the density-based subclassing would be above and beyond, correct? Uh, yeah, that, I said that would be a first, a positive first step, but uh, my rough, rough math suggests that um, instead of, you know, if you want to do the Calgary comparison, instead of being 80% more expensive, that other residential probably takes you down to 50% more expensive, and um, um, it's it's still a big number, but uh, I think it'll be positive. Yeah, yeah okay. I'll, I'll, I'll add to that briefly and, and just echo that. I mean, it's it's that, you know, you look at Calgary, um, they, they have private garbage collection, which is cheaper than our garbage collection, right? That's just another, and I know that's a whole other can of worms that we're not going to open today, but but it's just another example of these various elements of competitive advantage that that city has over us uh, when people are coming here. But, but, but absolutely, uh, the density-based subclassing is, is something that I, I, certainly our industry wants to explore with administration and, and, and work on a solution that, that works. Yeah, Great, I'd thank you so much. Echo that. Thank you. That's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Hi, all those expenses that you listed, um, they are deductible from the income, correct? Like the property, besides the property taxes, the utilities, the other maintenance fees and all that. Yeah, I mean, the way a, a building is um, accounted for, there's gross income and then there's net, net operating okay. income at the bottom and what flows out of the building is the, uh, is the net op operating income okay. after, after expenses. Okay. And either net operating income or loss, and then that's what you pay the taxes on, right? Okay. Okay. Um, and 
I'm just wondering, do you have any stats or any information as far as how many sort of individual condos are in the rental market in the city? I, I'm, what I'm looking at is like, are we leveling the playing field by looking at taking away this other residential subclass? Yeah, we, I mean, we call it the shadow market, right? Okay. That's, the, that's the condominium market. I, I don't know that number offhand. I, I may be guessing that your administration might have that okay. handy. I'll Okay, I'll wait and ask them that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Uh, you know, obviously, we're going to dig deeper into uh, into questions on the uh, why we are unable to build rental in Edmonton. You say Calgary is booming when it comes to rental compared to us, right? Am I, did I understand you correctly? Like m much more uptake of rental in Calgary than us. Yes, I'm going to start forwarding you. Yeah, articles from the paper, <laughs> and that and that is a concern, absolutely a concern that we need to uh, uh, deal with. Uh, but I want, what I want to understand today is what is in front of us today is this tax differential, right? And when I do a little bit quick cal calculation, um, three thousand dollars or whatever that amount is per door. Um, even if we reduce that by 12%, 15%, that's about $30 per month. Um, uh, and for a 200, uh, for, you know, 360 a year, for 200 unit building, that's about $75,000 in tax savings. It's not going to make a huge difference in the removing barriers. So that's why I want to understand, which we will ask more. It, like, it is, it is really, really sensitive. The margins on um, that net operating income is, is so, so fine. And then that gets capitalized. That's how and it, and it's assessed on a, on a rental valuation basis. When you hear that, and Anne said that the, the operating expenses, or, or I think it was, um, you know, operating expenses are uh, approaching 50% of the... Um, the gross that that is sh shocking, and I think um, a small difference in yeah. property tax makes a huge difference on the yeah. feasibility. Yeah. So what I'm trying to understand is that there are other barriers and obstacles that we need to think about and help overcome for in order to unlock the rental market, which is so important. What I'm trying to understand, yeah. like having this, is not a sil silver bullet. This is not going to, in you know, seventy-five thousand dollars on a two hundred unit building, it's not going to, be, uh, on all of a sudden, spur re, uh, uh, rental in Edmonton. It's it's not a silver bullet, but just to, and I, I won't get into the details of how we value things, but I'll give the really simple math. So we use a market cap rate divided by that income amount, and and. Uh, um, or sorry, the income amount divided by the market cap rate, and that gives you the value. So that's seventy-five thousand dollars divided by a four cap, which is you know a cap rate that may be used for this new construction, is worth one point eight seven five million. Okay. So we don't need to discuss how we yeah. got to seventy-five, but but one point eight seven five million. So you take that, couple that with other factors, construction markets starting to soften. You know, there's a lot of different ingredients that come into this. Uh, uh, to make these buildings. And so, you know, to suggest that this isn't silver bullet, you're right, this alone is not. Yeah. But with other factors that we are seeing and mm. in yeah. ahead of us, collectively, yeah. they are. If we don't do this and we only have some of those other factors, it may not be yeah. enough. Absolutely. I think that's, that's what I'm struggling with, that we're having conversation on one aspect without having the benefit of having a comprehensive conversation about what are yeah. all the barriers and how we can work together to remove those barriers. Right? That's what I'm trying to get at. That's a good point. Yeah. And it's one of the other priorities of our nodes and corridors com committee is about how do you pay for development in terms of infrastructure. And yeah. if you've got a node, node or a corridor, the first guy to develop in that should not bear the burden of all the infrastructure yeah. upgrades. It's the same. It's another factor. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor, okay, that concludes the questions. Uh,
Thank you. Thank you for being uh, here today, and thank you for waiting uh, all morning and uh, part of the afternoon for uh, for this. And we'll go to administration now. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. All right, so everyone is settled in. This is going to be a long conversation. So, uh, 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 Councillor Rutherford. Can I speak to him? Uh, I, oh, oh, yeah, okay. I exempted, but go ahead, Councillor. Yeah. Sure, thank you. Um, to administration, I remember the report that came before us beforehand that, talk, that talked about. Um, Calgary used to have this same kind of s subclass and then it was phased out. When was that? Can you remind, refresh me when that was phased out? Approximately 2000, 2001. It was like in the early 2000s or okay. late 1990s. And so if this alone was a, a key factor, one would assume that we would have seen an uptick even if it's nominal after that policy decision was in place. Was there an uptick? Do we know if there was any kind of uptick in development of rental units in Calgary? Sort of my, as my a result, as a direct, like kind of the year following this policy change? So I, I can't speak conclusively to, to what happened in Calgary. That would be a question we would need to go away and research and ask our um, peers in Calgary. What I can say is that one of the driving factors for the elimination of their multi-family residential subclass was that a lot of buildings were becoming condominiumized. They were being owned by a single owner, but they were condominiumized so that they could take advantage of the prefer preferable tax rate. So one of the triggers for Calgary City Council, as I understand it, was a recognition that, that they don't want condominiums to be created arbitrarily, and it would be simpler to allow um, multi-family properties to be taxed at the same rate. So, um, Do we see that problem manifesting in Edmonton? We, we reduced, um, and, and Anton Zabo can speak more um, conclusively to this, but we did reduce the uh, other residential tax rate from 20% to 15% under a different council. That was an yeah, effort... I remember that in the report. Too. Yeah, that was an effort to see that benefit passed on to renters and when it didn't show up um, the sort of initiative was halted. However, I think it is important to acknowledge why or, or to articulate better why we would have a different subclass for multi-residential properties given that they are very similar to condominium properties and the only difference is who owns it and whether or not it's rented and whether or not it's rented is not something that we track. We can make mm. assumptions based on ownership, but when it con comes to a condominium, we genuinely have no knowledge of if this owner is renting to a secondary owner or not. So there is an inequity in that. Okay, yeah, no, but, yeah, no, absolutely. But what I was hearing from a lot of the, the speakers is like, because what I'm really skeptical of is that, and I have to think about, okay, I know it's the same mill rate, but it's still shifting you know, we're still shifting the amounts and the distribution of that of that tax collection differently if, with this decision, and that's significant for me. And so, like, I'm not, I'm really not understanding if, like, why, like, whether it's one year or th over three years, if this is phased out, how can I go back to the residents and justify to my residents and justify this decision? And if there's no direct causation, 
I'm struggling. Is, is, and I'm hearing from admin for reading the report, you also cannot provide that direct causation. Is that correct? Is my understanding correct? Yes, if, if your desire is to demonstrate to a voter um, that this will benefit them in some way, I think we would struggle to articulate how to do that. What I would say though is that we tend to look at taxpayers rather than um, voters. So if this is a tax paying entity, is there a reason that, that they should pay 15% more when the, the property itself is very similar to a property that we tax 15% less? And that is genuinely a, a, a policy conversation and a decision for council. So I, sorry. No, that's okay. I um. May I just mention, oh. Councillor, the other consideration, of course, is a question of reflection of cost, which is the other part of the conversation. If you were having this conversation with a constituent, it'd be uh, we. What we've seen in our analysis is that density has a, a lower cost to service, and so we're reflecting that as part of our our collection of taxes. Right, that's part of the conversation as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you so much. I just want to start off by really commending the report. I thought it was excellent and uh, and was really impressed at the level of engagement that you've already done as well. I wasn't, I didn't have expectations around that, but was really impressed at the conversations uh, that you had had. So maybe just following from that that conversation uh, or line of questioning, because I think there is a really big uh, fairness question in my mind. So I'm looking at a, a um, CMHC report uh, from 2020 that, that identifies that the secondary rental market in Edmonton is about 40% of condo units. So about 40% of condo units uh, the CMHC identifies as being rented out. Uh, and so for clarity, those units are paying the, the, the regular residential. They're not paying the other residential. That's correct. So, so I think that just from a, a fairness perspective again, um, those are rental units that are income properties, presumably, <laughs> by, by one entity or another, and they, they are paying a different. And again, it's not a small amount, 40% uh, of, of all condo units. Um, I think um, Mr. I was going to call you Mr. Anton, but <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, think, I think your comment around uh, equity in the cost, so you know, a 15-story condo building and a 15-story apartment building as far as the city is looking at it in terms of providing services, there's, there's not a, a difference really. Okay. Well, and I think, you know, I think that some, some comments I've heard from my colleagues just around, around the impact to Edmontonians, you know, we fully, fully appreciate the challenging economic circumstances that people are in right now. Um, my understanding is that if we were to phase this out over three years, the impact would be about four four dollars per one hundred thousand dollars of assessed value. Is that roughly right, Anton? Can you just confirm? I think that was we did do that analysis, and I believe that was the number. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, we did it as a percentage. We'd have to do the calculation as a dollar amount. I don't have that immediately at hand for you. Okay. I think I think that may have been in an email. Um, in terms of just looking at that that rate and what that means, um, because I think I think obviously we want to be sure that we we aren't uh, creating additional unexpected uh, tax impacts on on other property values. Um, maybe we'll wait if if those numbers can be pulled up because I think I think they're they're pertinent to the conversation. Oh yeah, and that was the other. If if committee were to provide direction today. My understanding is that this would come forward to council as part of the spring operating budget adjustment, uh, at which point we can sort of assess the, the whole picture in terms of looking at what, uh, you know, what, what the situation is after we've, you know, got the actuals for 2022 and, and we're looking at finalizing the, the mill rate. So I don't think it comes as part of the budget, it comes with the tax bylaws. And that would be after SOPA? It's immediately after SOPA, yes. So okay. once the, the final budget has been decided, we do the tax calculation and return as soon as we can. Um, we would prefer to have direction on this ahead of that so we know what tax calculation to do. Gotcha. 
Also, just to speak to your first question, you are correct, it, it's about $4. <laughs> Great. I can even read out the bit from the email. <laughs> Great. Yeah, that, that was based on the, the phasing in, right? The so, phasing, yeah. yeah. So, okay. And that's per 100,000. Per 100,000. And is that annual? So it would be a cumulative. Annual. Yeah. So that would be $12 over the, the phase the phase out. Per if we did it over three years. Per 100,000, yeah. Per 100,000. Okay, well, thank you all. Um, I think, uh, so in terms of, you know, again, I... I I think phasing out other residential makes a lot of sense. I'm also very excited by the density-based subclassing as well. But I'm hearing that your recommendation is that it wouldn't really make sense to, to implement that until after other residential have been phased out. So if we were to provide direction around density-based subclassing, that's a fairly future forward motion. Is that correct? That is correct. One, one of our concerns that we mentioned is the amount of public understanding uh, because this would change the tax system for all residents. Uh, we would want to make sure that Edmontonians understood what and why as well as had an opportunity to, to inter interact with us about whether they thought it was appropriate or not. Great. So if, if there were resources that were required for that, we could potentially ask for, for you know, a project plan and, and resources, maybe even, even next year at our fall operating budget. Would that timeline be about right? Okay, well, thanks. I'll leave it, I'll leave it there. I'm out of time. Thank you. So can you please help me understand why rental property taxes in Edmonton are 80% higher uh, in Cal than Calgary? I can help. Um, there are what I would say is sort of four reasons for that. Um, the first, the one that we're discussing now, is the 15% surcharge. Yeah. The other is that Calgary historically has taxed their non-residential base more than we have, um, and their residential base less. So the actual split between how much levy we derive from the non-residential sector versus the residential sector in Calgary is skewed a little bit. Like I think they're 52% they take from res where we take 54. So that plays into it as well. Okay. Assessment values absolutely have an impact. Um, without looking at the specific subjects in question, it's hard to explain why an assessment of a similar property would be that different. But you know, we're happy to work or we'll continue to work with, um, with UDI uh, like around the assessment questions. And the, the last is, is simply budget. Um, our cost to service the city is perhaps higher in Edmonton than it is in Calgary for s reasons such as the amount of services we provide directly as part of the so general which, tax. So which of those four factors are unique to rental? One is very clear, the subclass is a unique factor to rental yeah. that is causing 15% higher, right? What are what the other three factors? Are they different? Are they, they, do they, they are do they only impact rental or do they impact single family? So they uh, impact all property. That they, they are factors that go into the mix of how the property tax gets distributed. So is it fair to assume then all taxes in the city of Edmonton, with the exception of taking that fifteen percent out on single family are then probably be say 60% uh, 65% more than Calgary? No, I don't I don't actually think that's a fair comparison. So that's what I'm trying to understand. Like I it's I'm shocked that we will be charging 80% more and taxes other on without maybe there are factors that we don't control. So it would start it at its highest level. You determine a budget, yeah. and that budget may or may not be higher than another city. Then you make a decision on how much of that you're going to collect from res and non-res. Yeah. And so if you make a, a decision to collect more from resi residential than another city, that's going to make the tax burden a little bit higher. Yeah. Then you're going to distribute it across the fair market values of properties, and depending on how the different market classes and the the economics that are unique to the city, that's going to change things. And then there's this 15%. Yeah. And all of those things go into the difference in the, the yeah. calculation. So there's a bigger issue that we need to talk about. And I just start trying to understand, like, again, I want to come back to the 
to what industry has stressed, which is very concerning, that why cannot we build rental in Edmonton compared to Calgary, right? So we have a huge need for rental. And if there are barriers to that, whatever those barriers might be, some are very complex to understand in a five minute conversation, right? So shouldn't we have that broader conversation? Maybe this is not taxation question, it's more maybe questions to uh, Stephanie about like how do we tackle, how we deal with that bigger issue? I think all of that is salient and we as administration be very open to having those conversations. The piece I can speak to as your city assessor is the assessment. Yeah. And it is a very significant contributor to the amount of tax any individual taxpayer ends up paying. So, you know, how we slice up that pie. Yeah. And what industry was saying is that the slices of pie that they get in Calgary are a lot smaller than the slices they get in Edmonton. And there are a lot of reasons for that, and one of them is also assessment. It is, I think, concerning that the discrepancy appears to be this big. I would want to truth that and make sure that we are talking about true comparables um, and not rely simply on one analysis done by a, a tax agent, yeah. also looking at the analysis yeah, that we I, do. I, I, I think we need to have that conversation. Fair. Uh, uh, I maybe I'm speaking to me. I'll, I have more questions on the way. I'll come back. Stephanie, so don't go away. Uh, I'll come to those my broader questions around that. OK. Uh, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. So I would like to get back to my first question I asked about the percentage of the homeowner base and for this type of properties uh, under other residential category. Do we have that percentage? And in the total of our city's homeowners base? Well, in this, in this category, yeah. it tends to be not, like people living in homes that they don't own. No, I'm not ask people, I'm ask a specific property. The pro but, the, but the homeowner or the yeah, property homeowner, owner? Yeah, homeowner for the property, what's the percentage for that? Sorry, are you asking how many dwellings in the city are rental? I'm not ask dwellings, I'm ask a specific as a homeowner percentage and for this type of property. And then, for example, we have 100 home, and then three homes is for this type of yeah. tax. And then do we have that number? Do so, we have that percentage? So I'm, I'm, I really do need to clarify, because when you speak about a homeowner, yeah. what I understand is a person living in the dwelling they own. No, the owner for the property. OK, so not the homeowner, yeah. but the property yes. owner. Um, we have. Is it worth saying? So we have a little over 400,000 residential units in the city of Edmonton and about 4,000 high rise, low rise apartment building styles. Now, if you go by dwelling count, it's a different breakdown. But if you're just talking about buildings, about 400 uh, condos and residential properties and about 4,000 high rises, low rises so apartment buildings within that grouping of other residential. Okay, so roughly it's. Is this, it's safe to say roughly 1%? That is buildings compared yes, to, that's buildings, different than dwelling yeah. units because if you yeah. go by dwelling units, that number is I am not change. asked that. So I'm asked so roughly 1%. So thank you for that uh, confirmation. Uh, the second question, and then yes, I understand if we remove this other residential, the dollar amount, but for the tax impact is no. But if you look at the larger portion and how many homes impacted, that is based on the percentage here, that is huge. So I just want to uh, get the sense from that. Is that understanding correct? That the not other residential residential properties is a yes, large number? Other, yeah. Yes, it's, it's in the hundreds of thousands. Yes. And I should just correct myself when I said the 400,000, that's now breaking out because the way we count those are are by legal titled parcel. So now condos are each counted, each individual unit in that case. So it's not totally an apples to apples. So the ratio of 
that 1% is probably a little bit Yeah, so I, I just look at the pie. Look at the pie as a whole as a city, and then I can see the uh, differential between the small percentage and the large portion of percentage of who will be impacted by this change. Uh, that is a question, a next question, about some like legal risk and administrative cost. Can you provide a little bit comment on that if we implement those change? To, um, to gradually uh, take away the other residential class, um, subclass would, would be very, very low legal risk and very low administrative cost. It's actually very administratively simple and uh, I'll look to uh, legal counsel, but I, I don't see any legal ris risk in it. There's no legal oh. risk to eliminate the class. Okay, so thank you for that clarification because I'm looking at the presentation here. They're talking about the legal risk and administrative cost. And another question is about the policy, tax policy change review. And then do you have the information since 1974 like how many times we change our city's tax policy and then with the comprehensive review process in place to get the inputs and from other public? I'm sorry, that's not something I can answer without doing some research. The, the only thing I can kind of comment is that when we originally did that analysis about the other residential rate when it first came into effect, we believe it was about 40% of a differential. I can only go back as far as my memory of working here in the city, so I won't date myself, but probably early <laughs> to mid-2000s, uh, we had a 20% differential. So between yeah. the 1970s and early mid, you know, early 2000s, uh. that reduced itself by about half. And then, uh, you know, in the late 2010, around that time, we, we went from 20% down to 15% of a differential. That's the biggest kind of tax policy conversation we've had. We really haven't had much of a conversation about shifting between residential and non-residential, which would be the other big conversation that we could potentially be having, but really uh, we've done tweaks around the edges, but never really a full-blown policy conversation. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the answer. My time's out. Thank you, Councillor Reyes. Councillor, let's see, uh, Salvador. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I just want to actually ask a very similar question that I asked of our speakers as well, because um, I'm still still trying to wrap my head around you know, where exactly this falls within um, sort of our, our order of priorities when it comes to tools for implementing city plan. And um, just to, to Mayor Sohi's point, he's talking about, you know, there's a multitude of barriers um, and sort of that holistic conversation and perspective that I think is, is absolutely worth having. Um, <clears throat> and maybe looking to um, even, even Ms. McCabe to talk a little bit about sort of that at, at a higher level, um, where does this fall in terms of prioritization of tools. Well, Councillor Salvador, we don't have a full prioritization before you here today, and I understand the challenge that committee is in as a result of that, but what I would say is two things. For me, this is really about values alignment to city plan. City plan is all about looking for more density in our city. And then the second thing is that we are not competitive. Um, and this uh, is very complicated, as you've noted today with our conversation here with the tax team. And so we're actually not competitive, and it's also a perception barrier to competitiveness of our city. So I would say that this is, um, I, I understand the challenge in removing this, but this tool would come up pretty close, like pretty high in the list without having a full prioritization before you here today for those two main reasons. Okay, that's, that's really helpful. And yeah, I'm just reflecting on the reality that there is there is no silver bullet. So being able to um, to apply a bunch of tools uh, to, to ultimately achieve that goal is what we'll need to do. Um, okay, and then also looking for a little bit of um, an understanding of why. So sorry, let me back up. Uh, the city of Edmonton was off ramping other residential, and then we stopped. And the rationale for why we stopped was because we we were not seeing um, sort of those those savings passed down to uh, end end renters. Is that correct? Like, I guess was there an assumption that that would have been passed down, and then that didn't come to fruition, so we just stopped. Mr. Zabo has some familiarity. Uh, okay. That's correct, Councillor. So that the original rationale for the phase out was focused entirely on uh, that we were taxing at a higher rate. Uh, property owners who were who are servicing the least well-off in our communities, which are renters. 
And the idea was if we just got rid of that differential, that would result in reduced rents. Now that happened to be at a time when uh, Edmonton was, the market was quite strong in Edmonton. And so despite uh, uh, those decreases in taxes, we actually saw rental increases, uh, which is, I think, just speaks to that, you know, rents are based on market forces and not purely yep. on taxes. I think during this conversation, we are now looking at additional considerations, such as the city plan, cost to service, and that helps, you know, uh, balance out that conversation. Right. So we're looking at this in, in a much more broad, broad view, um, as we have in the, or different from how we, uh, how we have done that in the past. So. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe just more on the logistics side of things and, and on the budgetary side, I understand that, uh, there's a fair amount of work underway, uh, around enhancing and sort of modernizing our tax system. Um, where, I guess, what, what would the implications of, of this be on, I'm just thinking of some ongoing work, like, um, like SEEP. For example, like would this in any way delay that work? How how would that fit in? No, um, moving away from other residential is administratively straightforward. It, it simply would be us going into that subclass and applying the the lower tax rates over whatever period of time council directed until the the tax rate was essentially um, equalized, and and then we would just remove that as a subclass. This is one thing that we can offer for almost no cost in terms of administration. Right, right. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, but then for the sort of above and beyond into the density-based subclassing piece, that is where um, there would be additional resourcing required. Is that correct? That is correct. I, okay. be, uh, part of a conversation that we've had in front of council before it applies here too, which is we, we are quite restricted in what we can subclass and how many subclasses we can currently structure within our technology, we would need in, a further investment in that technology in order to create more robust and more flexible tax subclassing ability. Right. Okay, excellent. Um, well, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, everyone, so far. Um, just some clarifying questions. So I know that uh, the four-year implication for the tax rate in Calgary right now is about $10.25 million, or billion dollars, sorry, and uh, for Edmonton, it's $7.75 billion. So there's that, you know, obviously, um, difference there, $2.5 billion. Um, does that track with the population differences, or uh, I'm just curious about, uh, you know, we're, we're hearing about affordability and competitiveness. Off the top of my head, I, I mean, I would yeah, have we, can come we back would to have this. to look at that. Yeah. Um, but like our budgets are a factor. Like we'd have to. I think you'd have to look at it per capita to to it, get a exactly, sense of that. Exactly, that's what I'm right? wondering. With population differences. Uh, so maybe we get back and come back around to that either today or in a memo. Uh, but it would be good to know if we're talking about competitiveness, uh, what the actual impact is per capita. Um, the next thing is. Uh, we raise the garbage thing, and this has been a constant conversation between Edmonton and Calgary in the way that we charge differently and how maybe there actually isn't a difference in how much garbage is, it's just how it's charged. Some in Calgary, I understand a bunch of it is on the property tax bill, whereas for us, we keep it very transparent. Am I right in that? Uh, Councillor Paquette, this is something that we're actively having a conversation with uh, the operations department in the industry right now and looking at multifamily and understanding the difference and if the actual difference versus the perceived difference, if there is one. So uh, it's a conversation that is underway right now. We don't have the full answer to that yet. On the residential side, I think you are correct. The, uh, but the non-res side, it is different and we are actively engaging on it right now. Yeah, okay, that would be good to know. If we're having conversations about competitive, so we shouldn't actually have those numbers. Otherwise, we're just making things up. Agreed, the numbers is what we're working to get right now. Okay, great. Um, and then I was uh, curious a little bit about, um, well, I know the Calgary is revisiting their res non-res formula right now. And how will that impact? We don't know yet. So we won't know until that's done how that's going to impact, again, competitiveness. Our understanding is that they're moving uh, towards Edmonton, so to speak, in that they are putting more of the levy on the residential side and, and moving it away from non-res. So they'll, they'll be council, coming... Council rejected that yesterday at Calgary. Yeah, 
Yeah, they made a decision to keep the status quo. Okay, What's so that? the mayor has more current information, I beg your pardon. Calgary made a decision to keep the status quo and they made a decision yesterday to keep their status quo. Yeah, okay, yeah. so it'll be good when we all know this information, I think, yeah. Okay, and then um, if we, if we uh, move forward with this concept, um, one thing I didn't see in the report, maybe I just missed it, was the, um, the total fiscal impact. Um, I, I, we've got the uh, percentage that it w uh, difference it would make on uh, residential property tax, but. I'm not sure if I understand your question. Cor How much money are we talking about? We're talking about no money. We're just talking about the tax distribution. So the overall yeah. levy doesn't change. What is the distribution change. amount? Um, Thir it's $13.2 million. How much? $13.2 million. 13.2. So okay. it's shifting I missed that, that amount. That was from in the report. So yeah, it's you. in the report, yeah. Yeah, hey, I missed it. But it's not in a table, so it's. Thirteen away in two words. million per year. Okay. So really just to be clear, that's not new money though. That yeah, is no, it's revenue new. neutral, that's so it's the shift. Yeah. So we're not really talking about an enormous amount here. But what we're hearing is that this is one of the little check marks, I guess, that would encourage more density. Okay. So and, and that's my other question. And again, maybe it was in the report, but I may have missed it. And that is um, the difference here uh, for these units that we're talking about, the difference between the t um, you know, per capita tax on property versus tax on the habitations in these units. And if that's comparable, or if it's the fact that the property that the units are on are taxed more. And I'm just wondering how that evens out. So I in thinking about this, I would think about a multifamily unit versus a condominium, uh, sorry, a multifamily residential unit versus a condominium unit. Yeah. To all intents and purposes, they are very similar. They could almost be identical, and yet we do tax one 15% more, which to me would suggest that we are encouraging the market not to build multifamily rentals, and instead either to build condominiums or to continue to build single family residential, single detached residential. Yeah, that's a very important point, right? Okay, thank you. I'm thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Jens. Uh, thank you for this. Um, again, echo the comments of my colleagues, uh, an excellent report, a lot of really good thinking here. Um, I was wondering about, so I was reading about this practice they call warehousing, where uh, landlords will effectively keep uh, our apartments off the market to artificially constrain supply um, and thus increase rents. Now, we don't have any track of that, do we? We, uh, assessment and taxation does not track that, no. Right, so when we're talking about um, su supply and demand and uh, price elasticity, et cetera, like we, we just consider is, we just look at the property. So if the property's off the market or not, that doesn't, that doesn't matter, we're just looking at the property. We are just looking at the information we need to value that property. What, what it's used for is important, but whether or not it's vacant, it is important, but it's not, it's not the determinant. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, and, and similarly, we don't also, when we're talking about Airbnbs, that's, we, again, we're just looking at the property, we're just looking at the, the individual unit, not the, the purpose of the unit. Yeah, un unfortunately, with short-term rentals like Airbnbs, there is no feasible way for us to collect the information we would need to, to deal with them any differently than just taxing as a single family home. So would it be fair to summarize the argument today or the, the discussion today is there's a differential taxation. The first question is, do we want to keep it yes or no? And do we think it's fair and just yes or no? And if no, upon what timeline do we want to phase it out? And then if upon phasing it out, who, who then eats the increased cost. And is, in this case, it wouldn't, well, hold on. Is that summary thus far correct? Almost, but the, the redistribution effect would, would take immediate effect when we reduce the tax rate for one class, we increase it for the other class. So as we're phasing it out, who's gonna eat it? And then the question is the bus other businesses or other residential? Council does have flexibility to shift to non-residential if they so choose, but if we keep it revenue neutral and we say we collect the same proportion from res as non-res as we did last year, then it would be the general residential class that would 
receive the additional tax burden. So the question is effectively a, a small a small number of, of private multifamily unit rental landlords would then see a lower tax burden and see in a, a theoretical incentive to build more, um, but all of those other properties would then have a, a also a corresponding impact on affordability. That is correct. However, I would point out again that at the moment that small number are paying 15% more and what we would like to do is to articulate why we would continue with that given that we are in support of the city plan when these are dense properties that cost less to service. Right, right. Okay, and um, and again, any conversations about rent control or tenants' rights, et cetera, again, that's provincial and jurisdiction, not, not a contemplation here. It's certainly not a contemplation of assessment and taxation. I, I'm not sure if there are other places within the city that that conversation could happen. Okay. Um, all right, I think, that's, uh, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Wright. Councillor Wright, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm, so most of these um, apartment buildings, are they, or sorry, are some of these apartment buildings or units, um, are they um, with our housing partners? Like, are they providing the affordable housing? Or are these... Yes, some of them will would definitely be part of the affordable housing subset. Okay. Um, and is there any way to do a, a subclass for the, those grants? I, I mean, I know we do it per... I, no, because no. We, we can't tax according to ownership. Okay. So instead, what we're doing is granting back, like uh, council would have the ability and does have the ability and we did have this conversation for exempting the municipal portion of the taxes on those specific buildings. That is absolutely within council's purview. Rather than do that, council decided to go with the grant based option which provides a little more flexibility and a little less risk. Okay, okay. I'm just, because I'm looking at CMHC's data from 2022 and it's showing the average rental on a two bedroom at 1,304, and yet I, what our speakers were quoting was 1,950 a unit. And I'm just wondering, are, are, are we better off to have condominium rentals rather than so I would, apartment buildings? <laughs> I would suggest that the speakers were talking about a very specific analysis that, that they commissioned. The average rental and the rental of the buildings in that analysis are different. They're different bodies of study. Um, CMHC looks at their data and looks more broadly, and I would suggest that the typical rents are probably more reflective in the CMHC. However, our industry speakers would, would be very intimate with their specific rental. Oh, no, rates. this is for Edmonton. Yes, but Edmonton, Calgary. I think, I think what the speakers were speaking to was, was buildings that they owned or were familiar with, as opposed to the complete rental market with, within Edmonton. Okay. And okay. Councillor Wright, to answer your question about do we just want condos that are rented, we want a spectrum of housing type within our city, including purpose-built rental as well. So I would say that that's probably not the solution that we would recommend. We want all different housing types in our city. Okay. Okay. Um, did I have anything else? Uh, no, I think and you clarified that it, it's... The redistribution goes to the residential properties, not residential and commercial and industrial. It right. could go to non-residential if council so chooses okay. and wishes to, to redistribute at, at tax time. Okay. okay. By default, it would be the residential at this time. Okay. Thank you okay. very much. That's all I have. All right. I know Councillor Stevenson has a motion, but I, before she put a motion, I do have some more questions. Do, do other council members have more questions on this? Yeah. The more questions? Okay. Uh, maybe I'll go up. I'll come back to my uh, 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 earlier question. Uh, what do we need to do to spur more re uh, rental? I don't have all of the answers to that question, and yeah. I know there's work that's happening in community services in this space, Mr. Mayor, but I do think leveling the field would help uh, because this is quite a substantial uh, yeah. difference, uh, both competitive and perceived uh, difference. Yeah. So, 
shouldn't we have that comprehensive conversation? Because my worry is that if we just hang our hat on one issue of what saying, do this and don't do other parts, right? I, that's why I'm asking these questions. I you know I hear clearly that there's no direct link of affordability that somehow if we eliminate this uh, uh, subclass that benefits will be transferred over to renters. We haven't seen that. So that is, uh, that's one fact. But, but what I'm more interested in is what I heard from the industry. We, there are a number of barriers that they're, they're facing and I'm interested in that conversation. And, and eliminating subclass could be part of that too. I'm not saying that we should not be looking at it. I wanna have that big, big everything in front of us, then have a good conversation and really find meaningful solutions and tangible solutions to all of those things and just not looking at one aspect. Yeah, I, I understand, Mr. Mayor, and as part of our growth management framework, we're looking at the whole host of tools available, but the tools are quite limited. Um, and this is a, a tool that we know would really help. Uh, so, I, I, as I've said before, I don't have the prioritized list in front of me, yeah. but knowing uh, what some of those tools are, like we brought one forward in budget that wasn't funded, which was about infrastructure and requires debt from the city. So that's, you know, we have limited tools, and so I could see where this tool would end up higher in the prioritized so, list. So this would be my struggle, is my struggle, that if we shift $13 million from one class to the other, right, wouldn't be better to have that $13 million in, uh, in some sort of grant funding and use that for other areas. So I guess that even though it's not new money, it's still, it's, 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 we don't have to, we, we're not increasing the budget, but I rather, if I were to ask homeowners to pay another 2% or whatever over four years, shouldn't we have that conversation about that will make a huge real difference or not? I don't know. So I'm, I think I'm, I'm struggling to make this decision in the absence of having all the solutions in front of us. That's what my struggle. I can someone help me can overcome that struggle. Like, what is the process? Are we doing that work? Or if you're doing that work, when will that work come back to us? Then we can have that conversation. Or uh, that work is not underway. There's work underway looking at the entire toolbox under the growth management framework and under city plan. But this is a multi-year, multi-phased implementation approach. And every time we bring something forward, we put that lens on it. Yeah. So it's, it's challenging for me, Mr. Mayor, to say we will have one day, we will have this list, and this list will tell you the top thing to do and the number yeah. 10 thing to do, yeah. because it just it isn't gonna work that yeah. way. Yeah. You know, if, uh, if our taxes are 80% higher than Calgary, right? Eliminating 15% of a subclass will help a bit, right? But then we stop the conversation, right? And I, I just maybe to help that, that conversation along, I think, while we don't like constantly changing our numbers, you know, it is possible that after a conversation, you might make a decision today, and then with further analysis, you might choose to, to, to change adjust, adjustments afterwards as well. So there's always that flexibility subsequently. It doesn't have to be a perfect answer today. You kind of give a, here's our course, and then based on additional information and further analysis comes forward, we can then but change course if need be. The struggle I have is that if, the, if during that further analysis, there are better solutions, right? Then we have limited capacity to implement those bad, better solutions here. We already burdened uh, one class with higher taxes. Then we then we can't exercise that. May may not be able to exercise that too into the future. So I that's why I think having a comprehensive conversation is I'm more interested in. That's maybe I'm just you know I'm speaking to this right? Uh, okay. Uh, I will stop here and I'll go to Councillor Knack next. Thanks, Mayor Sophie. So maybe a few questions to that round. Uh, Ms. McCabe, I think part of the reason why I, you know, I, I haven't been interested in say a grant piece is because from how I would understand it, like when these folks are trying to go get financing to do their builds, grants aren't going to help determine whether they get financing. No, they don't. That's my understanding as well. They do help 
for yeah, sure. I mean, it can, Absolutely. It can assist, and they're, but they're but really the important. Magnitude. We've had some really positive things with grants. We but, did have a good success yes. story, but, but generally speaking, in terms of, of having a consistent and sort of ongoing market of supply being built, what these you know companies that are going to ultimately finance are, are they're looking on long-term costs and a grant can go away. That's correct. And they want to have that. So that's part of it. Yeah. Um, and again, I, you know, I, so for me, so far, I, I haven't heard a reason and, and appreciate your point, Mayor Sohi, about needing to do a holistic view because I think what I heard earlier is that the things that are within our control are our budget, which we already debate every year anyways, and how much we choose to take or not take. Uh, and, and, and we, because we are a larger city in terms of physical size, we have large, you know, typically more kilometers of road, we have a lot more infrastructure. That is honestly why we pay more than Calgary or Vancouver or Toronto. So if you took a, an average priced home in Edmonton and an average priced home in any of those other markets, generally our taxes are higher on an average price home. The, the, the price of the home is probably you know a million dollars for an average price home in Vancouver, but we've done that analysis in past budgets that Edmonton is generally. Um, I am going to interject sure, just because please, I, that's. I'd love to, yeah. <laughs> we're usually right in the middle of the pack. Yeah. We, we, we generally are not the highest. We, we don't pay more tax for an average home in Edmonton than other cities. And in particular, I think we're right on par with Calgary. When you're talking about a true average home, a, a, a single detached yeah, residential. Not taking a $400,000 home at a $400,000 home, but a $400,000 home, which is average here, and I think theirs is five fifty now or something like that. So when we're trying to equalize it, we're, 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 we do well, but that's, that's one of the few things in our control and how much we choose to take for services as part of it, which I, I mean, I don't know what an analysis per se would, would give us other than you choose how much you wanna take each year and you would continue to do that. Similarly, the conversation around residential split versus non-res is something we have talked about over and over again. I, I don't know if that would really need a huge analysis. We've done that type of conversation over the years around going instead of 5248 to going in other directions. And I mean, can you sort of, what, what, what's the difference if you're looking at say 1% shift as an example? So if we went to like what Calgary's doing, do we have a sense of what that would cost the other side? So understanding that we collect about 50-50 right now, a little, yeah. little less than that. And a 1% uh, tax increase is about $18 million. So you're talking about $9 million of shifting one way or the other as you're doing a 1% up and down kind of, that's, that's okay. the way you look at that. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah, and, and so I guess that in my, so I guess my question is that I'm not sure what else we would, you know, there's only a handful of factors that you listed earlier. That's two of them. The third one was the one we're talking about right now. I think you listed a fourth. What was your fourth one again? I'm trying to. Um, assessments. Oh, assessments, which, yes, uh, again, so I, uh, is there, you know, I guess I'm trying to figure out, is there a larger body of work to actually get, or did we just sort of cover them all in three minutes, and we, we have a sense of where, where that would already go. Maybe if I can just jump yeah. in. Like, I, I think we, you can make this decision, and it doesn't preclude us from continue to, do it, to continue to do the other work that may need to be done to see how we make our city more competitive, how we meet the targets and outcomes of we the city plan. We could do plan. a further analysis if we want to continue to you know, look at changing 52 to 48 or 50-50 and all of that. Um, I guess what I'm hearing though, and, and maybe I'll go to Ms. McCabe for this, is that this seems to be the one that has the most immediate, tangible results. The other ones require a, a much, like I don't know how you would, properly calculate how that's going to impact things because it would ultimately be council decisions. You know, do we want to fund less skating rinks? Do we want to fund less, you know, park cutting? And, and I'm worried that, that that confuses this conversation. We have something that's sort of tangible and one of the few things that's tangible. Your thoughts on that? I would agree this is tangible and would have some immediate outcomes in terms of showing that values alignment to city plan and really leveling the playing field with some of the other cities that we're competing with for investment in our city. Okay, I'm out of time, thank you. Thank you, so we would have to stop here now. Uh, we are at 3.32. Sorry, Tim, we'll come back to you and uh, when we're back from uh, the break, we'll be back at uh, say three,
Okay, we are back. Uh, like to call this meeting back to order, do a roll call. I'm here, Councillor Stevenson is here, Councillor Nack is here, Councillor Rice is here, Councillor Rutherford is here, Councillor Wright is here. And let's see who else is here. Uh, Councillor uh, Paquette is here. Uh, do, 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 do. Councillor Principe, you there? Hi, I'm here. Councillor Tang, you there? Hello. Councillor Cartmel? I'm here. All right, so you are next, Councillor Cartmel. Please go ahead. Thank you. I, um, so I think Councillor Nack actually answered, or pardon me, asked most of my questions. I guess in terms of uh, adjusting the, you know, or what the implication might be in other tax classes, we have the opportunity to change that when we do the mill rate conversation here later in the spring. Is that correct? That is correct. So, I mean, if we felt that, you know, there was going to be a shift, but we did not want that shift to be to the, to the residential class, that shift could be moved to the, the non-residential class. That's fully within our power. That is fully within your power, or you could split it. You could do whatever makes uh, sense to you at the time. Right. And I, I, I understand that we're hearing a little bit of, of consternation or that, you know, maybe this is not, that, that this won't necessarily directly result in a reduction in uh, rents to people that are, you know, the actual person renting the unit. I, do I understand that correctly? Is that the same apprehension you're hearing? Well, I, I think that is uh, for your fellow councillors, um, Councillor Carmel, we, we do think that while we have to remain neutral on this one, we do think that this is one piece of the puzzle that assessment and taxation, the taxation system can do in support of the city plan. There's limited things that we can do, but this is absolutely one of them. And I guess the, the, the flip side is that is that we know that if we do not do this, then we, we continue to have a competitive disadvantage at work. That, that is the one thing we are sure of, yes? Yes, I would, I would agree with that. So I wonder if, and maybe this is rhetorical, but I wonder if we have a bit of a, you know, perfect is the enemy of good sort of a conversation going on here. Uh, we know that over time, we, we can presume that over time this would work uh, or is likely to ultimately re uh, result in, in more construction and, and with that a larger market and with that a lowering of prices due to competition. We can have that confidence. We know that if we don't do it, we've got a, we do have a, a competitive uh, problem. And while there might be other tools that we can add to the, to the list here, um, that doesn't prevent this one from going forward. Is that a reasonable assumption do you or uh, summary? Uh, yes, I would agree with that. Okay, so I, um, we've been talking about this for a few years. Uh, so I guess if not sure what way committee is leaning, and of course you've had the opportunity to talk there and I'm not there. Uh, so, so I would suggest that if there's yeah. not support for this, so it would be recognition. Yeah, they, right? that's exactly what we are thinking, Council Cartmill, that, uh, yeah. uh, that we uh, requisite this to uh, Council and uh, then carry on that with uh, that conversation there, because uh, community, uh, sorry, committee is not of. Uh, uh, this is split on the committee on this, right? So it'll be better to go to council. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or yeah. 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 probably fail at committee, right? So, and we don't want that to happen because uh, council may want to weigh on this. So I think instead of going further into questions on this, why don't we requisite this to council? Happy to. Uh, then if you put a motion on the floor, then uh, then we requisition the motion, right? No, if, no, we if can't you requisition, requisition the motion. this item, any debate, anything that happens here stays here yeah. and the just the item goes up to council. Yeah, so let's do that and we can end the questions here. Then you can ask your questions at council. Okay, Councilor Rice, you okay? Yep, okay. All right, so please do that. Yep, Councilor yep, Mack and Councilor Stevenson. Okay, so, so it, item will go to council for further discussion. Okay, all right.
Moving on to uh, item 7.4, the Duke Annexation Area Assessment Potential Adjustments. So we don't have a presentation for this item, so I guess if council has any questions, uh, okay. hopefully the report is fairly self-explanatory. Okay, Councillor Rice, you exempted these, so please go ahead. So this is a straightforward, and then by working with the city administration, I'm going to put the motion on the floor. So Mr. Mayor, if Go ahead, please. I? So, uh, Thirty Kirk, and then uh, I believe you have the wording as well for the item seven point four, and I move that administration proceed with the Luduk annexation area residential property tax cancellations for two thousand twenty two in the amount of the. 10,610.17 as outlined attachment one of the February 15, 2023 financial and coverage services report FCS 01500 to be paid through the assessment and the tax prior appear rules budget. Okay, Councillor Rice, can you make an introduction to this? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, and then so uh, this uh, motion specific to refract uh, the last motion and made by previous council for four motions um, regarding the Luduk uh, County Alexation property. Uh, so in back to in 2021 and in May, and the council addressed two motions and on November 2022, and the council just uh, just the third motion providing the proper uh, prorated tax rebate and for properties. And so right now the fourth motion here and just uh, uh, just uh, for um, specifically uh, 77 properties who is eligible for those tax rebate. And, and then details in the attachment one um, for move forward. Um, specifically, and then everybody knows, and uh, since nine, 2019, when this annexation area happened, there are some tax concerns, and uh, administration can comment on why is that happened. And then council made the promise and to revoke certain uh, tax, and including the penalties. Is that right? So this amount, ten over ten thousand amount, is refract that decision. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Any questions, colleagues? Questions? I just have a quick one. Uh, uh, this does this set any precedent? Uh, I, I think we're. Okay. I think we're already down that road. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> this, is, or this is the last one. This is the last of, of the motions. And so theoretically, this is the fifth of the motions because we had implemented motion four already in 2020 and 2021. Okay. And this is just the, the last year of the phase out of the differential. So we gave effectively a 75% reduction in 2020, a 50% reduction in 2021. And this is now providing what would effectively have been a 25% reduction in what they, the differential they paid in 2022. Okay. All right. So this goes to council. All right. So please vote. Yes. We have five votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Next one, 7.5, jurisdictional scan of property tax assistance program for seniors. So on this item, I can just provide a few initial comments and then uh, throw to, to committee for their thoughts. So just provide a few overview comments. Uh, across Canada, we generally noted there were two kinds of seniors assistance programs. Senior assistance is what we're on right now. Uh, just making sure. Uh, tax deferral programs and tax rebate programs. Now, Western provinces, including BC, Alberta, and Sask Saskatchewan, all have provincial deferral programs. 
Historically, Edmonton had a seniors property tax rebate program, but this program was ended when the province introduced its deferral program. As we, as we reviewed various approaches across Canada, administration remains confident that the present deferral approach is the most efficient and reasonable approach to address the property tax concerns of seniors. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Can uh, someone close the door, please, if you don't mind? Yeah, thank you. Uh, all right, uh, Councillor Rice, you exempted this. Yes, Ms. Mayor, I, I'm going to sign in. And also, I have the motion and for this one as well. And then may I put the motion on the floor first? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. And thank you, administration, that provided this wording. Uh, so the motion is the city administration return to committee with a report outlining possible approaches to a low income seniors property tax rebate program. Okay. You make the introduction, please. Uh, yes, I will. Um, so I, I would like to say yes. Um, um, uh, they report back to us and specifically talk about uh, jurisdiction scanning and for what we do and for low income and seniors. And the, the, the motion and intent, the intention behind my motion is to demonstrate that increasing uh, property tax uh, impact fixed income seniors' ability and to live where they have lived for many years. Uh, there is a current gap in our city for assistance centers pay this increase in burden. Uh, city and such as like Calgary, St. Albert, and Strascola, and other like six uh, municipal, uh, municipal policies and in Alberta, and besides the provincial deferral uh, program, and then also provide grants for centers uh, on their property tax. So more and more seniors are facing the problem of affordability. Uh, the program will allow for seniors to stay in their homes where they can remain connected to their community, family, and friends. So this motion is not to ask implement program. It's just ask administration and then outline the possible approach and provide with the reports to seniors tax rate rebate program because our city actually had this program back to 2014 and then we passed for a while right now and then I looking forward to see and the further support of our seniors just besides uh, the other um, uh, provincial supports. In fact, we have many uh, municipalities across Canada, also across province Alberta doing this and I think uh, we could find a way to support our uh, centers better. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Councillor. Rice, before I go to questions, I uh, just uh, want to get a sense from the administration on the due date. And this is the question that we are all asking now about in relation to OP12 and the workload related to that. So I would suggest that we do change the due date to, uh, uh, to the to, uh, to fourth quarter, right? So, or unless can be done quickly, I don't know. I just want to get a resource from because there's so much work undertaken related to OP12. There, there is a lot of work in OP12. Um, this would need to be a cross-department initiative as well, because if it's low-income seniors, that's not something assessment and taxation can distinguish. We don't collect income information. Yeah. So I think we we really do need a More large can amount of time Can we do fourth, fourth quarter, please? Yes, we yeah. can do for fourth quarter. Yeah. Okay, okay, Cost. Good. All right. Councillor Wright, go ahead, please. Questions? Yes. I'm, I'm just wondering, so this is for lower, low-income seniors, about 45000 What about those on other lower fixed incomes? I'm thinking like um, Canada Pension Disability or age payments and that, whose income might be even lower. Is there anything that can be done for them? I think that might, might need to be a question to the mover, whether she wants to contemplate expanding. To the mover? I'm just wondering, is that, can, could it be done if I, if the mover would want to do it? Yes, it could be done, and because Calgary is doing what you are exactly talking about, they are implementing this, and, but it depends on my colleagues uh, and in the committee, and then I would like to listen to their thoughts on it, and I have no problem to add that. Okay, 
So it's a, a bit of a distinction right, between just a seniors based program or a straight up low income based program. Those are different kinds of conversations. And, and the motion right now is a low income seniors. Yeah. So it's a subset. So it, it's possible, and but the work scope will be different. Okay. Still doable though? I, I think that's what the piece of work would be. Okay. Is, I mean, it, it, Cal, City of Calgary does have, but they also have sort of a suite of um, programs. And if we, if this motion were to pass, we would probably investigate how we could do something similar. So we, we know that in community services, for example, there are low income programs. Could we tie a potential property tax rebate or um, deferral program to that? That's the sort of thing we would be investigating. So then I guess to the mover or to the rest of executive committee, would that be considered a friendly amendment or? So you wanna delete seniors, just make it low income property tax rebate program? Yes. Is that what you focus on? Yeah. That will be significant change, probably not a friendly one. Because that's a, yeah. unless, that's a, that, that, that's, that, would, that would require a whole set of new work, right? It's, it would probably be the same type of work. I think the big difference will be the amount of funding you would need to set yes. up such a program. Yeah. Um, so perhaps we would need to come back with sort of options if it was just restricted to seniors. I'm, I'm really talking very high level now because this isn't, we, we do not deal with income information, so I don't know quite the spectrum of people this we would be talking about. Okay. Maybe I'll just jump in very quickly here as well. Um, the difference in the work, I think, what you're going to find if you did the work is going to relate to enforceability of getting the information. Um, it would be a lot simpler to determine whether or not a senior is low income that owns the property versus whether or not a low-income person owns the property when there's four or five other people that also make income in that same property. If, Councillor, you wanted to limit that to something like the owner being uh, an AISH recipient, which I think I heard you say early on, or something similar to that, that would be far simpler to enforce. This would all be a grant program of some, some nature, so that would be the way to think about it is if you go down the, the larger path, you're gonna create a problem with enforcing at the end of the day, um, knowing that you're getting the money to the right people. Okay, so by, so I'm just wondering about enforcement. So are you talking about um, an income confirmation, like tax return? Income confirmation, um, honesty of the people providing that income in the first place. So for example, I can have four or five different people living in a house with four or five different incomes, how would the city ever know that there were four or five different incomes in that house? We simply are able to identify the person that owns the property and see their income information. So that's the type of enforcement problem that I'm talking about. That's not to say it's not doable. It's more a question of uh, if you go down the path, you have to realize that the chances of people, I'll use the term scamming the system, become a, a lot greater. Can't, can't the same be said though for, for seniors that maybe have other family members living in the residence with them as well? Uh, absolutely. I think now we're going into the, the content of the report that will okay. be generated, right? I okay. think we just need to focus on the, on the motion. I just need to get a sense from committee it is uh, taking out seniors word out of the motion friendly or not. So I, I can respond that based on the uh, clarification or uh, legal advice, I, I think as at this moment, maybe it's better just focus on seniors okay. and we can come with uh, some sub subsequent motion and uh, to focus on broader. Okay. Is that okay, scope. committee? You wanna eliminate seniors or not? Or maybe we can ask, she, she, I mean, she's, not, she's, if, she's not, she's not. If, if, if she it's not friendly, it's not friendly for the mover. So we'll carry on with the questions. Councillor Stevenson. Oh, Mr. Mayor, I just want to mention, I don't think anyone wants to eliminate seniors. Uh, the word I said. Okay. I said se word seniors. I'm 55 plus, so I'm getting into that. Uh, thank you. Um, maybe first to administration. I know that uh, I believe our colleague, Councillor Tang, made a motion around... Uh, 
looking at sort of income testing for, for property taxes, and that report came back to us last year sometime, is that correct? So is this, is this, would this be fairly similar to that work? No, um, but it's, it's definitely related. Uh, again, what we're looking at here is trying to impose some kind of income testing into a property tax regime, which is not something that council is directly empowered to do. But this, the council can set up a, a program that is income tested. The income information would need to be voluntarily given. Uh, other criteria would need to be met. Um, we are, in assessment and taxation, leery of income tax conversations because this is not our specialty. But I do understand that it is something that we could legally do. I think also this is just the distinction here between a, a tax, uh, an adjustment to the way we, we do property tax using income. And here we'd say because we're applying it now to all property owners, we would have extreme concerns about that versus a grant program that requires applications where they submit evidence that's a different kind of set of criteria and, and barriers to cross. So when it comes to income measures for property tax, we have serious reservations. Grant programs, things like that exist, though you know, Cam, uh, Cam Ashmore has mentioned issues around how do you prove the income of the household is below the threshold, even if you receive the income statement of one person who lives in that household. And that's a, a challenge. We, do, we can do low income programs for individuals for rec facilities, because we know that individual has a lower income, but that household now getting a tax break, is that appropriately appropriate to be able to do that comparison? So that's the challenge we have to discuss. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe to the mover then. So again, I, I feel that seniors are the only group in Edmonton that currently do have some <coughs> form of tax relief through the provincial program. So I'm just not sure what gap this is filling. Uh, that is actually a very, very good question. Thank you for asking that. And if you look at uh, the, uh, the report, uh, how many seniors use that program? Actually, it's a very small amount. And because for that program, you, you own the, um, the property and with a high value, and this, motion specific talk about general and average properties and for our seniors with lower fixed income they're struggling and to even live in and then to pay the cost increase for the living and to pay the property so that is targeted two different groups so a larger program and a really, really tiny percentage of seniors use that program. So we have the large portion of the seniors in the city actually will benefit from this motion. Okay, so maybe a clarification to administration. So the provincial program that is restricted to a certain home value? No, it's just restricted by age. So if you're over 65, I believe is the mark, doesn't matter what your income level is or uh, anything along those lines, it's just gonna be then at that point, you're fully eligible. You can have your entire tax bill covered through that deferral program. Is why we think that actually is the preferable approach generally. Yeah. I just maybe also mention, you know, we've just been talking about um, how how functional it is to even administer something like this, and we've talked about some of those challenges. That's the practical considerations. We would probably have also theoretical concerns about again income testing related to property tax. It's again a, a bit of a mixing, and this goes back to that that property tax system report. We are still now introducing grants based on income rather than looking at property value. Income tax determines you know, how much people pay in taxes for income. Property tax determines property wealth. And if you have a senior that has a low income but a high asset wealth, is it appropriate to use income metrics to determine their property tax incidence? So we would have concerns around that. May I add one point for that? Sure, yeah, please. Uh, actually, that is not true. And because for, for seniors to qualify for the uh, provincial program, you need the 25% equity and for your, in your home. Correct, you have to and, own your property. Yes, and yeah. so that is different. This, pro, this motion and actually provides a more beneficial and then easier for seniors to do it and then instead of to meet that requirement in the provincial government. So not an income basis, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I think, I think that that is still there, like the 25% equity is, is interest. Okay, anyway, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rutherford. 
I think I was signed up from previous discussion. I'm not. I'm not on the board for this one. Councillor Neck. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so sorry. I just. I want to double check because uh, to Councillor Stevenson's question. So Councillor Tang did share her wording of her motion. So I just want to make sure I'm. I'm understanding how you would view these differently and what what kind of different information we might get because I. I don't want to duplicate that work. Um, so her motion was uh, to re uh, have her to report back on options for potential property tax relief for residential property owners, um, including but not limited to tax forgiveness, tax credits, and grants, and considerations for determining the qualifications for property tax relief for residential property owners, such as but not limited to income thresholds. So I know that wasn't senior specific, which this is, so that's one difference. I guess I just want to because this does in, this include grants. Can you walk me through how you would view those differently? To be frank, they're, they're not significantly different, and our oh. advice contained within that report would be replicated here. This is not a program that administration would support. Okay, Th that's helpful information to me. So maybe to the mover, recognizing the answer I we just got was that essentially this report would be very similar to the report they would produce, or that they already produced, feels like to me the, the right course of action would be, if we're looking to make that change, why bother doing another report? Either, you know, let's make a motion and debate whether we should do it versus getting a, what sounds to be like an identical report that would be coming. That's um, yeah. So I appreciate the intention for that. However, this request is already happened, pa happened in the last year. I la in the last year, back to June, I request to provide this opportunity for us to explore this rebate program is not the tax relief. And because like administration mentioned very clear, the difference here is one is application based and you have to do income tax. Another one is just the based on information and the city take initiative to do it. So I'd rather have the seniors and due to this economic difficult time to have some program in place and to help them. And specifically, we have other six municipalities already implement this and why our city cannot explore the opportunity and possibility and to do this to wait for that long time. Okay. And so that's that's my uh, intake. That's helpful. So yeah. maybe just back to Min or Ms. Padbury, well, looks like you want to speak to that because I'm just trying to. Yeah, so I think when we answered Councillor Tang's motion, we outlined the concerns that we had with the application of any sort of income tested program to many different. I think what this is now saying is, regardless of that advice, you want us to look at, you would be telling us to bring you back what a program would look like. I get it. In spite of the advice we've already given. Okay, so, so, so the way I should interpret this, and thank you, that's helpful, is that, so at that point in time, for example, speaking for myself, I did not, there was not a motion made. I did not put one forward personally to to move down that path because I, I understood your advice and proceeded to ex for that. So I guess the way I should look at this is if similar, if I'm in a similar mindset as I was when that last report came forward, I probably wouldn't support this motion. Okay, I got it now. Uh, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, perfect. Those are all my questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if I understood you correctly, again I. I just want to be clear in my mind. Did I hear that you say you would not recommend a program? No, there, and there's a number of reasons that many of which are articulated in the report that Councillor Nack is referring. Yeah. But essentially, it, to my mind, it's a duplication of the the support the provincial government supplies, oh. yeah. um, and this one in particular is a tax rebate, which would require us to fund, and given OP12 and everything else that we yeah. have been talking about during budget, I, I would be concerned about where that funding would come from. Got it. Okay, I think that is very clear. The you know, administration is clear that they're not going to recommend this, then why create work? That's something that we would not be recommended by administration. Okay, that's, that's clear to me. Uh, Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I understand the, the motivation for this uh, motion, absolutely. So my understanding is that the provincial uh, tax referral program, it's income, it's means tested, and, uh, and the way it works is that 
they're not getting uh, a free pass. Basically, the, the tax they're deferring um, are recouped in the eventual sale of the home. The provincial program is actually not means tested. It's not means no, tested. No, it's, so it's anyone, open to anybody like whatever over whatever age. No, o over the age of. Like, oh, yeah, what, over whatever age over the 65, is yes. that what it is? Yes. Yeah, so it doesn't matter how much you're making, you can defer your taxes uh, for the eventual sale of your home. Yes, and it is a tax deferral. So the, the logic is the, the province as a whole, the provincial tax base will hold that, um, that, that risk, that, that money, and then when that property eventually sells, under whatever circumstances, at that point, the province will be made whole. Wow. So it's essentially borrowing against your asset. Yeah, it's a, re it's a kind of government-sponsored reverse mortgage. It okay. allows you to liquidate your asset wealth to be able to pay off those taxes. What a deal. Holy cow. Jeez. <laughs> and, but they make the municipalities whole on that. The province well, they, does. well, they do, yes. Yeah. So, so the municipal tax bill gets paid by the program run by the prov province. Okay. And uh, so maybe the better approach to the mover might be that instead of this motion, what we do is we advocate with, and I'll get your thoughts on this, advocate with the provincial government to expand their program to include people who actually need this help um, because that's the proper uh, place for it when it comes to supports uh, in terms of poverty and, and uplift. Uh, th thank you for asking. And then, however, I want to clarify there is no duplication at all. And because the reason for that, seniors who use the provincial program actually taking uh, out the high interest loans. That's his annually 5%. So one is a subsidy. Yeah. Um, the provincial program is a deferral. What you're proposing yeah. is a subsidy. So seniors would be rebated their taxes and that would be subsidized I, by other taxpayers. You would distribute it to others. I, I will ask a question to clarify that so when come to my well, turn. I'll, I'll just continue, yeah. yeah. So continue. my next question then would be where, so uh, this is a challenge for the province where, we, and you can't speak for the province, but in general, where would you draw the line then if you open this up beyond seniors because potentially everyone could do this to further tax the province would pay for it for the eventual sale of the home. Yes, Councillor, we really cannot speak to what the province may or may not do, but one thing they may want to consider is, as Councillor Wright said, looking at H recipients or, or other forms of low income subsidy programs that they run. So a pre-qualification for that, and then add that as a secondary piece of the program that they have open to all seniors. The benefit that the province has also is it actually collects income information, so it knows all property, property income information and can distribute if they so desire that way. And they also collect income tax, so they can distribute that way as well if they want. Yeah, okay. So I, I would uh, suggest that the kernel, the seed of this motion is, uh, is excellent, and it needs to be planted in, a, in maybe a little bit different ground uh, to actually yield the results that the, the, the councillor is looking for. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brickett. Councillor Rice. Yeah, so I have some question and then to appreciate the clarification on it. Um, so do we have the data specifically to show the value of uh, the uh, sinners owned properties increase at a faster rate than the interest rate? No, we, we don't have that data. Um, we don't actually know which of the properties in Edmonton are owned by a person who uh, is a senior. With the, it was the age 65%, so we don't have that data. No, we don't collect personal information and tie it to property ownership. But we do have the information for the income tested and also the age-related information and for CDs other programs. We collect that type of personal information. We collect, right in place. we collect income information for leisure access pass, um, which is then used for low income transit pass, but we don't we don't cross validate that with home ownership in any way. We collect those only for the purpose of administering those programs. So, so my, my point is we already collect the income information. Uh, we already collect age information and for certain program. No, no, Councillor. We collect for certain programs income information. And age information. I don't think age is part of that data collection, no. And then how we can, how we can uh, 
I, I, it's my understanding, you can correct me, my understanding, and then that's his under recreation center program, and we use that age information to, to issue certain uh, promotion rates and for the seniors. So, so I would just have to double check on the age, but if we collect it as part of leisure access, it is used for the administration of that program. Uh, so, and I think this information, age information and income information, and that already cracked by our city, may not correct by this department, but the different departments. But it's so not collected for everyone. It is only collected for people who apply yes. to those programs. And then the motion here I, I put on, and is not for everyone to collect. It's only for people who are interested, who have these needs to apply for this program. You do the age and the income test it. So this is the same principle, the concept behind. So I, that's the first question. Thank you for that answer. Uh, the second question, and in the previous program our city already had, what's the cost specific for administ administration to do this program? And then do we have that financial data? I'm looking at Ms. Pabbery to see if she has any information from 2014 and earlier. From the, for administering this proposed program or administering no, I th the I th programs that we administer, like LEP? No, I, I think, I think the councillor is talking about a, a program that operated in the city of Edmonton prior to the provincial program being established and what that cost. Okay, sorry, um, we do not have that. Um, so, based on what I heard at door and then to listen to the seniors' um, concerns, and then my key point here, I didn't see the barrier and for individuals to provide their information in, for their, in needs for this support. And this leads actually right now is in front of us. Many, many seniors and all right demonstrate how challenging, how difficult for them right now. And this is why the program for this, like this one, and is really provide sending the message, yes, if other municipalities, including Calgary, can do this, and why our city just totally ignore their voice, their needs. And then I just want to clarify, and in that piece. So uh, I'm not sure there's a question for us there, but that this would be, a policy decision yes. of of council. All we've simply articulated is that yes, we, yes, we, we are have concerns we are with debate. it. Yeah, we are debate for that. And then, but I just want during this debate process, I want to put my points there, and then um, uh, I will speak later. Okay. Uh, Thank Shohi. you, uh, Councillor Reyes, Councillor Wright. Thank you. Um, I just sort of wanted to get your insight. I, working in financial services for almost 30 years, I um, I used to tell my customers, and then working in some highly concentrated senior areas as well, about the option to to defer taxes. And one of the the reasons that I was always or that they objected to it was because they didn't want to encumber their free and clear residence because they want to leave it to their kids. Do you, can you offer any other insight as to, I mean, it's a fairly low adop adoption rate across the province for the program. Is there any other reasons that, that seniors don't like it? <laughs> well, I, I can't speak to sort of specifically, but I would an anticipate that the idea of paying in the future is not as attractive as never paying at all. And that's essentially what we're talking about. Like a deferral means like I, like, I don't have to access my wealth in order to pay, but a, a rebate means I don't have to access my wealth ever, you know? So I, th I think that that's really the question on which it hinges. Um, a rational consumer would prefer to not pay rather than defer payment, and probably to defer payment than to pay. Okay. In I guess I'm a rational consumer too, because I don't want to. In conversations anything. I've had with property owners with this very topic, I have heard, heard exactly that. There is a hesitancy for someone who has now a free and clear property to, to go back into debt in that kind of a sense. Though when you then explain the program and do the math, the interest you pay on property tax over time typically does not equate to the increase in property value you're going to see appreciate over the ne that same period of time. So actually net, you're better off over that period, you stop paying taxes and your property appreciates faster than the interest accumulates. And so when you go through the program, actually there's 
pretty good rationale for the way it currently exists without having other taxpayers support those with high asset wealth. Well, perhaps the province should do a better job promoting the option <laughs> and, and, and letting people know what the benefits are to them. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. So that concludes the questions. We have a motion on the floor to anyone to speak. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the, the intention behind this motion, but I agree with Councillor uh, Knack's line of questioning. We've already kind of had a very similar response from administration. They've been consistent in their response and flagging concerns, and um, we need to we need to heed, heed those concerns when they're, they're brought up. And I, I do really appreciate the previous conversations we've had around wealth um, versus income and how they're not synonymous. And so I think it is a very nuanced and complex conversation that I'm not willing to really heed into right now. I do also really appreciate Councillor Paquette's uh, suggestion uh, or, or discussion around potential advocacy to the province around the expansion of this program or, or looking at the uptick and what barriers are preventing current seniors, especially low-income seniors, from accessing um, accessing it because I do think there is value there uh, for sure. I know we tell our, our residents that email us uh, that are seniors about this program all the time. Um, I'd also like to highlight that, you know, we did put that motion for it and council approved for the development of a seniors advisory committee. So I feel like stuff like this would be great discussions at a seniors advisory committee when that, when and if that is struck up. And, and so for those reasons, I just cannot support this at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford, Councillor Nat. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sohi. And, and similarly, I, I really do appreciate the, the intent here, and uh, I'm going to rewind back, uh, forgive me for being, you know, go back eight years again. When we had that conversation in 2014, part of why I supported at the time not continuing that path is because I think one of the issues I had had over the years is uh, focusing solely on low-income homeowners or seniors in this case, and, and not other low-income seniors that uh, have challenges. And we are, if, we're, if our goal was to help those in lower income, I wanted to make sure it applied to homeowners, renters, and, and you name it. And so that's part of why I supported not continuing down that path. And then s what we did since that point is we worked on uh, expansion of the leisure access program to expand the income threshold uh, to bring that up from 150,000 Edmontonians to 200,000 Edmontonians. And it was actually the reason we expanded it was because of a, a meeting at Central Line Senior Center and a woman who had talked about the challenges she was going through in accessing services. And so that was a way to ensure anyone in a lower income was able to benefit uh, financially for a city program. Um, when we made the change last term, I think around the seniors bus pass, we used to do a, you know, you hit an age, every senior, whether they're a millionaire or making nothing, uh, got a extremely discounted bus pass, which actually in my mind didn't make a lot of sense. The seniors who could afford it, um, why, why were we giving them a benefit? And so we made a decision at that point in time as a council to, again, focus the discounts on those who uh, were in the greatest need. Um, one other program I think about is um, the Seniors Home uh, and Renovation Program, which is actually a provincial program, but it was something we did advocacy for at the city because that was an example of where seniors, particularly in lower incomes who are struggling to stay in their home, uh, we did some advocacy with Greater Edmonton Alliance and their seniors team on, on getting the province to open up and create that program. Uh, and, and they did something specifically for low income, for those so it serves more as a grant, and then for those in higher incomes, that it's more of a loan. All of which to be said is that, generally speaking, the way I've approached it over the years is, is trying not to solely single out um, those who own property because this, that we have a wide number of seniors and many who fall in, in uh, rental properties. And while some of it, like a Greater Edmonton Foundation, is income-based and it will tie to their income, there are many other seniors who 
don't have the ability to be in those types of housing options and so they're pretty much paying based off what the market can support at any given time and they don't have access to the same type of benefits. So I think for me, all of which to be said is that I appreciate this. My preference would be similar to what Councillor Paquette had just suggested and Councillor Rutherford echoed that. And then if we want to continue to help in, uh, seniors in lower incomes, let's look further, further expansion of, of any other city services that we have to help both low income seniors and low income families. So that would be my, my preference um, versus just pulling out the, the, the property uh, owners, uh, low income seniors. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Neck. Councillor Rice to close. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. And thank you, City Administration Providers Reports. I do understand you don't support this program. Uh, I would like to say um, no one is saying seniors don't have to pay. But actually, we are doing here to help them pay. And then in the past few years, and everybody uh, is facing challenge and for the COVID-19 and also for economic downtime, our seniors in the same boat. And specifically, and our seniors with fixed income, and they have to face a challenge for all the increased cost for the living. At the same time, I want to say our city's assistance program and for the seniors is declined in the past eight years. This to be really clearly, loudly heard and then from many, many seniors I spoke to. And at the same time, our city provides additional support for the different type of program, but seniors left out. Um, I, I cannot stand for this personally. I come, I grow up and come up with a culture. We respect the seniors. We, everybody here are seniors because we will become older and older every day. And right now, the message we are sending to our publics, we are not get our public to build this trust for how we support our seniors. Our seniors are important members of the community. With the city believes government of Alberta residential tax deferred program is sufficient, but I do say some seniors Ser serious gaps. I'm not the only one. Entire report here, across Canada, there are many municipalities, and plus in our Alberta, with this existing program, we still have the biggest and smallest cities and doing this type of program to support our seniors. Why we are saying no to the one million population city to the seniors living in the city. I, I cannot understand. I'm very, very frustrated. So, all examples of cities that have implemented the seniors property tax assistance program to help lower income seniors pay their property tax bill. The dem this actually demonstrates, those examples demonstrate the gap in the current GOA program I seek to address. I appreciate my colleagues' points. Yes, we need to increase our advocacy efforts to address this issue. And however, moving forward, the best way to assist the seniors is lower taxes by controlling our spending. This will ensure seniors are not cash strapped to pay taxes. But unfortunately right now, our city has not had this lower taxes. So we must look for a solution in the interim. And we already know in the next four years and uh, what the tax rate looks like, which this is why I brought this pro proposal 
move forward, there is no duplication. And it is actually, as a city, we need to do our role to support our seniors, not only look at the different resources. So I encourage my colleagues to consider this, and at least we have the report come back and to with possible approaches to address this issue. And then if we're going to expand in our city, and it's better to address this right now and then later when we have more population. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Please vote. We have five votes. Display the votes, please. That is defeated. Chief. Next one. Taxes recommended for cancellation, write off. Cancellation of uncollectible taxes and penalties. Is there no presentation? Okay. Councillor Rice, questions, please. Councillor Rice, exactly. Uh, no, go ahead, please, Councillor. Mr. Mayor, while, while we're waiting, I'm just wondering if administration might want to be interested in sending that report back that basically answered the question of the previous uh, potential motion so that everyone can have it in their inbox because that's basically I think an they don't have to send it. We can all Google it. It's publicly available. Well, I hear you. <laughs> but, uh, okay, can you send that report to us, please? Okay. We'll send the link, yeah. <laughs> Councillor Rice, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Um, the question, this is a larger Taxes re recommended for cancellation write off. Um, I noticed in the attachment one, and the most we, we have certain category and why we, we have to cancel those uncollectible tax and, ban and penalties. Um, many are from BIA's business organization. So what is specific BIA's role and for the ta proper tax collection and in this process? Yeah, I think this is demonstrating some of the challenges we have with the BIA process and the business tax process generally. Property tax is secured against property and so it, you know, collection is a lot more straightforward. BIAs are collected against businesses and when businesses leave uh, and depart, it's very difficult to collect. And so those are often, you'll find a lot of the, the write-offs on these reports are when a amount was charged to support a BIA, but that business, since charging the levy, is no longer there and no longer can be charged, so those often become write-offs. So because BIA is operating expenditures rely on the uh, tax, we collect it for them, right? Correct. So they set their levies, and then we yeah. collect on their behalf and distribute that 100% back to them. Uh, then by looking at the category here and did the cities has, yes, in the report we said we exhausted all the effort and we cannot connect with people, we cannot locate the business and then it ends up we have to, so for all those tax revenues we have to, we lose, we lost all the tax revenues. Yes, Is again, there, because it's not secured against the property on the, in these BIA examples. And then, then this question, and this question and related, and when we, and then when we issue the business license, we have all the information. And how could at the end, we, even we cannot collect the taxes with the, based on all those informations? I think also, Councillor, there's a bit of a question about uh, amount of effort to spend to collect a, a bill of that amount. So, you know, if you... 
if Cam Ashmore wants to, to speak more to that. I'll just give you an example, Councillor. If you have $1,000 of taxes on a business, it might cost you $500 to track down that business if it still exists. You initiate a lawsuit, you start sinking time into the lawsuit, um, then that'll get you a judgment that does not necessarily get you the money. Then you have to try and find assets. And a lot of times it's just way too complicated to ultimately do that when you look at a small amount that is there. It, it might be possible to recover something at the end of the day, but the effort and work in doing so, you would spend far more time and money to get that $1,000 as opposed to just writing it off. I just add, Councillor, that for the vast majority of the businesses we do collect, this is a, a fairly small number, right? And this is over a period of time that just have sat on our books and, and in the exhausted all options. Okay, in the past years, how many write-off we already did? And then do we have the total number uh, just beside this one? I don't have that historical analysis in front of me, but the general write-off amount is, a, is in the same range typically each year. And, and, the, and a good chunk of them are often related to these business improvement areas. Some of the other ones you might see there are lease accounts. So those might be uh, government owned properties that are then leased. So in some senses, a similar challenge. Uh, they're um, assessed persons who are leasing from government properties and then they depart, creating that same issue. Yeah, I, I understand from legal perspective would be true uh, uh, compared to the cost and then how much we write off, I understand that point. Uh, but I do think, and then if we, we as a city, we can write off so many, uh, so many like the tax uh, revenues, and even we cannot support with the small amount less than this one <laughs> and to our seniors. That's something I'm very frustrated. And then there, this is not only one example, there are other examples we can do the tax reliefs for so many other programs and we can even support our seniors and who wants living their home. Just so, to speak okay. in okay. defense of my, um, my branch, we do actually collect about 97% or more um, of two point, in the first year of $2.3 billion. This is a relatively small amount we yeah. ask to be written off. And I think it's not appropriate to conflate okay, sure. two separate issues. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So then that's my question. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you. Just very briefly, um, could you, uh, no, no problems with the recommendation, uh, agree that you do a fantastic job of, of collection. I just wonder what the implications are for the BIA budgets and, and whether uh, general tax levy makes up the difference to keep the budgets whole or if that goes to other BIA members? At the present time, we uh, give to the BIAs 100% of what they ask us to, to levy, their requisition, and the general tax base ends up um, absorbing any collection loss. Okay, that's helpful. I mean, I don't, I don't have any uh, follow-up action from that, but that's helpful to know and certainly something I'll keep in mind as I'm talking to BIAs and some of the changes that I know we're advocating for um, with the land landlords paying into BIA levies and all the rest. So uh, good context, good information. I'm happy to move the recommendation. Thank Councillor, you. Sorry, Councillor, I can yeah. add one just small piece of information for you. There has been some conversation that I know has existed about um, when you're dealing with the budget of the BIAs to create an over-under fund for the amounts that are uncollectible in a given year to adjust the budget for the following year. I don't know where that is. That's a different lawyer within my branch. Um, but I know that that has taken place in the background. Okay, that's helpful. And I think, you know, I think subsequent investigation I might do as well is just if we see patterns in different BIAs. So again, are some BIAs sort of being disproportionately impacted by the challenges to collect, um, but that's good to know that conversation is happening and I'll follow up offline. Uh, and so I will move that uh, executive committee recommend to city council that the cancellation uh, write off of 111,760 and 25 cents in uncollectible taxes, including all accrued penalties as of December 31st, 2022, as outlined in attachment one of the February 15th, 2023 Financial and Corporate Services Report, FCS 01559, be approved. Thank you, Councilor Stevenson. We have motion on the floor to speak. Uh, I still have questions. Oh, okay, go ahead, please. Questions, yeah. 
Uh, so, is there an uh, is there any enough room in the in the contingency tax fund for this? Yes. Uh, what will be the remain remaining balance? So that that fund is to to deal with all losses throughout the entire year. So you know it's still a, a moving number. We have approximately twelve million dollars a year that we budget for assessment appeal losses, and so one hundred thousand dollars from that twelve million is absorbable. Okay, so we still have the like the presently, 11, yes, eleven million and for the remaining balance. Balance. Yeah, we will have yes. Yeah, in, in fact, this is still early year, so we haven't actually had any appeals to address this year to come out of that budget. So I I I know I ask a question for the previous years. Do we have like average amount? And for the tax cancellation right off for the average number and with pre previous years. We can get that for you offline. Okay, sure. That's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Okay, we have a motion on the floor now. Anyone to speak? Okay. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So that concludes our agenda. Responses to consular inquiries, none. Private reports, none. Motions pending, none. Any notice of motions or motions without customary notice? Seeing none, we and are- And Mr. Mayor, if I could just interrupt you for one moment. Um, if we can go back to 7273, we requisitioned the items, but if there was a will of committee to receive 7-2 for information, it did sound like most of the discussion was concerning 7-3. Okay. Otherwise, both items would go so up we'll to be, So council. we'll be re requisiting 7-3, not 7.2, right? If that's the will of yeah, committee. Yeah, absolutely. That was then, the whole end. Okay, got it. And then we can receive 7-2 for information. So can someone, Councilor Rutherford, can you move that... Uh, or someone else, whoever wants to move 7.2. I can move receipt of information of 7.2. Okay, good. So before, what was Sorry. Point of order. Yeah. Uh, receive the information for 7.2, does that mean just no action, nothing happened? That's correct. Yeah, on no 7.2. Yeah. Yeah. So just no action, no implementation, and for that specific yeah. change. That's correct. And for the discussion that committee was having, from my standpoint, was primarily around item 7.3, which will be going up to council. Okay, 7.2, if we receive for the information, that means we don't have opportunity to discuss at the council. So 7.2 yep. and 7.3 were cross-referenced. Yes. So 7.2, we didn't have many questions on that. All the questions related to subclass are related to 7.3. Yes. Yeah. So 7.3 will still be requisite to council. But so we will talk about there on 7.3. But 7.2 7 is just No, if we receive it as information, we will not have opportunity to discuss again at the city council. We will on 7.3. No, I said 7.2. I'm not. I totally understand. I just ask if we receive information for 7.2. Yeah, that means we, we don't we, have opportunity to discuss 7.2 at the city council. No, we will not. Discuss it. it's a motion. Yeah. Only 7.3 will be discussed at the council. Okay, so please vote to receive 7.2 for information. We have five votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Anything else? Okay. Now we are adjourned at 3.30.